Hey everybody, welcome to Aaron Swartz Day. We're very excited to have you all here today and we got lots of great speakers and stuff. Um, we're gonna give people a little bit more time to get settled while we enjoy this wonderful video. This is one of the um, artists that's gonna be in our virtual reality museum that we're putting together. It's actually, a, it's an art gallery, museum and fun house. Um, so sky's the limit as far as the things that will be found in this virtual reality experience. And um, that's at aaronsportsday.org forward slash VR. If you want to work on the project or just learn about the project, we're going to build some really nice code that everybody can use to make their own VR museums if they want. And this video is Fractal Art by Aaron Turner, um, Thunder Perfect Mind. And um, the music is Lunar Spirit featuring Faith Mystic, which is myself and the Spirits um, project. For the music and we're really excited this is the uh the um world premiere of this art and this music together and just to give you an idea of some of the cool stuff that we're uh, putting into the virtual reality museum and then we'll be right back and i'll give a little talk the first talk and then we have brewster kale and tracy jacquith from the internet archive that will be coming right after and then we have dr jonathan borden who's going to talk to us about robotic spine surgery um, and um, yeah, there's really cool cyber surgery. Yes, so we've got a cyber surgery talk from Dr. Jonathan Borden, and then Corey Doctorow will be coming after that. So right now, let's let's, let's uh, take a little art break, and while you, everyone gets settled, the video is four minutes and twenty seconds long, and we will be right back. Thanks.
everybody. <laughs> Thanks for coming back. Um, we are just starting um, our 2020 event. Thank you so much for coming. I'm really happy to um, see everybody here. And um, I am um, just really excited. So um, text us if you um, at uh, Aaron Swartz Day on Twitter. We also have a, um, a questions URL that should be up on the screen. If you want to ask questions of the speakers, I'm monitoring the responses. Um, and really, this conversation is going to keep going. The whole point is to um, remind everybody sort of like who our community is and um, have some presentations today and hit the ground running and just keep going. That's the idea. We're not going to stop. There's a lot of things to do. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to talk really quick about um, what I've learned about in the last seven years about Aaron's case. And really, it's all explained pretty clearly in a blog post that I made um, called uh, Aaron Should Have Been 34 Years Old Today. But also, I just want to tell you what I used to make that um, post um, and what you can do if you want to understand more about what's going on, about what happened to him, and about why we're trying to um, draw attention to this moving forward. So basically, what I did was four basic things that went in. First is the Internet's own boy. Um, you need to watch that movie pretty much to get started. It gives you a great, um, a great background about what brought him to that point, the kinds of things he did, the kind of per kind of person that Aaron was, and really sort of gives you the background very quickly and perfectly in terms of what you need to understand, um, and, it, and it will also explain why we're so sure that Aaron wasn't going to give these articles away. He was going to pr perform research on them. And just much like he did with the Westlaw database, it's very clearly explained in the film. And also what the grand jury did in terms of um, what Stephen Heyman did, the prosecutor in the grand jury, in terms of sort of harassing Aaron and really um, making him afraid of getting his friends and family involved, which is what we believe led to his feeling like he needed to take his own life to protect other people from what was happening. Um, and um, there's a talk that will be published later today that Brewster gave in 2014 about plea bargaining and torture, and basically how the plea bargaining system in the United States has become such that it's become the norm for prosecutors to just overcharge and then have people plead out where they are up against these uh, incredible lifelong sentences and they really can't risk going to trial even when the charges have no merit. And we see this all the time in the drug war and we're, we're seeing it. Uh, it used to sort of pop up here and there. Now it's become the norm. And we really need to, one of the things that has not happened yet is we haven't, the family, Aaron's mom and, and father, haven't received so much as an apology from Stephen Heyman and Carmen Ortiz. And it really would matter, actually. It would send a signal to the prosecutors that are in law school right now, future prosecutors that are in law school right now, that this was not the way to behave and that were, mistakes were made in Aaron's case. And we think it's very important that that happen eventually to um, to clear things up once and for all that that this was definitely not how cases should be handled generally. Um, so he, he was basically, there's a first set of indictments and then a second set of indictments. The second set of indictments was just made to put more pressure on him so that he would plead out. Yet when he tried to plead out, um, Heyman would not negotiate and, and was insisting that he do some federal prison time uh, as if there was any sort of negotiation made. So um, the third thing that we found out was from Kevin Polson. Now, Kevin Polson is um, the co-creator of the original Secure Drop prototype that we all are very familiar with now. Secure Drop is used by basically every major news organization in the world uses Secure Drop as a, an anonymous upload option to get information to reporters. 
And um, Kevin w worked on the prototype with Aaron. Aaron finished it just a month before his death. Um, and Kevin tried to get access to Aaron's FBI files and was given all these um, reasons why it couldn't happen, national security reasons why the files can be handed over. So Kevin sued the Department of Homeland Security to get the documents. And um, finally, the documents started coming in and then MIT intervened as a third party and insisted on wanting to have a, a second chance to further redact any documents that came out of Aaron's file before they were given to Kevin. And the uh, judge granted it, excuse me. So, um, so now MIT had a, a, a chance to further redact the documents before they were given to Kevin. Kevin made them all available publicly at swartzfiles.com and really it just made us wonder well, what is MIT worried so much about right um we didn't realize it in the beginning but it looks like MIT assisted the government in formulating their case against Aaron instead of defending Aaron instead of worrying about what a an aggressive case against someone for downloading journal articles uh the repercussions of that. They assisted the government in putting the case together against Aaron, and now they're worried about it coming up in the documents that might be released around his case. So that all happened way back in 2014, and Kevin Polson um, and that talk is available on the Aaron Swartz Day website, and it's linked to from the blog post I mentioned. Aaron would have been 34 years old today. Um, and so that told us something pretty interesting. And then finally, Ryan Shapiro at Property of the People, uh, who was also trying to get the FBI file, Aaron's FBI file, found out that Aaron had a code for an international Al-Qaeda terrorist investigation in his FBI file. And it looks like it was from a single email that he sent to the University of Pittsburgh Computer Science Department. We don't know what the email was about, but for somehow, somehow at the time, all of the emails sent to the department during that year were scooped up. Aaron's email was scooped up in that, and that gave him this code on his record, which was sitting there in his FBI database file when the MIT thing happened and they went to look him up. So we weren't sure what could have been the reason why the FBI seemed so concerned about Aaron. They, Everyone was working really hard to try to find something that he was doing. Um, we thought they may have been upset because uh, Aaron's Pacer project where he utilized a sort of all you can eat for libraries program of the PACER service and was able to utilize that to download um, thousands or perhaps millions of PACER documents. Um, that had the FBI sort of snooping around and driving around Aaron's parents' house and just sort of the general sort of harassment and pressure. Um, but it turned out he hadn't really broken any laws and they couldn't do anything. And it didn't really make sense that they would be so mad that the FBI would feel personally affronted from the Pacer thing to go after him like this. So it was very enlightening finding out what Ryan uncovered. And there's a post that it says January 11th, Raw Thought, um, and I also linked to it from the blog post I was telling you about, where Ryan explains that in detail and how he was able to obtain those documents. And we will, we will continue to keep everybody abreast of that. So th this was, that's pretty much the, what we found out, the new information that was uncovered over the last few years and uh, and how we were able to, to find that out. And we're going to continue to talk about this now since we're going to have meetings every week. We'll have updates, um, you know, as, as they come up um, about what's what we're learning about Aaron's case, about whether or not we've heard anything from Ortiz and Heyman, and whether they're not they are ready to at least apologize for the mistakes they made. And um, we'll keep you posted on how all that progresses. Okay. So um, next, we are going to talk to Brewster Kale, who is in a car 
um, as you will hear when he comes in and, and he's going to talk to us about some new stuff going on at the Internet Archive with periodicals. He's a co-founder of Aaron Swartz Day with me. It's always exciting to have him. Let's hear it for Brewster. Brewster! Thank, thank you, Lisa, and, and welcome, everybody. This is great. I'm sorry I'm speaking to you from my... This is working out okay. Um, the um, the connection between uh, plea bargaining and torture. So I, I was like, wow, I think this is torture. And so I looked it up on the internet, and there was a Yale professor that wrote an article um, comparing uh, plea bargaining to European torture law and how they came about for the same basic reason as you can't of we can't afford to put people through the real court system as it appears on TV with juries and all of that. It's just too expensive. So they basically force people to plea bargain. So 95 to 99 percent, depending on jurisdictions, um, of all uh, convictions um, at the state and federal levels are plea bargain. So there is no justice here. There's no justice system uh, the way you'd kind of imagine it. Um, so anyway, um, then I basically break that down and how that how that works. What I thought I'd speak about today is um, um, a couple of the projects that really got um, Aaron in trouble and how what he was doing is what's actively encouraged by the Internet Archive. So what he got in trouble for and got an FBI trouble for, the Internet Archive, tries to find more people um, and works in grants with um, the federal agencies to try to have more of it happen. And um, it's completely weird that, um, that, that he basically got nailed. I guess it's not weird, um, but he was just early and unfortunate and it shows really bad behavior um, at a colossal scale. And as Lisa pointed out, has not been apologized for and no real evidence that has been learned from. Well, let's take two of them. Uh, one is PACER. Um, PACER is public uh, public domain case materials. Um, law um, filings are not copyrighted. And the other is uh, journal uh, literature. Um, so the uh, journal, let's take the PACER case. Um, the, what, what they got Aaron for was reading too fast in a library. That's what got him arrested and drove driven out of millions of dollars that he made from being a founder of Reddit um, and going at and lawyer fees and drove him to suicide. Um, was reading too fast in a library. Um, so he had done data mining uh, on journal literature um, and he was also a real proponent of making public access to the public domain. Um, all should be a good thing. You'd think public domain should be publicly accessible. Well, it turns out a lot of it isn't. Um, some of it is locked up in a uh, in a system called PACER. And PACER uh, is uh, court documents, and they charge you seven cents or ten cents a page. Um, which you say, well, that's not too bad. Except some of these filings are huge, and it generates millions and millions and millions of dollars for PACER. So there was a idea that we could just go and liberate these uh, materials. And so he took advantage of a program of libraries had unlimited access, went to the Boston Public Library, downloaded a lot of it. And that got him uh, in trouble with the FBI. Uh, it's real problems. But that project has continued on um, and it's uh, gone very well where there's a browser plugin for those that are using the PACER uh, system so that um, it, if you're going to go and pay seven cents for something, it checks to see if it's in the Internet Archive or the Free Law database uh, first and delivers that to you if it's been already uh, made available outside. If you do pay the seven cents, then it goes and plunks it into Free the Law and uh, the Internet Archive servers. And I just looked up, there's over seven million cases um, and there's uh, 300,000 that were uh, uh, added to this collection just in October. So it's a growing, growing system uh, and it's doing very well. And there's even uh, now legislation bill proposed uh, to uh, make it so that PACER is available for free, which is 
always the uh, a good idea with the public domain. Um, and so this was a, um, so we're making progress um, and it's sort of vindicating um, that no, somebody shouldn't be hassled for making public access to the public domain. The other is in journal literature. So in journal literature um, and periodical literature, the Internet Archive has been actively uh, uh, crawling the web um, and in coordination with lots of different so science organizations and archive with an X and all sorts of good uh, organizations um, to go and make sure that it's saved. And we've saved uh, a lot of open access materials that didn't have um, longevity um, um, systems built into it. Um, and that's work is being done at the Internet Archive, Brian Newbold, Martin, and a bunch of others to go and actively archive these uh, materials and make them as publicly accessible as we, as we can. We're also working on things that are before the online era. Um, and going and digitizing a large amount of microfilm. And we're starting to go and digitize a lot more journal paper, uh, journal and periodicals, magazines, trade magazines, and trying to figure out how available we can make all of this through either controlled digital lending or interlibrary loan or some other uh, system entirely towards making things available to the blind and dyslexic for computer data mining and for, for instance, Wikipedia users that want to go and dive deeper than a Wikipedia page, click on it and go to um, the article that is used to go and be the citation for this. So the idea of turning all Wikipedia footnotes into clickable links um, allows people then go deeper and find out, well, is the assertion in Wikipedia backed up by by something? Um, and also dive deeper um, to go and find out more about uh, what they're looking at. So these are the uh, reasons why uh, the Internet Archive is doing it. And what we do first is start by doing massive crawling of these things and then try to find mechanisms to go and put things out in ways that all around make sense. Um, so Aaron Schwartz uh, is missed, um, but the work that he has worked on has continued. Um, the openlibrary.org site uh, was built on his underlying framework and uh, with him at the direction of the uh, of the architecture of openlibrary.org. We just moved it to Python 3. Yay, that was kind of a pain in the neck. Um, and uh, so that's now uh, done, uh, which is just great. And so we are um, uh, carrying on with uh, Aaron Schwartz's legacy uh, statue lives at the Internet Archive, 300 Funston. Um, thank you very much for coming. Please participate in Internet Archive projects or other projects that make sense that are in this course of bringing universal access to all knowledge, which was one of the real passions of Aaron Schwartz. And Lisa, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Back to Brewster. You. Thank you, Brewster. And uh, next, we are going to uh, have a presentation from Tracy Jaquith from the Internet Archive. And I'll let you take it away. Take it away, Tracy. Oops. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Awesome. Thanks, Tracy. We can't hear you, though. Uh-oh. Sorry. Seems to have muted me. Is it better? Better now? Yes. Now you need to get rid of the jitsy window that... Yeah. So go full screen okay. and unmuted. Woo! Awesome. Thank you, Tracy. Yay. Here we okay. Go. Um, so my, my talk today, uh, I sort of jokingly titled Processing Hype Project, because it's all about processing. Um, and the, the sort of joke is it, it's not PHP. Um, so well, welcome to Aaron Swartz Day. Um, it's an honor to follow Brewster. And thank you, Lisa, for inviting me to talk again. Um, it's always like, exciting. And I also, I'm just always pleased. Uh, every time I write Markdown like the slide uh, deck is, it makes me think of Aaron. So I love Markdown. 
Okay, so my title at the archive is TV architect. I work on audio, TV, and video. And um, if you want to follow along with our slides, uh, the slides here, you can go to tracy.dev.archive.org and all the links are, are hot and everything. Here's a little overview, which we're going to get through so you don't have to read this, but um, it's all about trying to get a bunch of us together to um, do processing of items much quicker and much more efficiently. So there's a few people I would give a little shout out to, um, Hank, Merline, Derek, uh, and Jake have all done um, really good, interesting work here. We'll talk about that. Okay, so first off, I'm going to talk a little bit about JavaScript because that's that's my current uh, jam right now. I really like JavaScript. Um, in 2015, ES6 came out, and um, it kind of started revolutionizing what you can and can't do, or what you can now do with JavaScript. So you can have normal classes with normal constructors, normal methods. You can even have static methods. Um, and it's it's very much like you know Java, Python, PHP, all the other languages that you used to, and we don't have to deal with this this prototype junk anymore or awkwardness that used to be before this. Um, some other uh, goodies that came in. Um, there's these arrow functions that make it so the the value this doesn't get swiped from you if you're an event handler. That was some bit a lot of JavaScript people before. There's um, uh, you can have default parameter values, um, as well as named parameters going in to methods. You can do spread and rest operators like a lot of other languages are doing now. So here you can split the string uh, into an array very efficiently with dot, 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 and it just comes out as little characters. That's a, a very simple example. Uh, there's promises. So you can do async IO and async network calls and things like that much more easily, even almost like um, multi-threaded coding with promises. It's very cool. There's also destructuring, so you can you can take a, a list or an array and set it uh, to a variable, and then you can sort of unpack it dynamically. So in this case, A is now one, the second value is getting thrown out, and B is three, and then you can do something like this where you can now swap them. So lots of nice little efficiency uh, things coming. Uh, the other thing is um, template strings, which are awesome if you've done JavaScript before with single quotes and double quotes. And multi lines, you don't have to worry about that anymore. You can just start with a back tick, and you can have multiple line um, strings and HTML. You can do uh, this nice little interpolation, so you can get to um, prior prior um, uh, values and and um, and things that you and other code that you've set up. You can even run arbitrary code and call other uh, template strings. So it's really really nice and convenient. Um, what has come in ES twenty twenty? There's a few different things, but the most exciting ones are these, um, as I like to think of it, I have lots of questions. So this is really nice because you can you can make a really compact line like this. And what this says is if item is not defined in, in the archive uh, variable, or metadata is not defined, or title is not defined, it's going to short circuit each one of those things and just short circuit right out. And then you can combine it with question mark, question mark, which is similar to other languages, which will now uh, be a compact way to do your ternary down to like two pieces. So if anything's null or undefined along this chain, you just get the word, uh, the phrase, no title. Just makes it really easy instead of if, blah, 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 type of, if, type of, if, type of, that kind of stuff. You can also do dynamic importing of code. You can import code normally, but now you can do it dynamically, which is really nice. So if you meet some sort of condition, you want to import uh, code from across the web or from if you're doing command line or from uh, Node.js, you can do that really easily. Uh, ES modules are super exciting. Um, the way you'll know you'll be using ES modules is you'll be using import or export instead of require. Um, and what's really nice, there's so many great things about it, but you can have all this code, you can have uh, pieces that are public versus pieces that are private. Um, it's just super, super easy, super um, wonderful, and you don't pollute global space. So if you're writing library code, the only thing that can be seen anywhere else is stuff you've explicitly exported, and the only things that people can get to uh, are stuff that you explicitly import. Uh, it also means you can write your front end and back end code with the same code. Um, and you can even load static JavaScript files. You don't even need a Node.js server. 
Um, if you do that, I would suggest using HTTP2 because you might be loading a lot of little JavaScript files or loading them on demand. But it's super, super nice, super fast. Um, it's it's totally the way of the future. And that means um, a lot of us who have been using JavaScript, you can finally get rid of things like Webpack, Transpiling, Babel, or whatever it is you're, you've been doing or are doing right now. If you want to see more um, detailed write-up on ES modules in particular, you can check out my blog, which um, talks about a blog from Lynn, um, Lynn Clark from Mozilla, who did an amazing, amazing write-up on it. It's dense, but it's so good if you are interested. Um, so yeah, so if you want to use um, ES modules, the way you get you go around that is you make a little package JSON minimally with type module that just tips off every piece of JavaScript running in that package um, or that code repo that you're now using modules and you're using import and export. Um, and things like Jest aren't quite there; they're just around. They're just about ready to do imports, but Mocha already does imports, so you can use, um, and it, I think it has for a very long time, so you can use Mocha for testing and C8 for coverage, so checking out how many lines of code have been called. If you want to see a nice example, um, there's a nice link here for a, a minimal repo that, that shows you how to do all that. Okay, so now we're going to switch over to the processing part of the archive. So um, we kind of call processing deriving. And what that means is we take an original file, one or more original files, and we make one or more uh, derivative files. So an example might be you have an audio file like a WAV or a FLAC or something like that, or AIAF, and we're going to make an MP3 that plays in the web, or maybe we'll make an M4A, depending. We're moving towards M4A at this point. Um, if you have a video file, we'll make an MP4. If you have some sort of imagery, we'll try to make a PDF and do our book reader kind of thing. So that's the kind of gist of how we do or think of deriving. It's input files, output files, or usually one input file, one output file, and it moves on um, in this priority order. The new exciting thing in the last few months that's super exciting for us is we have something we can now call serverless deriving. So it's kind of like Docker and Docker because the main deriving is actually already running in Docker. But the main driver can now run arbitrary containers with your code or whatever it is you want to do um, kind of on demand dynamically. So if you want to make um, some new aggregating file or some new um, CDX arc um, web archiving scanner file, you can now make, make some arbitrary code and we can look at it um, and, and do processing um, on live items or test items probably at first. But, you can now um, consider being uh, a contributor to the archive. Anyway, so your Docker images and containers can basically um, start from any operating system or any other Docker image as a from. Um, you can write in any coding language. Um, I just realized there's a typo there. Oops. Um, I, I good at math. And you can also include arbitrary dependencies like um, pip uh, modules, npm modules, composer modules, anything like that. You can also use our APIs right from your code, which is really nice. We have a really complete set of APIs listed here. I will note that the archive strongly prefers um, Python version 3. Brewster just mentioned that. We've been moving a lot of code to Python 3, so that's the kind of go-to right now. I'm going to sort of give you a little overview and a little diagram. Serverless overview, the way it happens and all goes down is the driver figures out what files you're, you're going to be uh, playing with, or, or it's almost like a make file, what files you're going to be uh, asked to process. And it, at the time of running your container, right before it starts, it sets up a copy, a read-write copy of a live item into a slash item directory. And as a sort of a sister directory, there's a slash task directory that has some processing info. It'll volume mount those if you're familiar with Docker, it's kind of like a, an NFS mount or something like that, but it just mounts those into your container when it starts, so they're already there, ready to go when you're ready to go. So how this works is we've got a cluster with archive items, like up here, and at some point someone decides your item should drive, so the drive main task fires off. It copies the item, pulls it down from the cluster into a sort of a safe space on our drivers, or our VMs. Anything that's running PHP in our monolith um, that's fine. It can run those directly, and so it might do like a web archiving arc file and make a CDX file. But now the new thing um, is we're moving, or the hope is moving most of it to this, uh, these serverless modules. So the serverless modules, the first thing it does is it volume mounts the item directory that was pulled down. So it's to your live, it's a copy of a read-write copy of the entire item. So it's got all of your 
your derivatives, all of your XML, anything like that, uh, metadata. And then at volume mounts this little task processing instructions, some other files, but that task JSON is your, your big important one. I'll show you a very concrete example in a second. It fires up your container. Um, and the first thing you're going to tend to do is parse your task JSON file. And you'll be asked to um, create um, a target file from a source file. You can also read and write any other files um, if you need, and you can create extra files if you need to, and it'll let the derive or main uh, process know I've got some extra files, and that's just fine too. So um, last couple slides, I'm going to make a really simple example. So I'm going to first just simulate how those um, directories get set up, and then we're going to put me out of a job with only 10 lines of code and show you how easy it is. So here's a setup. Normally, you wouldn't have to do this, but let's just say I'm going to um, take an AVI file. We're going to make an AV. We're going to make a thumbnail from a video file. That's the the sort of goal of this ten liner. So I'm going to pull down an AVI um, file from an item. I'm going to stick it into this just um, brand new created slash item directory, and I'm going to make a minimal um, task JSON file. So it sort of says, okay, that's my source file, and I want you to make a thumbnail uh, JPEG out of it. So AVI to JPEG. That's all you have to do. So that's kind of like how you're going to fire up. So everything from here on down is kind of what would be in your repo or your container. So again, um, if you're using JavaScript, set up um, type module. That just means you can do imports uh, and exports. So your Docker file, I'm going to start in this case, since I'm using Node and JavaScript, I'm going to use the fast version of Linux, the Alpine Linux on Node. It's super fast, super small. I'm going to copy all of my files from my repo into slash app. So that'll be there in the image when it's there. When the container fires up, I'm going to add the FFmpeg binary. And then finally, when the container fires up, I'm going to give it the instruction to say, run this command. So run app derive JavaScript. And that's right down here in below. That's another file in my repo. And I just have a couple system um, calls to do some read writing and to do some shelling. So I read my file, the task task JSON, which is already uh, there. I do the JSON parsing. And now all I have to do is run my little command. So I'm going to run ffmpeg minus i input file source file. And then that's my output file. That's it. So I just made um, you know less than 10 lines a serverless derived module. Easy peasy. When you're done, I exit 0. Um, and the driver takes care of everything. I can exit 1, uh, indicating a failure or any other non-zero status. And the driver will put the task in red row mode, which means an admin needs to look at. And it might indicate a problem or maybe a network problem or something like that. But that's that's it. It's really that simple. Um, and the goal is we're going to shrink our monolith repo. It's pretty much entirely PHP. It's 20 years of commits, uh, over 9,000 files. It makes a 5 gigabyte Git tree. And when we build Docker images out of it, they're huge between 3 and 10 gigs Docker images. This is going to make it um, much more like microservices. So we have small things that do small things. It's kind of like Lambda, kind of like serverless in the Amazon world. Uh, so how's it going so far early? Uh, just in a few months, we've already got four developers rapidly writing uh, serverless modules. And we expect we could have as many as half of all of our deriving um, using serverless modules. Maybe in a few months, we'll sort of see. That's, that's uh, our sort of hope. Um, we think it's going to allow more people to contribute. It already is. We're having people contribute who haven't written driver modules before, and we think it's the future for the archive. So thanks for attending my talk. Um, hopefully, you'll find it inspiring to um, work on our access to for everyone, access for everything, and letting more people play. Um, and that's not my cat, but the cat's awfully cute. So thanks for attending the talk. Great. Thank you, Tracy. And yes, it doesn't matter if it's your cat, as long as the obligatory cat to end with. We all appreciate it, of course. All right, next we're going to have um, Dr. Jonathan Borden is going to talk to us about cybernetic cyberspace and cyber surgery. Jonathan was um, in the uh, RDF working group with Aaron. Um, way back in the early 2000s, is right around the same time I was working with Aaron at Creative Commons. And um, he's going to talk to us. Jonathan has always been a proponent for open data, open medical data. He was doing advocating for telemedicine way back in the 90s when uh, it was this crazy thing for people to be able to talk to their doctor remotely, uh, something we all take for granted now, especially now during the pandemic. 
but he was one of the people back in the 90s saying, hey, we could do this thing. You know, um, it's kind of funny how these ideas were like so crazy at the time and now it's just commonplace. So I will let you um, talk to, uh, hear from Dr. Borden and um, take it away, Jonathan. Well, thank you, Lisa. Uh, it's great to be here today. Uh, and I'm gonna try to give a little PowerPoint presentation. Here we go. This works. Okay. And is this just... All right. Does that does that show me? So how can I turn my camera on? I don't know how to do that. I think you're basically going between two windows. Um, we're trying to go back and forth between the slides and the viewer. Is that what's going on? So put the, put the, uh, put the... Here we go. You did it. Great. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. And Jonathan, you can make it full screen. Yeah. Great. Great. Okay. So, um, whoop, wait a minute here. Yeah, I'm having a little technical. Okay. There we go. So today I want to talk about cybernetics, cyberspace, and cybersurgery, and basically using robotics for complex scoliosis surgery, something that I've been doing recently, and also using scientific journals for complex modeling and, and decision making. Uh, and, and we're going to talk, try to talk about how the two are related. So stereotaxis uh, is using 3D coordinates in the body to apply uh, uh, procedures. And, and this was invented by Horsley and, and Clark in 1908. And, and it was used to make lesions in a brain, initially in animals. Um, and then Lexell and Larson in, in Sweden in 1948 used to target photons, gamma rays, to treat tumors and other conditions. And ultimately, the gamma knife uh, was introduced in 1968. And now over a million patients and over 2,800 publications have been done uh, regarding this. Uh, now, cybernetics was coined by Norbert Wiener in 1948, and, and that involves air feedback or steering. And then cyberspace, which isn't really cybernetics, but, but has a web or space of information sources determined by vectors, uh, which, which are now URIs. So in, in 1984, I was interested in, in taking journal articles as information sources and creating a scientific theory from an aggregate of journal articles and then modeling that on the computer and coming out with results. And we used uh, uh, the basis for this was a Grasper 1.0, which used nodes, arcs, nodes and spaces. And this is actually quads, but really very similar to to RDF and, and OWL and, and the things that we do now in the semantic web. But basically the scientific articles form the data source and, and the network is what's simulated. And so this is really why it's it was extremely laborious and we'd like to be able to do this on a larger scale. And, and that's why it's, it's so critical to have not just the titles or summary of a journal article, but the entire article on the web for, for everyone to use. And, and then I, I went on and, and got back involved with 3D reconstruction and deconvolution. So back to a little, little the Wiener kernels. Um, and again, this article published in 1988, still not available in entirety. You have to pay for it from Science Magazine. Um, I didn't get paid <laughs> anything, right? But, but the, the journal owns the, the copyright. So then in, in 1993, I was, I was still working on some 3D reconstruction work and, and I sat 
in awe when I saw the first browser. And, and Tim Berners-Lee obviously created the, the web to share scientific information. And I remember clicking from site to site because you have to realize this had not ever existed before. And I felt like I was going to France or Switzerland or California or Boston or wherever else. Click to click to click. And it, it just, you know, it, it blew me away, obviously. And, and I felt really that we could put scientific information, journal articles on the web and, and create this network and, and share them. And, and I started to get involved in, in healthcare on the web. And, and yes, we did telemedicine and, and other things like that. Now, at the time, um, that's when I, I met Aaron. And, and at the time I met him, he was 13. And we were participating in these male groups about XML and tagging and, and RDF. And, and you know, uh, Aaron, Aaron was, when I first met him, I think I first met him when he was 15, but he was, he was really very short at the time. I mean, he had not, you know, he had not gone through his growth spurt completely. And, 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 and he was there with the, these scientists and, and professors and, and, and member and people sent by IBM and, and Sun Microsystems and, and all of these companies. But, you know, he really um, contributed a lot. He was very passionate to this idea of open information and, and, I, and, and clearly his, his goal of putting everything on the web was a, a goal that I shared as well. Um, so back to today, and I, I'd like to now get back to the cybernetics and cyber surgery and this idea of, of steering using feedback and we're actually performing surgery, uh, complex surgery for spinal deformities using all of these techniques. And here's a little video to show an actual surgery. So these are seen by the cameras and it's on the screen is showing on the scan where we are in real life. And, and this is live. This is how it actually looks. But you, we see on a screen where the probe is, and this is real life, and this is the computer screen. And these dots give us feedback to make sure there's no error in, in the matchup between the computer and, and real life. Again, all of all of these balls have a infrared camera sensors that allow this to be positioned uh, allow this to be positioned and you know this is a type of virtual reality it's 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 live and virtual at the same time so let me talk about how we do this the stereotactic coordinates that I talked about before are obtained from the CT scan. We do a three-dimensional reconstruction, like I showed before, on an intraoperative workstation. And that allows us to plan correction and the hardware. And then we register the patient's live anatomy on the CT scan via fluoroscopy or a live x-ray imaging. And once that's done, 
using the infrared guidance, we do live tracking of the instruments, hardware, and the patient position. So that feedback of the live positioning navigated surgery is now cyber surgery. Cybernetics is the feedback that Norbert Wiener talked about in 1948. So this, this slide shows the planning on the workstation and, and all of the implants are, are precisely, uh, that's a screw that's 7.5 millimeters in diameter by 45 millimeters in length. Each of these are different based on the actual bones. Okay, that's another that's, and so here that shows on the workstation what we can do. And I'm just gonna start some of these 3D rotations. So before we start the surgery, I, I come and look at this and plan it out. Okay, and those are the pictures that we would be would be seen during surgery. So then we we attach through a pin. That's the robotic arm how it attaches to the patient. There are all these instruments. We have a big team of people under the microscope. There's a video camera. There's a lot going on. These are this is some of the uh, imaging registration uh, with with the X-ray imaging so that we get you know sub millimeter accuracy. And then this again shows the operating room. Here's a probe with the markers on it that are guided infrared. The actual robot itself has markers on it so that we're guiding it. In this case, we are through the guidance putting in an operating microscope that gives me a three dimensional view inside a very small hole. And we can do microsurgery there to free up a nerve or whatever else needs to be done. And again, the guidance, here's the screen. It shows where the, where the screw is going to be placed on the plan. And then we'll see how it's actually being done at the same time. This is all being done through the skin. No big, large incisions. It's all being done through the skin. I'm using my hand here to help the robot out a little bit so it doesn't slip. And then we anchor things. Again, because we can't have any movement. There's, there can't be any slippage. So it tells me it's green. It means we're good. We're drilling a pilot hole. And then we're going to place the implant. This is all real time. So we can put all the implants in. And then here's, a, here's an example. This is, this is a woman whose spine came in like this. I mean, it's going here, all the way over here. Here, she's actually leaning. Her head is up, is up here. She's leaning to the side. She can't stand up straight. And then after the surgery, uh, it, it's, it's straight. And this is actually called a kickstand rod to, because of the extreme degree of, uh, 
of, of tilt right here. So this shows an initial stabilization of the very base. And then these dots are used uh, to calibrate the X-ray image with the CAT scan and adjust for any patient mo motion. If this body moves or this one or this one, the computer will adjust each vertebral body even after motion based on this X-ray. And here is after all the implants and everything is nice and straight. So here you can see a tilt there and now it's perfectly straight. Here's another example. This is someone's spine, which is all bent out of shape and very straight here and straight and a nice curve that we're supposed to have. And why don't we go back to live. All right. Um, so Jonathan, I just want to let you know that you have more time. Corey's not scheduled to go on until 1.30. So okay. you're welcome to continue to to go till then or I just well, I don't know if if anybody has questions we can sure I guess my, I have a question or sure I I wanted to know if you could explain exactly um and maybe you're going to talk about this later in your talk so we can wait and, and have questions at the end but I am curious how the robotic device that we saw in the videos how it's trained how it gets its software instructions, that that sort of thing. I'm curious what that process is. Right. So, so um, th that training is when the CAT scan is is done and loaded into the workstation in the operating room. Then the the pictures we showed, the blue and yellow, we actually program that right at the beginning of the surgery or before the surgery. And, and that is what determines where the arm is going to go from place to place to place. So there's actually an operator that says, okay, go to point one and then point two and then point three. And that's all based on those stereotactic coordinates. So there's a three-dimensional coordinate system from the CAT scan. Each slice is Z and X and Y are back and forth and up and down. And every point on a scan has a three-dimensional coordinate. Um, the CAT scan coordinate system is then mapped to the patient coordinate system. And in the operating room, when the patient, the patient may move, that curvature may change during the surgery, but the, the x-ray will match each bone to the CAT scan. And so the patient coordinate system is then mapped to the CAT scan coordinate system. And it, it means that it, it may angle, it may, it may fold, it may be stretched in different directions, but when the trajectory and depth is is placed, um, it, it will be very precise. There are actually cameras in the operating room watching this to, if, if the patient moves, it'll adjust for that. Uh, if something bends, it adjusts for that. There, there, I mean, you can, I can, maybe I'll, let me go back and, and go over that again. Um, so here's where I'm talking about the three D planning.
So at the, this is formed from the CAT scan. And with software, each implant is placed. Okay. And then it will, it will show the rod. I didn't show the rod placement, but that's done afterwards. So as part of the planning software, each implant is, is placed here. Okay. And I can rotate it and look at it from different angles. And then this view here would be the same view that we see during, during the actual surgery. So, so this view, you'd think, okay, that looks nice and everything, but I can't really see what's going on inside the bone. And I mean, there, there's going to be a nerve here. There's going to be a nerve here. You, you know, I need to see the actual bone structures. The, the 3D image is fine for making sure the shape of the rod is good, but, but really I, this, is the de this is the data that I need to see for targeting during the actual surgery. Let me see how I get to the next. So then again, this is attached to the robot and then this is how it's registered with these these dots and and these are known by the software and the x-ray and they will then match up to each of the bones because now it's curved where it was flat and and so each bone is registered separately so as this robotic arm moves from place to place to place if there's any motion, this picks it up and, and this picks it up. Does, does that make more sense? Did, does, does that? explain better how we do the programming and, and how the robot works. I mean, it, the robot is not working autonomously. It's, it's working under my direction. I mean, it, it's not doing the surgery by itself. I'm doing the surgery using the robot to assist me. Let's not think that the robot is just, I mean, you know, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. It's, it's robot assisted surgery, but this comp, this complex surgery, the blood loss is less, it's faster. There's less anesthesia. Uh, it's less invasive. The, the length of stay is less. So I, I think it's an advance. Okay, great. <laughs> so, um, do you have more? I mean, if there are other questions, I can I can talk about more about it. If there are certain, yeah, we don't have um, a lot of questions um, coming in on the little sheet, um, but um, basically, I'm just um, very curious about how sort of the implications of this, I guess, in terms of um, what it means. I mean, how quickly if someone comes into your office, are they able to sort of be helped by the surgery and how long, you know, what kind of what's the process like to go through from the time they go to see you from the time of getting the surgery and, and getting better? Yeah, so that depends. I mean, we don't, um, 
uh, let, let me play, I think we have a little time. Let me play a video of from a patient experience, uh, how this worked. And I think that'll be good. Let me look. Okay. Spinal stimulator. Welcome to Tri Health On Call. Today we hear Judy Bumbelow's life changing story on how she was treated for scoliosis using the latest innovation of robotic guided spine surgery by Dr. Borden with the Tri Health Orthopedic and Sports Institute. Before I saw Dr. Borden, I couldn't walk. I mean, my house was a, about it, unless I held on to a grocery cart shopping or go to the zoo with my granddaughter and great grandson and help push his stroller. That was the only way I could walk. When Judy first came in, she was clearly in agony. She was bent forward. She couldn't walk. She couldn't do anything. She was on high doses of strong narcotics. She also had a spinal stimulator attempt to control the pain. None of it was working. I was miserable then. I, my life was, I, I couldn't do anything. So my life amounted to nothing. Robotic guided surgery entails an arm that precisely allows us to place an implant through the skin. We have the only site in the state of Ohio with this technology. I said, can you fix me? And he looked over the, my chart and he looked at his screen and he said, yeah, I can fix you. And I think surgery was maybe three weeks later. It, I mean, it didn't take any time to get me in and it was just, it was amazing. It's an incredibly gratifying feeling to know that- I can walk. She's able to play with her grandkids. I can stand straight up. And that I was able to help her. It's wonderful. It is absolutely wonderful. For more information on the latest orthopedic treatments, go to tryhealth.com slash ortho. Hey, thanks. That answered all of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you. I thought um, it would. Yes. Uh, if we could talk a little bit about um, open data the need for open um, data, open medical metadata, and anything um, in that area that you might want to comment on in terms of it assisting I the, mean, the importance so, of it. So back to this, and 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 back to what Aaron was was actually doing at MIT was, was taking scientific journal articles that and, and you know the united states government actually pays for the research i mean not all of it but but a substantial amount so so the taxpayers we are already paying for this research that's done by scientists all over the country and they write articles based on that and and in order to get advancement to become a professor and because to get professional, you need to write articles, and and so then then the articles are submitted to a journal, and the journals have editorial boards, which are made up of other doctors or scientists, and I don't think the editors are paid, and being on an editorial board, you don't generally get paid, so but yet the journal maintains the copyright for this, so then they they print the articles and have subscribers who have to pay. And most it, mostly it's libraries that pay. Uh, it, it could be individuals as part of your dues to uh, scientific society, you get the journal. Um, but there's no need for that article to not be public. I mean, I'm not really sure who benefits from keeping these articles locked up uh, across a paywall. Um, I don't benefit. 
Um, as well, a scientist, I'd like my corporations benefit financially. I guess is the easy. Well, answer. they're they're um, publishing houses, I guess. But I mean, you know, I'd like everyone to be able to read it, right? I mean, uh, and and I think a lot of scientists now feel that the articles should be published, and 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 the archive with an X, for example. And so in physics, uh, it's it's becoming very common to publish the the article publicly first, and then it may go into a journal. Um, but you know, I think, and the National Library of Medicine is also a wonderful, uh, wonderful facility. I mean, part of our government, part of the National Institute of Health, and they do a fantastic job of indexing all the articles and coming up with ontologies and classifications <coughs> and we have PubMed. So you can get an idea on PubMed, but we don't have all the data on PubMed. And and so there are a lot of people who really feel that we should have all the methods, everything on PubMed. We're already paying for it. And you know, I feel strongly that the NIH or the, the, the NIH should say that any articles published that have been funded by the NIH should be public domain or they should be released to the National Library of Medicine um, to be made public. Not public domain, but the government could have the copyright. Um, and the same thing would be the FDA. Any any research used to test a new drug should be publicly available. We're paying for it. The public pays for the drugs. The public is paying for the procedures done uh, through healthcare. So we should have access to that information. And you know, as a it doesn't hurt scientists. Scientists is making no money from the publication. There's really no reason for this legacy thing. So, I mean, you know, on the other hand, who really is going to read it? I mean, usually, if you're at a university, you through your through your library, you have access. But but yet, I mean. What Aaron was doing, I think that the majority of the, the scientists in the world agree that that information should be public. And I mean, it's, it's sort of astonishing what, what happened. I mean, incredibly sad. Um, you know, if you knew Aaron, I mean, he, he was, uh, I mean, he was brilliant. He didn't always work within the system. Um, he was very passionate about his ideas. And I, I mean, I agree with his ideas completely. His, he, he would sometimes like to go up against the system. And, and I believe that's why he got in trouble, although he didn't do anything wrong. But, um, you know, everyone said this before. I mean, I, 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 I think that all the work that's being done here is phenomenal. I mean, the Internet Archive and, and the work with libraries is great. I would like to see the actual full text PDF available as publication. And there's no reason that should happen. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we have some questions now um, from the uh, streaming audience. Um, so uh, one person asks, do you think that surgery will eventually be done by autonomous robots? Hmm. It may be in the future. Um, there are, and I'm working on some of the impediments to it. There, there's still a lot that needs to be done manually. And we have to have a backup plan when the robot breaks. I mean, if you if you see that, there are so many moving parts. There are areas where something could fail, and we have to be prepared. We have to have a backup plan. 
Um, if the robot isn't accurate, if I don't like the accuracy, I do it manually. Now, that's not that often, but mm, even one in a hundred, you know, it could be 90% good. That's not good enough because that could mean someone could become paralyzed one in a hundred times. I mean, 99% isn't really accurate enough. Is 99.9% .9 accurate enough? Maybe. I mean, when we talk about accuracy, though, it's, it's a percentage. So I think it, it will help us. And the question is, at some point, would it be able to do it better than a surgeon or with a surgeon's intervention? So the robot collaborating with the surgeon, will that be the best way to do it? And, and that question isn't answered right now. Um, okay, so it sounds like not yet. Um, and, um, and really there's too much, especially for the kind of surgery that you're doing, there's just too much at risk to, um, until it's perfect, it, it, it won't be being done by robots. Yes. Um, so but, this on, a, on the flip side, yeah, you know, if you're not using this guidance, those angles, I mean, each of those bones is going off in a different direction. And if you're off in any one direction, you can hit a nerve or or the spinal cord. The the guidance, the scare tactic guidance is, is just a phenomenal improvement uh, in our ability to do this complex surgery safely. So it really it really allows us to do things we couldn't do before. Okay, great. We have another question, um, which is actually kind of ties into, I think, what you were just saying in terms of um, can any, what can go wrong exactly when you're doing these kinds of surgeries? And the person was wondering if there was, if there was any actual visual observation as to exactly where the screws are being placed or, or not. Are, are you still able to see exactly everything going on or is the whole point of the robotic um, device, it seems to be sort of to um, take that into account when the screws are, are being placed or? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so one thing is we are monitoring the spinal cord and nerves electrically during the procedure. So if a nerve were to get hit, bumped, it would send off an alarm. You can even tell how close you are to a nerve by putting an impulse out and and measuring how much voltage it takes to stimulate the nerve. So that's being done continuously during the surgery. And then at certain points, uh, the confirmation is done with that intraoperative x-ray called fluoroscopy. So the, the pictures are fluoroscopically confirmed. And if I'm, I'm very concerned, I have the ability to get a CT scan in the operating room to confirm the, the location. So we don't visually directly see the screw, um, but we have other techniques to ensure that they're in the right place. Okay, so uh, what else can go wrong, so to speak, when you're, you know, not necessarily just in this technique, but I'm also curious, in general, when you're when you're using these kinds of techniques, does it introduce any other sort of things that could go wrong, or is it more taking care of things that can go wrong when it's a human by themselves? And the whole point is that using the robotic device makes things more safe, not less. Generally. Yeah, I think that um, I, I I think that that's that's a good question. I mean, I, I mean. Robotics is being used more in surgery in general. And so there's the training issue uh, when someone's first starting to use the technology, there may be errors. They may not, not have the uh, skill. So how do you train people in using this? I mean, doing this type of surgery for scoliosis is only being done probably in two or three places in the country right now. Um, most surgeons are still using the open, so they actually see where the screw goes. 
Um, but I think it's better. So things evolve. Uh, I, I, it's up ultimately up to the surgeon to take the responsibility to make sure that everything goes well. And many people aren't yet comfortable. So that's where we have to publish. I mean, I haven't, I haven't published these techniques yet. I'm going to, to and, and we're involved with training other surgeons on how to do this type of surgery. So, so surgeons could come and, and watch a surgery um, and see how it's done. And then if, if they get the technology, their site goes live, they may want to come down and see how a more complicated surgery is being done. Right. You used to say, see one, do one, teach one. To me, <laughs> about brain surgery, which I just always thought was funny. I thought I'd share that. Yeah, not one. quite that, but right. <laughs> okay, the last question is, um, where do you see artificial intelligence driving medical innovation going forward? So I, I touched on that in the very beginning of my talk. And I think that's where, if we had the journal articles online, then we could use artificial intelligence to mine the data, compare the methods, compare the results. So we could do metadata analysis uh, and also we can then start to form um, networks of information to do simulations. And I think something I didn't talk about too much was that one of the reasons I got sidetracked from, because the first work I was doing was artificial intelligence into the 3D reconstruction is that the, the shape of the brain cells determines the function. So it's not just chemical reactions, but it's also the shape of the cell and how the chemical waves or the, and the action potentials, the electrochemical waves go down the cell. And, and so the shape is important. And, and in order to understand that, we need to do 3D modeling. Um, but now with artificial intelligence, you know, it started out this, this concept of the neural network. And that's another type of AI um, to, to do the modeling and then sort of self-learning. And but but you have to have the information there to learn on, so that's really where these large archives of information. It could be images. I mean, if all the, for example, mammograms, breast images are online, and 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 an AI agent can train based on that, they can become better. If the journals are all online, we can look at. Um, discoveries in different areas and, and, and synergize, bring them together and come up with new ideas based on older ideas. I and mean, that's how we work, but this could be automated. Um, and, and it is being automated. We need the, we need the data though. And that's where these large data sets becoming online are, are critical for AI. Okay, cool. And then I just want to ask you a little bit more while we have you before um, before we uh, end here. Um, you sent me a picture that was really hard to see, to be honest, from Aaron's um, blog of what he called the RDF cabal, yes. which was you and Tim Berners-Lee and Dan Brickley and some other people. Um, and I just wanted to emphasize, I know it was really true with um, Creative Commons, um, where we were so sure, I was just sure that Aaron was the guy that we wanted, and I didn't had no idea that he was 14 years old. Um, he was just by objectively objective standards of the biggest and 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 brightest on the um, list as far as the person I wanted to deal with. So I just want to know a little bit about what was it like working with him on the RDF group, and. Um, I try to explain to people that you do, once you dig into something with him, you would pretty much forget that he was a kid pretty quickly. And then you were just trying to keep up with, I know myself, I was just trying to keep up with him as far as getting the work done. He had would have such a clear vision of, 
you know, the best way to do something and um, was may have been more diplomatic about it in his younger years because he was, you know, hanging out with the adults uh, kind of thing. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit about Aaron, that. Aaron, yeah, Aaron was never diplomatic. I mean, <laughs> he was exactly, you know, and so I actually I was sort of a little bit, you know, shocked to see myself as part of this cabal, which I never, I never knew that I was, I was actually part of the RDF cabal, right? Um, I mean, I mean, I, w I got involved, uh, Jim Hendler, who was the head of the, uh, it used to be the DAML working group or DARPA agent markup working group. So this was funded by DARPA and then it became the web ontology working group. And my interest was always healthcare and, and healthcare ontologies, scientific ontologies, which are vocabularies and, and, and classifications. And, and so we, we had a meeting and it, and it might've also been a semantic web interest group. We had a combined meeting, uh, which, which Tim Berners-Lee hosted at, at MIT and, and Aaron came, you know, um, and he participated in the meeting. Um, uh, I was interested in, in, in RDF as a knowledge representation language, and I've been interested in knowledge representation forever. I mean, that's part of the, the type of artificial intelligence that, that I was involved with. So how do you represent scientific knowledge? Um, so Aaron was there, but of course we, we, you know, we weren't just there at a meeting. We were the cabal, you know, somehow trying to take over the world or something. I don't know. It, it wasn't secret, was it? I don't know. <laughs> but that, that, that was Aaron's personality, right? Uh, <laughs> right, right. And I, I think that, do you remember what time of year that meeting was? If that, that was at MIT. I mean, that was uh, in Cambridge in the yeah. spring of 2002, I want to say. Does that sound right? No, it was actually, um, the, the picture was posted at, at um, uh, 2001, March of 2001. Ah, okay. So it was even before the Creative Commons stuff. Then. Yeah. Um, and, hmm. You know, if you realize, this is also before 9-11. Right. So, I mean, a lot of things changed after that. On the other hand, you, you know, I have to say that, that this whole metadata analysis was the way we tracked down what happened in 9-11. And, and that's why the, the DARPA was funding this, you know. I mean, I mean... Our government and military funds a lot of artificial intelligence work and always has. And so it's, it's very disturbing that on one hand, you know, the type of work that Aaron was doing was helping us out uh, in terms of what we need to do in terms of metadata. And at the same time, he would be seen as a subversive. Uh, to the FBI. I mean, it's right. You know, I mean, this kid. It, you, you know, I mean, his his passion for open information was um, was well known and well articulated. Right, and we're pretty sure that's the other reason why he was set up as. Uh, as a target that they, you know, decided to make an example out of him for that reason as well. I, 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 honestly, I don't think there was any any um, coordinated thinking because the the government organizations that really use this data mining techniques and large database analysis techniques and artificial intelligence techniques you know, keep that secret, but they want to promote this type of work. Because they're, they're using Corey, Corey, can you mute? 
Corey calling you. Corey, can you mute? Sorry, please continue, Jonathan. Oh, okay. Well, I was going to say, on, on, on one hand, the, the government uses the, the type of work that we're doing. Um, I, I mean, I've always worked on the civilian side, but, you know, we know that things like speech recognition and artificial intelligence are used to track um foreign government agents and that sort of thing i mean i mean you know that's why a lot of this research is funded by darpa and always has and and the internet was uh funded by parts of the military the office of naval research and other areas have funded you know internet protocol and other things because it's 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 valuable for our military. So on one hand, you know, people that are actually doing stuff that's valuable um, are being attacked by another part of the government. Right, right. And as I was explaining to someone, I was interviewed for a, a college student that was doing a paper on hackers and what hackers were, and it was really interesting explaining that you know hackers built the internet. And um, a lot of them were working for the government at the time when they when they did it because hackers might work for the government or they might work for a corporation or they might be independent. You know, hackers itself, hacking didn't used to be by itself have this negative, these negative connotations to it. It was just somebody um, who was building things and doing things with computers and making things better, generally making things better it, it wasn't even that. In, 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 you know, when I was in college, hacking was like a way to get a job, okay? Like if you could break into something, you'd get hired. Right. And then it started to be the, the companies decided to feel threatened by it. And with the, um, with the, the CFAA being passed, um, I mean, it made, made it criminal, like criminalizing it was a selective enforcement kind of thing where one person might do it high profile. Maybe they write books. Maybe they're familiar with them. It would be okay. And then someone else. It used to be sort of like a resume. I, I was able to infiltrate your system, and here's my qualifications. I can help you fix it. You know, kind of thing in the '90s. Um, and you would really be a bad idea to do that kind of thing now. You would probably be prosecuted immediately. And right. you know, so time times have changed. Um, and it's all just about perception and cultural perceptions at any given time. Um, and that's actually why we spend so much time at Aaron Swartz Day every year, reminding everybody uh, to get the story right about Aaron, because when it all happened, it was looked upon as, uh, you know, the hacker kid that didn't want to go to jail for what he did. And so he took his own life. And as it, as it turns out, he probably wasn't going to jail for anything. The truth was going to come out, but we didn't have a chance, you know, he didn't have a chance to make his case yet. So it's, very important to look back on these things and try to figure out what we can learn and stuff like that so thank you so much for explaining everything to us jonathan i really appreciate um having you on well, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk yeah thank you so much all right great and everybody um next up is corey doctorow uh, who will be coming us uh, to us from his home in los angeles and he is going to tell us about early onset Oppenheimer's. Take it away, Corey. Thanks. Uh, can you hear me okay? Great. And um, do you have uh, that video that you were going to show beforehand? I'm sorry. I forgot about that. Grant, That's okay. We have that all queued up, don't we? So first of all, we're going to look at this video from Aaron Swartz um, in 2003 at South by Southwest on a panel talking about DRM. Um, with me. With Corey on the panel. Yeah. Um, and we're just gonna watch that real quick. Here we go. Can I actually ask one of to Aaron, just to kind of get things kicked off here? Sure. Just to pick on Aaron's more. Um, <laughs> so we, we've heard a couple people talk about digital rights management, and then you've also heard us talk about the machine, read, the machine readable licenses. Um, one question that gets asked a lot 
um, when we go around and talk about Creative Commons, is how, uh, how is our project different from digital rights management? And Aaron can answer that question much better than I can, so I'll hand it off to him. All right, so as the, uh, the video explained, digital rights management is saying no trespassing, stay out. And our thing is saying, please come in, but tread carefully, follow, you know, you're welcome to do this, but follow these things. And so by explaining that, we hope to build tools that will do the opposite of DRM. They'll show people that by indicating what's allowed, you don't have to keep them from doing what's not. You know, and I think DRM is very dangerous not only because it, you know, because it blocks certain uses that lots of people seem to enjoy, but also because it blocks legal uses like fair use. It doesn't make distinctions between, you know, between taking a whole section of a book or taking the full book and selling it. And so I think it's very dangerous to sort of give away all our abilities over to a computer system if no human will do, if nobody checking it. So I think it's exciting that when you license something under a creative commons, you have a chance to say, no, I believe in people, you know, following the rules where I set them out clearly. Yeah. Okay, back to you, Corey. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I didn't actually, uh, I couldn't see it that time when it played back. I watched it a couple of days ago. Um, and I, I thought it would make a, a great uh, pre-roll for what I want to talk about today. Uh, because what I want to talk about today is is the motivation behind the di digital liberties movement, uh, the things that Electronic Frontier Foundation and Demand Progress and other organizations like the Free Software Foundation dedicated themselves to uh, and what we got wrong, because it's worth having a bit of a post-mortem here. And I, I think that um, there is a pervasive story about what we got wrong that is itself wrong. And so uh, in the interest of making everything a little more right, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little about early onset Oppenheimers today. So when people uh, uh, try to look back on the early days of the digital liberties movement, there's a pervasive myth that it was founded by and, and staffed up by people who were kind of blind optimists, who felt that no matter what, we were headed for a better future uh, and that all that remained to be done was accelerate the day that the future arrived by just making sure that as many people were connected to the internet as possible. And once that happened, everything would be fine. And certainly like there are, uh, companies that took that line. That was that was Mark Zuckerberg's official philosophy for many years. But it wasn't the thing that animated the digital liberties movement. The digital liberties movement was animated by two things. One was a palpable excitement about what technology could do for us. And certainly Aaron had that. Um, I, uh, as I sit here in my backyard in Southern California, I think about all the different places Aaron and I sat down to talk about the future of technology and how exciting it could be. And one of them was was a backyard much like this uh, when Dana Boyd was living out here. And uh, I was in town and came out to see her and Aaron was there as well. And we had a lovely afternoon chatting. Um, and, and that excitement was certainly present from the earliest days of, of technology and technology activism. But the other piece of it was a great fear of what could happen if technology were distorted, if it were pressed into service to control people instead of liberating them. You know, you don't start an organization like the Electronic Frontier Foundation because you think everything's just gonna be fine. If you think everything's just gonna be fine, you go do a startup and get rich. You don't take a semi-vow of poverty and spend the rest of your life just arguing with people in smoke-filled rooms about how technology should work. You have to really be worried about how badly things could go. Now, before computing was the source of repeated stock bubbles, it was just a passion. You know, Aaron's younger than me. I'm, I'm going to turn 50 next year. But even when I was getting started, and certainly when my dad was getting started, being uh, really engaged with computers was not seen as a get-rich-quick scheme. You know, my, my dad did his degree at the University of Waterloo in Ontario in what was then called applied mathematics because they didn't call it computer science yet. And getting an applied math degree meant that you could go off and do work like, um, you know, helping the National Weather Service write slightly better punch card sorting algorithms or help insurance companies, you know, pivot a table uh, very slowly using mini computers or mainframes. 
Um, and so the, the reason that people got involved with this was not dreams of riches, it was passion. And the passion is easy to understand. And I think Aaron also embodies much of that because when you um, first sit down at a computer and you write your first non-trivial program, you discover that if you can express your will with sufficient precision, that the computer will then realize your will for you, will run your program perfectly and execute the thing that you thought needed doing in the world as many times as you ask it to, cheerfully, usually instantaneously. And then as networks became part of our lives, we discovered that not only could we make our will tangible in the computer, but that we could project it around the world, that we could take our will and we could hand it to other people. It's, it's like inventing a really cool brownie recipe and then discovering that you didn't have to be content with sharing the recipe with your friends, that you could make a brownie making robot that would stamp out perfect replicas of your brownie for free, infinitely, everywhere in the world, all at once, for anyone who wanted them. I mean, that is a very heady, passion-inducing experience. And if that weren't enough, there was the other thing that networks gave us, which was the power to connect with other people who shared our interests, or, or even more importantly, who knew about the interests that we had that we didn't even know we had yet, who could say the words for the wordless feelings that we had felt but never been able to articulate to the people around us, to live in this society of the mind, as Barlow used to call it, and discover the people who thought like us, make common cause with them, collaborate with them, make new things in the world together with them. Um, this was the source of powerful self-determination, right? The ability to have a computer do what you ask it to, the ability to give that to other people, the ability to find other people to do things with. Those are all at the core of self-determination. And you know, the first technology policy fights, they were all about self-determination. You know, that uh, infamous legendary story of Richard Stallman walking into the lab one day and discovering that the drawer where they kept the paper tapes with the printer drivers on it had been locked and that his choices from now on were to print the way that someone else had decided he should print or not print at all and that the days of getting the tape out and making new holes in it so it could do what Richard wanted it to do those days were were allegedly gone and uh, were not legitimate to have begun with and Richard should just suck it up. And of course he didn't suck it up. He created the free software movement, a movement that is grounded in self-determination for programmers and for users of technology. And then you have Bill Gates and his infamous memo to the uh, homebrew computer club where he walked in and basically said, Hey, you people, um, the days in which I write a program and you get to change the program so that it suits you. And then you write a program and you get to change it so that it suits someone else. Those days are over, you know, from now on, uh, I write my program. And if you don't like my program, you don't have to run it, but you don't get to change it anymore. Y you know, your self-determination from now on is uh, use or not use, not make it suit your hand better. And then, you know, the first ever fights over how we would use networks were all about self-determination. In the olden days of the internet, before the web, the social internet, the civilian internet, the internet where we did stuff that wasn't just the communications protocols themselves, was mostly contained in a, in a system called Usenet, a distributed system of message boards. And Usenet was, was um, secretly funded by giant corporations. And when I say secretly funded, I don't mean that they funded it in secret. I meant that the fact that it was funded by them was a secret to them. Their systems administrators used to bury the costs for carrying all the traffic of Usenet in these thousand page phone bills and just hope that their bosses wouldn't notice. And the people who maintain this core infrastructure, they called themselves with only like semi comedy, the backbone cabal. And the Backbone Cabal organized Usenet so that there could be um, votes on where Usenet discussion groups would, would be created and what their rules would be and so on. But the votes were had an electoral college. <laughs> and that electoral college 
was the backbone cabal. If the backbone cabal didn't like the way that Usenet users voted, they just overruled them. And there was a persistent and to this day, very odd ongoing fight about whether discussion groups about cooking belonged in the rec hierarchy for recreation or the talk hierarchy for places where people hung out and talked to each other. And the Backbone Cabal did not like the way Usenet users voted on this. And so a group of Usenet users, including John Gilmore, how found EFF, founded an alternate Usenet, a parallel internet called the Alt Hierarchy, whose first ever group was called Alt Gourmand. And in the Alt Hierarchy, you got to decide how the discussions that you wanted to have would be classified. It was a fight about self-determination. Now, some of the worst nightmares that the early technologists who are involved in founding organizations like EFF have been realized. We have uh, arrived at a moment where we have both total penetration of technology and near total centralization of technology. And where the centralized owners and controllers of our technology put it primarily to use in surveilling us and manipulating us and extracting value from us. How is it that the digital rights movement that was founded on self-determination, that Aaron was a part of, that EFF has fought over for 30 years, how is it that we have been dealt such a stinging defeat that we have come to this pass? What was our blind spot that allowed this dystopia to grow up around us? Well, it wasn't dystopianism itself, right? The blind spot was not the Pollyannish belief that if we just got everyone connected, everything else would be fine. But we did have a blind spot, and that blind spot was monopolism. Now, the early internet was very dynamic, and it was thanks in large part to anti-monopoly enforcement, primarily in the US by the Department of Justice. I want you to think about someone about my age growing up in the US with the internet. So I was born in 1971. 1977, my dad brought home a teletype terminal that was connected to the university computer. And that was a very limited use. It had a little acoustic coupler and it had a printer, but no screen. And you could, you could play with it, write some programs in basic, leave emails for other users on the system. But things only got going in 1979 when the Apple II Plus came along and with it, the early modems. Now, by 1982, the lines that you connected those modems to had been thoroughly decentralized. AT&T had been broken up by the Department of Justice, the culmination of some 70, not 70 years, 50, 60 years worth of antitrust enforcement against AT&T, where AT&T had been spared repeatedly from breakups. And finally, it had their monopoly shattered by the Department of Justice. And that had profound consequences, including making it a lot easier to get modems and plug them into the phone lines, but also uh, a, a vast lowering of long distance tariffs, which meant that people could run things like Usenet or Fidonet or early BBSs where you could dial up out of town and talk to people in other places. And then a couple of years later, 1984, maybe you'd gone out and bought your first IBM PC. Now that IBM PC came from a company that had just spent 12 years of antitrust enforcement uh, from the DOJ. And each one of those 12 years that the DOJ had been suing AT&T, AT&T had been forced to outspend the entire Department of Justice antitrust division on just the lawyers for its own case. And after 12 years, the DOJ abandoned the case against IBM. But IBM understood that there could be more on its horizon. And when they went into the uh, PC business, they decided they didn't want to invite uh, an investigation of whether they were creating a vertical monopoly. So they didn't make their own operating system. Instead, they went out to that weirdo who'd written the letter to the homebrew computer club, Bill Gates, and asked him if he could get them an operating system. So he bought an operating system someone else had written, resold it to IBM, and there we go. We, we, had, we had DOS in the PC. And then, you know, Microsoft grew and grew and grew and grew. And by the early 90s, it had 95% of the operating system market with Windows. And it was abusing that monopoly to crush new entrants to the market, particularly to try and crush the internet. So in came the DOJ again to punish Microsoft for it. And for years, they went after Microsoft. And eventually they backed down. And maybe if you were like me and in your mid-20s by then, you'd have gone, well, you can't expect the DOJ to win every time. But look, look at what did come of that. Microsoft might still be intact, 
but they're not doing to Google what they did to Netscape. And so we're getting Google now. Here we are, we're getting Google. And so if Google ever gets too big, the DOJ will take a swing at them too. That that's the way it goes, that the dynamism that allows Cray to be a giant computer brand one year, a division of Silicon Graphics the next year, and then spare parts the year after that with new architectures, new paradigms for computing springing up in the space that was left behind once this tall, ancient tree fell in the forest and left behind some open spaces in the canopy so that new green shoots could grow up. That dynamic would continue because the DOJ, they had our back. The DOJ combined with the internet could give us something that looked like the perfect market that we'd seen described in textbooks, where you could start a new business with low capital. All it took was a good idea and some code. And then you could access a global audience for your product. Everyone who might want to use it would be connected to the internet. You could find them. And if there was, uh, and, and, and there would be low switching costs to use your product. If you had a competitor that had locked its customers into some old file format or some other means of lock-in, you could just write a script that would take the files for whatever, Lotus123 and put them in Excel format, or that could uh, take old Quark Express documents and put them in PageMaker format, that we could now have a system where any two smart kids in a garage could build a company that could topple billion dollar giants, delight people all around the world by giving them new tools that radically transform their life, where the world would never be the same. What we didn't realize was that that DO Jay, that we were counting on to have our back so that we could continue to force out yesterday's giants and bring new products and new services and new companies to market, that the DOJ had been shot in the gut by Ronald Reagan and that it had been bleeding out for all of those years, reeling from case to case, doing what it could for AT&T, giving up on an IBM, trying and failing with Microsoft before collapsing in a pool of its own blood and viscera in the corner to die quietly. We didn't even notice that the DOJ was dying and that was our huge blind spot. And let's talk about who actually shot the DOJ's antitrust division in the guts. It's a guy named Robert Bork. Um, Robert Bork had been solicitor general to Richard Nixon. He was a criminal complicit in Richard Nixon's conspiracies. His criminal acts meant that he could not be confirmed by the Supreme Court, by the Senate. Uh, you may have heard the expression to be borked. That's what it means when your past bad actions catch up with you and deny you a seat on the Supreme Court. That unfortunately doesn't seem to be the fate of Supreme, potential Supreme Court jurists anymore. Um, and he pivoted from his bid for the Supreme Court to becoming a kind of powerful, powerful court sorcerer to Ronald Reagan, who had a radical new theory of how antitrust law should be enforced, or rather, why it shouldn't be enforced. So the origins of antitrust are in two 19th century laws, the, the Sherman Act and the Clayman, Clayton Act. And Bork maintained that if you read these close enough, that if you kind of parse them out like someone reading a QAnon drop or trying to figure out what was going on with the Da Vinci Codex, you know, covering up every third word and standing on one foot and, you know, finding, finding synonyms or whatever, that you would discover in the plain language of these very plain language laws that what Congress had, had intended all along was not to stop monopolies, but only to prevent consumer harm from monopolies. And by consumer harm, Robert Bork said, uh, it, it basically meant that if a company did something anti-competitive and then prices went up for its customers immediately, that was consumer harm. And if you couldn't prove that something anti-competitive would cause prices to go up straight away, it was probably fair game. And, and um, those theories were incredibly popular with rich people who understood that if they could once again go back to forming the kind of monopolies that had defined the Gilded Age, Standard Oil and, and the Carnegie fortunes and Alcoa, that um, they could uh, amass vast fortunes. And so they invested rationally in Robert Bork. They created things like summer institutes for judges where you could get an all exp expenses paid junket to get continuing education from experts who would explain to you why consumer harm was the only way that antitrust ever should be enforced. Uh, and they um, created uh, think tanks 
and funded chairs at various uh, law and economics departments at universities around the country, notably uh, George Mason. And they created over decades a consensus that crosses the aisle, that is the consensus among both Democrats and Republicans, at least in their mainstream, that the only time we should enforce antitrust law is when there's consumer harm. And since you can never prove consumer harm, that we should just stop bothering to entrust, enforce antitrust law. Um, and so consumer harm is, uh, is uh, nearly impossible to prove. And that means that antitrust conduct has become so routine that we don't even think of it as unusual. I mean, until the Bork era, the following activities were all viewed as potential major violations of antitrust law and were apt to draw scrutiny from the DOJ. Merging with a major competitor like, you know, AT&T buying or uh, T-Mobile buying Sprint. Acquiring a nascent competitor like um, Facebook buying Instagram or creating a vertical monopoly like Facebook acquiring Oculus or Google acquiring AdMob or Apple acquiring any of the 90 companies it bought in the first half of 2019. And the story of how tech became so monopolized, the story of how we got an internet, which uh, in the memorable words of Tom Eastman, a software developer from New Zealand, consists of five giant websites filled with screenshots of text from the other four, it doesn't really talk about anti-competitive conduct. The story that we tell ourselves about how we got to this monopolized place leans really heavily on these exotic phenomena like network effects, which is when, you know, if you have one fax machine, it's not worth very much, but if everyone has a fax machine and you don't, you probably have to go out and get one to talk to them too. And so once fax machines hit a critical mass, they just continue to grow under their own inertia. Um, but a close look at how tech companies actually grew, how they attain their scale, reveals that they didn't rely on network effects to get to scale. Rather, they relied on Moneyball, on anti-competitive conduct, on buying other companies and creating vertical and horizontal monopolies. Um, Google is a really good example of this. Google is a company that has made one and a half really successful products, right? They made a search engine that was great. And a lot of people have good things to say about their Hotmail clone. But every other product they created in-house failed, whether that's uh, Google uh, Orkut or Google Wave or Google Reader. And every other product that they have that's a success is a product they bought from someone else, from Google Maps to uh, YouTube to uh, their entire ad tech stack. Um, now, the other story that you may have heard is that the reason that these companies grew is because they have natural monopolies and that the natural monopolies arise from and strengthen these network effects. Now, network effects are definitely real. Uh, to see how the network effect plays out, look at the Bell system, which is what we used to call AT&T before its breakup in 1982. And the Bell system had these very powerful network effects. If you wanted to talk to someone on the phone and the Bell system wouldn't connect to them, then you had to get an account with a Bell system carrier. You couldn't get an account with your little mom and pop that just connected to the local town. And so the little mom and pop uh, telephone co-ops uh, were largely driven out of business and AT&T achieved a monopoly through its natural uh, uh, monopoly and through its network effects. Um, after all, if you're going to run these long haul, long distance lines, it just doesn't make any sense to run parallel sets of infrastructure. Once you've got that right of way, there's just going to be one set of telephone poles, you know, connecting LA and Chicago or New York and Toronto. And so those, those telephone poles, those telephone wires are going to end up belonging to someone and that company is going to have a natural monopoly. But with technology, there is something else that happens with these network effects and these natural monopolies. And it, it arises out of something called interoperability, or, or rather a very specific kind of interoperability that we at Electronic Frontier Foundation call competitive compatibility or ComCom. So interoperability is when you plug one thing into something else. You know, I, I've got a USB camera connected to my laptop here in my backyard. Um, USB is a standard. The camera interoperates with my laptop. Everything is well documented. You can write a driver for it. You can write a driver for the USB component of, of my laptop. Um, we know how all that stuff works. Uh, and that is kind of a, a cooperative form of interoperability. An organization like the W3C might sit down and standardize HTTP request formats or some other element of our technology. People conform to the standard and the stuff just works. 
But there's another kind of interoperability, this competitive compatibility, which is when you make something that connects to something else, not only without permission, but against the wishes of the people who made it. Uh, and, and you can see how uh, competitive compatibility played out in the weakening of the Bell Systems monopoly and its eventual breakout, uh, breakup rather, in looking at how the Bell System dealt with its device monopolies. So one element of the, of the Bell System was that it was illegal to connect anything to the Bell Systems network without permission from AT&T. So every phone and every phone device that existed had to be either sold or licensed or approved by AT&T. And that's why if you wanted to have a home phone, you would get that black rotary Western digital phone, all the same shape. They all, you know, very familiar form that you, you'll know if you ever had a look at it. Um, and you couldn't buy it. You had to rent it. You had to rent it every month. And even after you'd bought it a hundred times over, you still had to give AT&T a rental price for it. A little like what we see today with cable boxes from, from cable companies. And uh, uh, AT&T was part of the country's national safety system. And it took the position that if you were to connect something to its network without its permission, that you could break the network and thus endanger the very nation itself. And so it could rely on the government to enforce its whims about who could connect what to the system. But every time monopolists get this kind of right, they eventually become so odious in their conduct, so greedy and outrageous, that eventually their uh, continuing maintenance of that monopoly just becomes untenable. And with AT&T, the first crack came from a, a company called Hushaphone. And the Hushaphone was a cop that you put over your mouth like this, and it stopped people from being able to read your lips. And AT&T argued that the Hushaphone, by being mechanically coupled to one of those standard Western digital mouthpieces, was endangering the safety of the entire Bell system. And its regulators said, guys, come on, really? Like, you just bring the whole system into disrepute when you pull shenanigans like this. No, we're not going to ban the Hushaphone, and we are going to open the door for other people who want to mechanically couple things to the uh, earpiece or mouthpiece of a Bell telephone. And then a few years later, we got another case called Carterphone. Carterphone made a product for uh, mostly for ranch hands, and it was uh, a walkie-talkie radio that you could connect to your telephone jack. So it had RJ11 on one side and a walkie-talkie base on the other. And if you were out on the range when your phone rang, your walkie-talkie would beep and you could answer the phone. So it's a cordless phone. And again, AT&T argued that this was endangering the very integrity of the system. And again, their regulators said no. And a funny thing happened once AT&T lost the legal right to prevent people from connecting to this monopolistic, network-effect-driven natural monopoly, which is that the walled garden that it thought it had became a feedlot in which millions of customers had been neatly arranged to the benefit of AT&T competitors. Because after all, the thing that made Hushaphone possible was that Western Digital had put a standard shaped phone receiver in every home in America. So if you could make something that clipped on to that standard phone receiver, you had all of those customers just waiting for you. And that story of walled gardens being converted to feedlots that story plays out through the whole history of technology, and it's key to the origin stories of today's monopolists. So think of Apple. Today, we think of this as one of the most valuable companies on Earth. Depending on what, what week it is, it might be the second most valuable or the most valuable company on Earth. But um, a few years ago, Apple was on the brink of being uh, destroyed by Microsoft and its monopoly. Microsoft controlled the office environment. They controlled the office productivity suites with uh, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. And they and they alone made software for the Mac that could read and write those files. And by dragging their heels on keeping the Mac version of Office up to date, they could make having a Mac in an office environment untenable. You know, I was a network administrator in those days, and I remember being in office environments where everyone used a PC except for the one designer. And if you gave that one designer a Word file and they opened it up in Word for Mac and then saved it again, it would be permanently unreadable by every version of Word in the office. And, you know, Microsoft can make high-quality, reliable software when they want to. 
So either they didn't want to or they didn't care to. Apple did not beg Microsoft to improve the quality of its Mac productivity suite. Instead, Apple reverse engineered those file formats and they created the iWork suite with Keynote and Numbers and Pages and those read and write PowerPoint and Excel and Word files, as well as saving out in their own proprietary formats. And by doing so, Apple was able to produce documents that every Microsoft customer in the world could read and alter and communicate with, right? So all of those customers became part of my, Apple's uh, strength, not a weakness that it had to overcome. Likewise, there was a time when Lexmark was a division of IBM making the laser printers for IBM. And um, they charged an awful lot of money for their toner, uh, the uh, powdered carbon in their cartridges. And the way that they stopped people from replacing that powdered carbon with powdered carbon of their own devising when it ran out was by having a little security chip. And there was a competitor of theirs, a tiny Taiwanese company called Static Controls. And Static figured out how to reverse engineer that security chip that tried to lock out refilled cartridges. The security chip only accepted programs of 12 bytes or fewer. So it wasn't hard for them to reverse engineer that program. Today, after Lexmark lost their bid to sue Static Controls and force them to stop doing it, today, Lexmark and Static Controls are divisions of the same company. And Lexmark is no longer part of IBM. Because once the, it was a fair game to make your own toner for IBM printers, Lexmark could treat all of those IBM customers not as being on the other side of a walled garden, but rather being neatly arrayed before them and available to them to undercut IBM. And then finally, Facebook. You know, when Facebook started, it had a really serious problem because everyone who liked social media and knew how to use it was already using a rival network called MySpace. And MySpace was owned by one of the world's most rapacious, ruthless billionaires, a guy named Rupert Murdoch, a guy who did not give in easy, a guy who knew how to fight dirty. And he wasn't gonna make it easy for MySpace users to leave and go to Facebook. Facebook had inarguably better software, but MySpace had all the users. And you know, hanging around in, on Facebook with its better tools and no one to talk to was no fun. Facebook did not coordinate everyone on MySpace to have a let's quit MySpace day the way, you know, Sean Hannity is trying to do with Twitter and saying, you know, on Wednesday, everybody goes to parlor. Instead, he just made a bot that would log into MySpace scrape your waiting, waiting MySpace messages from your inbox, put them in your Facebook inbox, let you reply to them there and push them back out to MySpace so that you could have Facebook's interface and MySpace's community. Um, but monopolies can foreclose on competitive com uh, compatibility. And every one of these companies that has benefited from competitive compatibility has sought to kick the ladder away once they got into the top by increasing the scope of software patents, software copyrights, using uh, uh, elements of copyright like anti-circumvention as we see being used against YouTube DL these days, uh, trying to argue that terms of service are enforceable. And we've talked about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and Aaron and the way that it was abused to, to um, threaten him with, with uh, 13 felonies for violating terms of service. And, and of course, they're always thinking up new ways to block competitive compatibility. The Supreme Court just heard Oracle v. Google, the case about whether API should be copyrightable, which, you know, obviously they shouldn't. And um, it, all of these things, they fall under a single umbrella. They're, they're most commonly called intellectual property. And if you're a free software advocate or a free culture advocate, and there's a pretty good chance you are if you're tuned into this, you probably just got an all over body shiver and the hair on the back of your neck stood up when I said intellectual property, because we are trained to hate the term intellectual property as being rhetorically dishonest and nonspecific. Um, we are told that we, if we have to discuss patents and trademarks and copyrights in the same breath, that we should use the old term the author's monopoly, the term that we used before intellectual property came into vogue. But as all of the above shows us, intellectual property actually does have a precise meaning, a meaning that is not rhetorically dishonest, a meaning that is absolutely plain. Intellectual property means the power to control company, uh, competitors, customers, and critics. Right? That's what we mean when we say intellectual property. We, we mean there is a regulation a law or a rule 
that allows me to reach out from beyond the boundaries of my firm or home and reach into the home or firm of someone else and tell them what they can do. Sorry, there's a very loud motorcycle going by. If you own a loud motorcycle, shame on you. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the people who are accused of having authors monopolies, that is authors, uh, often counter that having an author's monopoly does not give them this power. Uh, the fact that I, I wrote novels doesn't let me tell my publisher how much they have to pay me for them. All it does is let me walk away if my publisher doesn't want to give me as much money as I think I deserve. And with only five publishers out there in the world, that's very little power indeed. I mean, sure, I have an author's monopoly in the sense that I'm the only person who's allowed to sell my books, but it's not a monopoly in the way that, say, Facebook or Google have a monopoly. It doesn't confer any market power upon us. But there is a way in which author's monopolies can confer monopoly power. And that is that when you have a market power monopoly, right, if you are Google or if you are Apple or if you are Amazon or if you are Bertelsmann or if you are Disney or if you are Time Warner AT&T and you have some authors monopolies as well, software copyrights, copyrights over creative works, copyrights over firmware, that what you get is a special kind of market power monopoly, one that is especially durable because of the hybrid vigor of market power monopolies when they are crossed with authors' monopolies. So if you have a normal monopoly, right, if you are AT&T, if you are uh, Standard Oil, then people can sue you for having a monopoly and take you to court. Now, it's been hard to do that over the last 40 years, but, but you know, there still are things that you can't do because if you did them, you might end up in court and it would go badly for you. It could be at the very least distracting, and at the very worst, it could actually end up in your ruination. But if you have author's monopolies that you can use to fortify your market power monopoly, then anyone who tries to do something to break your monopoly is subject to enforcement by you. In other words, the government won't punish you for having a monopoly. They will punish other people for trying to break your monopoly. Like, if you just try to reverse engineer the app store and make your own app store and uh, release a jailbreak for the iPhone that allows people to plug in their own apps to their iPhone, Apple can sue you. In fact, Apple can seek criminal charges against you for violating Section 1201 of the Digital Money and Copyright Act. If you want to sample music, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to have to enter into a license with Universal Music Group. Uh, Universal Music Group controls uh, more than half the music in the world. And UMG generally only does deals with people who are assigned to one of the other two major record labels or preferentially that are assigned to itself. And when you do a deal with, with Universal, you have to sign away your copyright to them. And so the copyright that you sign over to them in order to access their catalog uh, becomes part of a catalog that now someone else has to sign over their music to in order to get access to your music and sample your music. And if you sidestep step this, and you just make your own music, Universal can sue you, they can have you kicked off all of the online platforms, they can censor you, they can shut you down. And so authors' monopolies, when they're fused with market power monopolies, become very powerful indeed. Um, and uh, monopolies um, can be used not just to shut down competitors and not just to tell customers what they must do, but it can also be used to shut down critics. And this is a place that's very central to Aaron's story because, of course, Aaron did things like scrape large databases of academic articles to criticize bias in academic publishing. Um, you know, more uh, uh, saliently and more recently, we often see security researchers who uh, have to bypass DRM in order to demonstrate defects in systems who, because they bypass DRM, face retaliation from companies for pointing out that their products are defective. Uh, and, and so companies become custodians of who gets to criticize them. Or, you know, think about what Facebook is doing with Ad Observer, which is a plugin that you can stick in your browser that scrapes all the ads that Facebook shows you so that accountability journalists and researchers can document the ways that Facebook is failing to live up to its own promises to block paid disinformation. And Apple is saying that, or uh, Facebook is saying that by violating their terms of service, Ad observers violating the law, and they've given them till the end of this month 
to shut down Ad Observer, which is a nonprofit project of the New York University Engineering School. Or even think of what um, Goldman Sachs has done. They've released a font called Goldman Sands. It's their logo font. And anyone can download it for free and use it for any purpose and reproduce it infinitely. The one thing that you're not allowed to do is violate the non-disparagement clause that's in the license for your software. The non-disparagement, or for your font rather, the non-disparagement clause says that you won't criticize or make fun of uh, Goldman Sachs. So they don't need copyright to stop people from making copies. Uh, they don't want to stop people from making copies. They want their font spread as far as possible. They need copyright to allow them to decide who can criticize them. And so that's what I mean when I say that IP is a rule that allows you to control your competitors, your critics, or your customers, and that IP, when combined with market power, creates sturdy monopolies. Now, at the start of this talk, I said that the people who got involved with technology, at least in the early days, were not motivated by money. They were motivated by passion. Uh, and that um, the people who got involved were not blind to the peril of technology. But, uh, you know, I think that that overstates it a little. There certainly were people who were a little blind to the power of technology, and they were deliberately blind to the power of technology to harm people because they were excited about how much money they could make. When the first tech bubble started kicking off, people talked themselves into believing that it would be okay to do something just a little rotten if they knew that they could get a massive upside later on and maybe they could become a philanthropist in their second act. I mean, I think this is probably the Bill Gates story. Um, uh, you know, the myth of, of two guys in a garage who could grow up to topple billion dollar giants sidelined a lot of people's consciences. But I think those days are behind us. You know, the, the days in which you could start a company that went head to head with the giants of the day, get funding from venture capitalists who wanted to uh, see you grow and take apart and eat their lunch, those days are largely past us. Uh, today, venture capitalists call all the lines of business that tech monopolists are in and all the lines of business that are adjacent to those lines of business, they call them the kill zone. And they won't fund companies that compete in those areas, despite the fact that those areas are exper experiencing double digit year on year growth and billions and billions of dollars a year in profits every single year. So instead of dreaming of becoming a billionaire, making a dent in the world, toppling a billionaire, becoming a giant, the most that most techies dream of these days is having a really well-funded 401k, being able to get kombucha on tap in the company kitchen, and getting free massages on Wednesdays. And it's a lot harder to talk your conscience into doing the wrong thing when that's the upside of it. And, you know, as technology firms have monopolized and as they have been liberated from the fear of customers defecting to a competitor, they have pivoted to a new kind of business, a business grounded in manipulating us, locking us in, and abusing us. And all of that manipulation, all that lock-in, all that abuse is carried out by technologists. You know, it's not the bosses that write the code, it's the techies that write the code. And those techies, they came to the field. They discovered their passion when they learned that you could express your will with precision to a computer and it would do exactly what you told it to perfectly and forever. They learned that you could take the tools you made and project your will around the world by helping anyone who needed the same tool to do the same thing and sharing your code with them. They became passionate about computers when they found communities around the world that could say the things they had the no name for and join them. And these technologists who came to the field whose passion arose from this self-determination, this giddy feeling that they got. Now they work every hour that God sends, making sure that no one else ever gets to experience that freedom. And I think this is an important fracture line. I think that if we wanna understand the Googler walkout, 20,000 Googlers walking off the job, tech won't build it, tech solidarity, no tech for ice, all of these movements arising, as well as the labor unions springing up within tech companies that you, we should look to this, right? We should look to this, this shift in what people think they can get for failing to live up to their morals. Because it's one thing to be a sellout. It's another thing to be a sellout on the cheap. And so I think we're maybe at a turning point. 
Now, the title of this talk is Early Onset Oppenheimers. And you know, um, the uh, Robert Oppenheimer led the Manhattan Project. And he was a brilliant physicist, but there were a lot of brilliant physicists at that time. And he was a brilliant manager, and there were obviously a lot of brilliant managers at that time too. But what there weren't were a lot of brilliant physicists who were also brilliant leaders, brilliant managers. Without Oppenheimer, they may have never built the bomb, at least not the way that it got built here. And when the bomb went off, the first nuclear test in Los Alamos, Robert Oppenheimer turned away from the mushroom cloud and he quoted the Bhagavad Gita. He said, I have become death destroyer of worlds. And he spent the rest of his life regretting what he had done for his bosses. Uh, the president of the United States called him into his office to congratulate him. And instead of accepting the congratulations, Oppenheimer said, Mr. President, I have blood on my hands. The president threw him out of the Oval Office and told his aide, I never want to see that son of a bitch in here again. What if we could have some early onset Oppenheimers, right? What if we could have people who down tools, not after they had a rude awakening, looked in the mirror, didn't like what they saw and decided that they would work to undo the bad work that they'd done, but people who just refused to do the bad work in the first place. You know, Aaron helped me write this series of books, the Little Brother books. Um, he was very helpful in the second one, Homeland, and he wrote an afterword for it, but he also just devised a major plot point for it. And those books inspired a lot of technologists. I've heard from a lot of cyber lawyers, technologists, security researchers, activists, who say that the reason they got involved with what their life's work was because Little Brother excited in them a passion for the possibility of technology to set us free and terrified them with the way that technology could be abused to enslave us. And the combination of those two motivated their life's work. And I've just written a third book, Attack Surface, that is very much a kind of book for this moment. And it's a book about someone who has lived their life working for the other side, building surveillance technology, who decides to pull back from the brink. And I think that's something that we're seeing more of today and not just in technology, because under conditions of monopoly, every firm is in some sense engaged in the destruction of its customers. Because if you don't have to worry about your customers going to a rival, you can extract higher rents from them and from your employees by abusing them. And I think a lot of us go to work every day hoping that we'll make people's lives better, but knowing that we're in some way making people live, people's lives worse. And the question of getting technologists to become early onset Oppenheimers has become especially urgent over the last few years with the rise of embedded systems and the so-called Internet of Things. Because with the Internet of Things, we get IP in everything. IP in the sense of the right to control your competitors, your critics and your customers in toasters and in insulin pumps and in tractors and in thermostats and in every kind of device. And uh, not only are these devices designed in a way that empowers the, the manufacturer to control their critics and their customers and their, and their uh, competitors, but they're also designed to spy on everyone who uses them, to rat them out should they have the uh, lack of loyalty to the manufacturer, to dare to arrange their affairs in ways that don't suit the manufacturer's shareholders and instead benefit themselves, to sound the alarm, to watch with the monotonic unblinking eye that is software code running in an infinite loop and never taking its vigilance away. So. I want to close by talking about another friend of Aaron's and mine, uh, a, a cyber lawyer and copyright specialist named James Boyle at Duke University. And Jamie tells this story about the ecology movement and about how before the term ecology was founded, what that movement consisted of was just issues. Some people cared about whales and some people cared about owls. Some people cared about the ozone layer. They didn't necessarily understand that they were all fighting the same fight. They thought of what they were doing as being lots of different fights. And the person over there working on the owls, they were a good egg and all, so to speak. But 
they had nothing to do with whales. What do owls have to do with whales? The term ecology turned a thousand issues into one movement with a thousand ways to get involved. And today the question of monopoly is so present in so many domains. Monopolists have destroyed eyewear, accounting, logistics, oil, uh, automotive, repair, mobile devices, the web, beer, professional wrestling, every field. In every field of human endeavor, there are people suffering at the hands of a monopoly. And you may think that you're upset because professional wrestlers are dying in their 50s and begging on GoFundMe for money to pay their medical bills because Vince McMahon has reclassified them as a uh, uh, independent contractors and taken their insurance away. You may think that you're upset because your favorite wrestler tweeted that she supported a union and got kicked off of uh, WWE the next day. But what you really are angry about is a monopoly. In the same way that if you, really, if you think you care about owls, what you really care about is the ecology. And we have this moment now where these IP monopolies, these tech monopolies are metastasizing into every domain, but in which every domain is becoming monopolized to begin with from poultry farming to agribusiness. And we have this moment now where we can use our digital tools to organize people to fight monopolies, including monopolies over our digital tools. And I can't think of anything that would be more suitable to Aaron's legacy than to use digital tools to make the digital world and thus the whole world a freer place. Thank you. Hey, Lisa, thanks. are you there? You are, good. I didn't, I'm always worried yeah, that maybe cool. I, dro I dropped off halfway there. No, 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 I'm definitely here, definitely here. Good. Um, and I just wanna check, um, to see if there's any specific questions. I wanna know, I was making notes as you were talking. Um, I what was the plot point that Aaron suggested? Oh, in uh, yeah, was this for Homeland? That for Homeland. Was yeah, Aaron basically yeah. invented Cambridge Analytica for Homeland. Uh, so uh, you know, Homeland turns on this um, insurgent election campaign for the California State Senate by a, a, a grass a, like a populist San Francisco candidate. And I wrote, I called up a bunch of people like democratic strategists who'd worked on like, um, you know, the, the Dean campaign and stuff and all these Netroots people and said like, if someone gave you a blank check and the unlimited power to run a campaign however you want, what would you do? And they all just had these like super boring ideas. So then I sent Aaron an email, like, like a two sentence email. And half an hour later, he fired me back like a shovel ready plan for using social media and A-B testing to create like a, a kind of viral net roots that could tune messages and, t and micro target them. It was basically Cambridge Analytica. Uh, and you know, it was Cambridge Analytica for good, but it was still Cambridge Analytica. And he like, I just pasted it in. Like I corrected like six typos and pasted it straight into the book as dialogue. It was pretty great. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. Um, and it, that's a, it's funny too that you should say that because um, after I saw the great hack, mm -hmm. learned really the background of Cambridge Analytica, um, I was joking around with Ryan Sternlich, who's, who's going to um, present later today. But we were like, hey, I, I don't know about you, but I got to buy more Facebook ads. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, but that's the thing is I think that like it's I actually think that the whole Facebook Cambridge Analytica thing is just a giant grift because, you know, Facebook obviously has like a vested interest in making people think that its ads work really well. And Cambridge Analytica has a vested interest in making people think that they've got a mind control ray. And, and I think that like targeting is super useful because it's targeting, not because it lets you trick people, right? Like targeting is useful if you're like, I've identified an issue that mobilizes voters uh, like student debt, and I want to show ads about student debt to people who have student debt. Like that is just better targeting. It's not mind control, right? right. Um, but the way that Facebook tells it, it's like, you know, we created this mind control ray to sell you fidget spinners. And then the way Cambridge Analytica tells it, it's like, yeah, and Robert Mercer stole it and made your uncle racist and we can do it for anyone. And I, I just think that they're so grossly overstating what is a, you know, ultimately banal, if, you know, significant 
thing, which is which is knowing that if you have a message about student debt, it, it serves you your interests to reach people who have student debt, you know? Right, right. And and again, um, it's there's nothing inherently evil about getting a message out to people that might be receptive to it. Uh, that's just good tech, right? The the evil part is when now it's a an untrue message positioned sure. in such a way to um, trick people into passing on a message that is not uh, you know is not truthful. It doesn't even have to be untruthful though. It could it could also be just saying the quiet part aloud. So you know the the like vote for me. I'm a Nazi will not get you elected by most people. But there are some people who are like, God, I've been waiting all my life for someone to come along and say, vote for me, I'm a Nazi. I haven't voted in any elections. Now I know there's a Nazi running. I'll vote for him, right? right. The thing that targeting gets you is the ability to tell some people you're a Nazi without putting it on a billboard. And if you target well enough, maybe none of those people that you said, hey, I'm a Nazi, will go out and say, will, will go out and blow the whistle on you. This is why Ad Observer is so important, because Ad Observer lets us find out what what advertisers say when they think no one's listening, right? And so it lets us find the disparities in the way that they talk about themselves, the the way they they talk about themselves when they think there's nobody here but us chickens. So uh, tell us a little bit about what Ad Observer is, because I'm not even sure I know yeah. what you're talking about. So it started actually at ProPublica, but it's moved to NYU. Uh, and it is a two-part system. Ad Observer is a browser plugin, and Ad Observatory is the repository. And the way that Ad Observer works is, if you're a Facebook user, you can run it, and every time you see an ad, it scrapes the ad and sends it to Ad Observatory. And then Ad Observatory is used by researchers and accountability journalists to discover instances in which Facebook is not enforcing its own policies on paid disinformation, fraud, uh, you know, moderation standards, and whatever. Um, and uh, all it grabs is the ad. It doesn't grab any of the context. It doesn't grab any of your friends' reactions to it. It just grabs the ad and sends it off. And we know that it does that. It's you know free software. You can audit the code. You can run little snitch or whatever. You can see the packets as they leave your computer. Like it, it is 100% the case that all that they're getting are ads. Facebook has sent a cease and desist and it told them that if they're not down by the 30th, they're going to sue them, probably under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And they say they have to do this to defend their users' privacy. Uh, and, you know, this, this idea that Facebook defends your privacy by taking away your right to know when it's failing to defend you from disinformation is crazy. <laughs> and, you know, if, when people raise this to Facebook, they say, oh, well, we have our own ad observatory where you can go and look at all the ads that we've identified and you can see what kind of ads we have. And the people from Ad Observatory say, yeah, the whole point is we find all the ads that you don't stick in that Ad Observatory. And most of them look pretty bad for you because you are not catching a bunch of ads that violate your own policies and sticking them in your public transparency repository. And so like, this is how we're holding you to account. And you know, it remains to be seen what's gonna happen. Um, but you know, that November the, third, the users themselves are sending the information. Oh yeah, to to, to yeah. yeah, and so Facebook, and Facebook they're getting information at the, that is in violation of the user's privacy is 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 yeah. we're backwards land, right? But what Facebook says is that like, well, you could in theory, if your friends liked an ad, you could grab that too. Although the plugin doesn't. Uh, and it does, you know, it does bring up this like complicated nature of information and, you know, apropos the Prop 24 and uh, pay for privacy and, um, you know, data monetization, data co-ops and so on. The thing about data that's hard is um, it doesn't have clear owners. You know, um, if you have, uh, if, if your mother is your mother and you are her daughter, who owns that fact? You or your mother? Right? What if you want to sell that fact to a data brokerage, but your mother doesn't? Does your mother get to stop you? What if the fact that you want to sell to a data brokerage is, and I know this isn't true because I know your mother, but that your mother is abusive, right? So does your mother get to say, well, that fact belongs to me. The fact that I was abusive to my daughter belongs to me, so she can't make that piece of data public, right? That blended nature of data makes data really bad for ownership models to begin with. And so, you know, Facebook's argument is 
that if you uh, if if your friend tells you something about an ad that they see that they like it, that you telling someone else that your friend likes that ad violates their privacy. And you know it, that tension is irreconcilable in a framework of property of saying, well, that fact belongs to me or that fact belongs to them. And instead, what we end up getting is something that Ed Felton described many years ago, something that looks a lot more like an interest-based framework. So if you think about um, human beings, human beings aren't described as property except insofar as some people are monsters who call other people property. But human beings are, are a thing that is valuable because they are not property, right? It is, it's like the reason human beings can't be property is they're more valuable than property. And so, you know, I have a daughter. That daughter is not my property nor is she her own property, right? Because she can't sell her organs. But I have an interest in her and she has an interest in herself. And my wife, who is her mother, has an interest in her. The community has an interest in her, ex expressed through things like child protective services. Her school has an interest in her. That interest is kind of blended across multiple people and contesting those interests requires special procedures that look nothing like the way that we resolve property conflicts. And so, you know, it, that this whole Facebook, we're protecting your privacy thing is just, it's like on the one hand, obviously bullshit, but it does raise this interesting problem, right? Which is who owns the fact that you saw an ad, right? I, I mean, the next thing we'll, we, we'll see, I guess, is Facebook saying, well, you're violating Facebook's privacy because Facebook showed you that ad, right? Like, how dare you tell other people Facebook showed you that ad? You're violating my privacy as Facebook, the corporate person, right? So like we, um, it's the wrong framework to think about this through. Um, hey, we have a couple questions that I want sure. to ask you before we let you go. Okay. Um, so one person's asking, um, and I'm not sure I understand the question entirely, but maybe you will. But there's, they're asking about what your feelings are uh, about the role of story in advancing your monopoly paradigm and why often in the world of story and in popular imagination, tech people are so often portrayed as unmoved by morality. Yeah, I mean, obviously narrative is a really important piece of, of how we, um, you know, we get to change, right? Um, you know, the, the, uh, Milton Friedman used to talk about ideas lying around, right? That the story that he had about the market, which I think is the wrong story, about the the market being optimal when people were selfish and so on that although it was an unpopular idea at the time that if you told the story often enough and well enough and dramatized it through things like ayn rand novels that when a crisis arose people might turn to the story you know daniel dennett calls um stories intuition pumps he says that there are ways that we rehearse things that might happen in the future so that when those things come to pass we don't have to think of a response under a moment of stress. We can just grab that rehearsed response and use it. And so I think, you know, telling the story of where monopolies came from and how they aren't inevitable and how we can change them. Because I think the other thing that we have that, that we're told about monopolies is that they're eternal, that they arise naturally, that they are natural monopolies and that they can't be broken up. You know, yesterday I had a conversation with a, with a um, person who worked at a, as, at a sister organization or an organization engaged in similar work to EFF about all of this. And they said, well, but isn't it cyclic? You know, we broke up AT&T and then they reformed, you know, it just comes in cycles. And I'm like, that's not what happened with AT&T. What happened with AT&T is we broke them up and we stopped enforcing antitrust law. That that was the last, the, the last hurrah of antitrust law. And so when they did things that would have been illegal before, we let them get away with it. But that wasn't because we were in a cycle. It was because that was the that was the last thing we did with antitrust law. You know, the companies we broke Standard Oil into are still mostly separate companies um, because, you know, the, all of those companies became more profitable as standalones than they were when they were all uh, merged together. It, 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 monopolies are super inefficient. They extract monopoly rents for themselves, but they shrink their sectors. And in terms of why technologists are portrayed as not being engaged with the um, with the morality of their actions, I think that what that is 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 people being portrayed as as being passionate about their the instrumentality, 
and not the uh, not the eventual outcome. And I don't think it's unique to technologists. You know, if you know that old movie Amadeus about Mozart, he's portrayed much like a mad scientist, right? Someone who's in the grips of a grand passion, who has a vision to do something extraordinary and doesn't really think about who he hurts on the way. And so I think that like the mad scientist slash, you know, you were so busy asking yourself whether you could do it that you never stopped to ask yourself whether you should do it is in part driven by not a tale of technologists per se, but a tale of passion, passion unbridled. You know, that's Victor Frankenstein. Um, and, and I think that the other piece of that is that technology's story about itself is so much about unitary genius, right? Like the, the Silicon Valley story is so much about like the, the brilliant founder who does a thing that no one else could do, you know, that sort of Elon Musk template where you style yourself as a kind of cartoon character uh, of, of, you know, surpassing genius, um, that that uh, creates this uh, idea that the only way to build technology is to be a driven genius, right? To be Elizabeth Holmes. Uh, and, you know, another word for that is sociopath. Right, and so like we we have lionized sociopathy in our leaders for so long that if you want to shorthand the kind of leader we have in this industry, you just create a sociopath, a person in a black turtleneck who shouts a lot, has a steely gaze, kind of weird voice, uh, you know, and uh, doesn't care who they trample on the way while they're trying to do their thing, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, <clears throat> I think also that um, it's interesting if you if somebody has a big idea about some kind of you know social reconstruction or some kind of um, cultural civil engineering, and you bring up the ethics first, it can often kill the whole conversation. Yes, that too. Yeah. It will kill their enthusiasm. Yeah. Which I mean, I don't mind. I'm just saying it's really interesting how this has been seen for so many years as an afterthought instead of mm -hmm. something that should be taken in, you know, into account. And I just, I love the Oppenheimer metaphor because people can understand that right away. You know, in turn, a lot of technologists are being asked to write things for ICE. You know, ICE is doing questionable things at the border. You could really compare the concentration camp things and companies working yep. with, like IBM working with the Nazis, you know, in World War II. And um, people need to be able to, um, politely back away f from these from these projects, whether or not they want to go a step further and and safely in some way, because you can't just take your company documents and send them to somebody on Secure Drop, because we we you know there are ways where that can be traced back to you, and so you have to really take your time and think about what you want to do when this happens. But it is something to think about ahead of time, maybe what you would do, um, yeah. and that's new. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that rehearsal, right? That intuition pump. What would I do if I were called upon to do something bad? I mean, you know, one of the things I've been beating the drum for for a few years now is the idea of a Ulysses pact, you know, which is when you take some step while you are strong to guard against a future moment in which you are weak. So Ulysses, when he knew that he would be tempted to jump into the sea when the sirens began singing, asked his sailors to lash him to the mast. When you go on a diet, you throw out all the Oreos. If you start your company with an irrevocable free software license, your investors can never make you turn that software proprietary again because the license can't be revoked. And so those Ulysses packs, you know, are, are a way to guard yourself against yourself in some future moment. Right, right, definitely. Um, and um, yeah, and I think the licensing is a, is a great example too of how a lot of startups start up talking a lot of open source and then when it's time to actually license things they don't quite want to take that yep. step and it really means nothing until they do so one last yep. question and then we'll let you go um sure. the person is asking because i i get this a lot from people when i'm talking to them about the work we do in the uh aaron Swartzay police surveillance project especially at this point when there is so much surveillance you literally cannot leave the house without being picked up on cameras um, and yep. uh, you know everything is being tracked and that kind of thing. Um, what do you, what can you tell people when, I just want to get the exact language here, so it can feel like the choice is between being a, uh, a part of society, yet while you're being spied on by the huge tech companies, 
or socially isolating yourself. And we're all feeling enough isolation right now yep. with the pandemic, but at some point we want to be able to go back out. And how do we reconcile these issues in going about our business? Um, I, I literally put it in the back of my mind. I, I, I call it like a self-imposed, it's like a self-imposed um, 1984 almost in the sense that I just will put it out of my mind while I've decided to have fun that night, uh, you know, kind of thing. Yet I don't do proactive social media posting, for instance, saying where I'm yeah. going to be. I only talk about where I've been for safety issues. And so there's, there's techniques like that that we can do. But what do you tell somebody um, that just says, you know, well, you're no fun. I have to be able to live my life. And um, how can I do that in such a way that is is safe? Yeah, so one of the features of the of the erosion of anti-monopoly law comes as part of a larger neoliberal project. And the neoliberal project reframed citizens as consumers, right? And when you're a consumer, the way that you can interact with products and services is to buy them or not buy them, but not to demand more of them, right? The way you demand more of them is by taking your business elsewhere. But when you're a citizen, you get to demand more of them as a matter of law, right? You get to say like, I want to be able to leave my house without being surveilled. I want to be able to use big tech without being surveilled. I want to, you know, I, I, I don't want to have to subject myself to harassment to be in the com public conversation. And I think that, you know, the cypherpunks had this vision of building like a parallel cryptographically secured stable demimond that could live inside of an illegitimate oppressive state, but which the state could not penetrate because of its cryptographic security. And that I think was always a, 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 a busted idea because your key length doesn't matter when you're being subjected to rubber hose cryptanalysis. That's when the police take you to the police station and tie you to a chair and hit you with a rubber hose until you tell them what your passphrase is. The only thing that defends you against that is a legitimate responsive state. And so the role of these tools, the role of these systems is to organize for a better, more responsive state. And if you find yourself confronted by the limits of your purchasing decisions, right? By how much social change you can enact when you conceive of yourself as an ambulatory wallet, try reconceiving yourself as a citizen. And that's some of the most important work EFF does. Not organizing boycotts or telling people what products to buy, but rather asking attorneys general, asking, uh, 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 lawyers who do class action, asking uh, 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 courts uh, and asking lawmakers to take action to rein in the worst conduct of these firms, right? Not to, not to let the market decide wh what you're going to do in a monopoly, right? Shopping your way out of monopolies is like recycling your way out of climate change. It's, it's never going to happen. Instead, we make demands on them as part of a polity not as part of a group of consumers. And I, I think that unless we start reconceiving of ourselves as, as citizens, then we're doomed, right? I mean, not just on tech, but on, you know, climate change, right? Like, uh, you know, buy as many electric cars as you want, get rid of your gas guzzlers, take the subway, recycle as diligently as you can. You should do all of that in the same way that you should use ED encryption and, and, try to, you know, keep your comms on the Fediverse and all the rest of it. But until we get systemic change, um, we're not going to be able to uh, enact a program that really makes a difference. And what all of that stuff does is it makes the case for systemic change, right? It, it signals not to businesses, but to lawmakers and the state itself, that this is a priority of the polity and that it should be on the ballot and it should be on the agenda. Uh, and that is how we get to the point where we will make real enduring change. And in the meantime, you know what, if you have to be in touch with your friends, be in touch with your friends, right? Uh, it, we are very isolated right now. I'm a Zucker vegan. I don't use any Facebook products, but I still use Twitter. And, you know, I don't use Gmail, but like everybody I correspond with uses Gmail. So a copy of every message I send is sitting on Gmail and a copy of every message sent to me is sitting on Gmail. So, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you know, Zephyr Teachout says in, in her book on monopolies, break them up, like fighting monopolies 
is going to require making protest signs. And if the only way to get poster board and markers for your protest signs is on Amazon, get them on Amazon, right? And then make a protest sign and carry it down to City Hall and demand an end to monopolies. Because it's, this is not about purchase decisions, it's about our polity. Okay, I, that's great. I feel better about that. <laughs> ah. Especially since the pandemic, uh, you know, there, it's, it's, it's hard, to, hard to get things. Um, yeah, but, it sure is. Uh, but I, one last specific question, because it was such a specific thing, I don't think it'll take very long. Someone is asking you if you could comment on Mac OS Big Sur privacy and the fact that Little Snitch no longer works on it. Yeah, I'm just writing a column about that. Um, that was what I was doing when you called me to ask why I wasn't in the Jitsi call yet. Uh, so Bruce Schneier talks about the feudal mode of security, F-E-U-D-A-L, not F-U-T-I-L-E. Um, and the feudal mode of security says that cyberspace is full of bandits who want to like kill you and take your stuff. And you cannot defend yourself against them because we are just not equipped to do it. And so all we can do to defend ourselves is find a warlord and move into their castle. And the castles are, are Castle Apple, Cap Castle Google, Castle Facebook, and so on. And Apple's uh, telemetry stuff, the, the thing that they're doing now, is in service to, to stopping malware. And that is great. We definitely need our malware stopped. Um, and so Apple uses this as a kind of early warning system to find malware and also as an interdiction system to block Macs from running malware once, once it's been identified. You know, that sounds great, but it's only great if you trust Apple. And the one thing that a warlord will not defend you against is themselves. And so Apple has a similar facility in iOS. They won't let you sideload apps. And so what that means is that if Apple bans an app, you can't run it on your iPhone, at least to a first approximation. And um, that is uh, good to the extent that Apple blocks malicious apps. It's less good to the extent that Apple blocks apps that uh, compete with its services because it doesn't want to have to compete. Um, and it's especially not good when Apple blocks apps because it wants to remain on good terms with the Chinese government who ordered it to remove all of its VPNs. Uh, all the working VPNs and just have backdoored ones at the same time as the Chinese government was rounding up a million Uyghurs and other uh, uh, Turkic Muslims in Xinjiang province and putting them in concentration camps where forced rape and uh, or forced labor, rather punitive rape and uh, torture were practiced. And um, that's the problem with the feudal security system is that if the feudal lord doesn't... Uh, have the same interests as you, if the feudal lord decides to attack you, then you're not protected by their castle, you're trapped in their castle. And uh, Apple has shown that when the chips are down, when it's a choice between accessing its manufacturing facilities in the, in, um, the Pearl River Delta in, Kent, in, in, Shen, in um, Shenzhen and, and Guangzhou and uh, protecting its users in China, it will take its own future over those users' physical safety. And one of the things that having the ability that this ComCom ability, this ability to modify systems gets you, is it makes it less likely that Apple will ever be put in that position. I mean, imagine if sideloading was turned on by default in iOS. When a... Um, when the Chinese government came along and said, you have to remove all the working VPNs from your app store, Apple could say, well, yes, we will do that straight away because we're law abiding, uh, you know, Chinese subsidiary of this American company. However, you need to understand that everyone you want to spy on is immediately going to go out and download a VPN that does work and sideload it on their iPhone. And it won't take too many rounds of that before the Chinese government just says, yeah, I, I, I guess we're just not going to order you to do that because it doesn't get us anything anymore. And so, you know, this is a Ulysses pact of its own. If Apple wants to be defended from a future instance in which a government orders it to do something that harms its users, it should give the users the facility to defend themselves against bad Apple, 
against an apple that that is acting against its interests because then there is a lower likelihood that states will act it to act that way and if they do there is a mechanism by which its most vulnerable users can escape the consequences of that order so it, it's it's defense in depth it reduces the likelihood of being attacked and it also gives your users recourse in the event that you are attacked okay great all right thank you so much corey those thanks lisa I really appreciate it and um, uh, good luck with everything and the new book yeah. is awesome and um, we'll talk Thank to you, you soon. Thanks a lot for coming by. And thanks for keeping the flame alive on, on Aaron Swartz Day. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Yeah. All right. Bye. Oops. One thing that I want to bring up just because Corey was talking about the um, uh, concentration camps in China. We've got our concentration camps here. And um, one of the things that I want to bring up in the weekly meetings will be this week in concentration camps where we will discuss what's going on. <clears throat> Sorry. It's a little hard for me to, uh, to take in still. Um, all the concentration camp activity that's going on uh, and and all over the world. So anyway, I don't have any idea what exactly to do. I know here in the United States, supposedly with Biden and, and Kamala Harris coming in, we need to close the camps. So that would, that part is pretty straightforward. And we will put pressure on them to close the camps. And basically day one in the White House, they can close the camps. And that part is uh, more straightforward. And either they do close the camps or they haven't stated, they haven't gone by what they said they would do when they got elected. So we can do that. But for concentration camps on the other side of the world in China, for a government that is much harder to put pressure on, what do we do? And um, I don't have a good, a good answer for that, but I am ready to start talking about it every week and to make it one of the priorities of the meetings that we have. So I wanted to make sure that I had announced that. Okay, next we are gonna have Mikhail E, who is the lead programmer for Secure Drop, and they are gonna give us a presentation on the state of the drop. And, oh great, here's Mikhail right now, and take it away, Mikhail. Thanks, Lisa. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to try sharing my screen. Hopefully it's going to work. Uh, Lisa, can you? Yeah, I think you can see the screen, right? Looks. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Mikhail. I'm a security engineer at Freedom of the Press Foundation, where I also lead the Secure Drop project. Uh, one of Aaron's last projects was a tool to allow sources to submit documents securely and anonymously to news organization. It was initially named Dead Drop. Uh, and Aaron developed the tool in collaboration with journalist Kevin Polson and a security expert named James Dolan. In October of 2013, Freedom of the Press Foundation assumed stewardship of the project and it is now known as SecureDrop. Today, SecureDrop is an open source whistleblowing platform that is used in over 75 news organizations or NGOs across the world. Another project that Freedom of the Press Foundation maintains in collaboration with the Committee to Protect Journalists is a press freedom tracker. The US Press Freedom Tracker documents press freedom violations across the United States. And you can see that this year there's been some significant increase in cases, especially during the Black Lives Matter protests. The tracker also documents legal threats to journalists, including uh, legal threats to journalists and sources, including subpoenas to journalists, but also the prosecution of leaky cases. Since the tracker began, 71 subpoena cases and eight leak cases have been documented on the tracker. Earlier this year, uh, this was in the news, it was revealed that the DOJ had suggested that NPR's use of uh, secure drop was a matter for the FBI to investigate. Um, and only a few weeks ago, the DA, there was a DHS memo that was circulating that was instructing employees to report to their colleagues uh, if they suspected someone of sharing any information with external entities. It's not clear from the memo if uh, it's referring to journalists specifically, uh, but the Government Accountability Project called it an unrightful gag order and a crude violation of the Whistleblower Protection Act. In 2016, the Tau Center wrote a guide on SecureDrop, which states that SecureDrop restores the effectiveness of a reporter's privilege to protect their sources through principled non-cooperation in spite of pervasive digital surveillance. 
So this is due to the way the system was initially designed by Aaron and James. Each news organization maintains their own secure job instance. Servers are fully owned, fully operated by a news organization. Um, so while Freedom of the Press Foundation maintains the software and the software is free and open source, uh, there are no third party that has access to the system. By design, only the news org can access the information. The Tor anonymity network is used for all application communication, and so this provides strong security and anonymity properties for a source. Logging, logging is disabled uh, to reduce the source's metadata trail, and all the data is encrypted, sorry, is encrypted in transit and at rest to protect the confidentiality of the documents. We also want to guard against malicious submissions to protect journalists and their organizations, since obviously they're receiving random files from the internet, so we want to make sure that when they're open, they're open safely, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So this is what a source sees. Uh, when using the Tor browser, a source can reach a news organization's source interface and send them a message or file. These files or these messages because then are then stored encrypted on the server and the source can return to this source interface uh, and check for journalist replies and they can have a conversation that way. Uh, the source interface is only available through a Tor Onion service, making it only reachable through the Tor network. And so by that property, the source's identity is protected from network attacks using Tor or network surveillance as well. One of the major areas of, fo of focus this year was to improve the journalist experience. So as I mentioned before, uh, we're looking to protect journalists when they open attachments that they receive from anonymous sources. Uh, right now, in the vast majority of cases, we, we, uh, we use an air-gapped computer to decrypt and view source submission. So an air-gapped computer is a computer that is not connected to any network. Um, so obviously, this is a cumbersome process because it involves shuttling USB drives across two computers. So an internet-connected computer retrieves the files from the server, and then a non-network computer will, then you will transfer the, the, the files with a drive to a non-network computer that will then decrypt and view the files on that non-network computer. So our goal with the workstation is to replace these two laptops with a single laptop, preserving the same security properties that we have using the AirGap system. So based on the Cube's operating system, the Secure Drop workstation handles the downloading, decryption, and viewing of all the communications with the source. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the project, Cube's OS is a free and open source operating system that is based on Xen, uh, which is a Linux distribution that provides virtualization. And so it provides interesting tooling and interesting properties for compartmentalizing different workloads or different processes on the same computer. So the use of these virtual machines means that if a machine or a subcomponent of the system gets compromised, it won't immediately impact the data or the application that is being run in another virtual machine. So for those of you who've been to previous Iron Swords days, you may have seen this go from maybe an idea to then a prototype and to an alpha, or maybe even contributed some of the code uh, at some of the hackathon. But today I'm proud to announce that, that it is in production use today and is currently being used by a few orga news organizations as part of a limited pilot. So this is what a journalist sees. The workstation provides a chat-like interface that is familiar to journalists uh, and allows journalists to easily view sources, view submissions, and write, reply, write replies to sources, all on the same computer and all within the same application. So it preserves many of the security properties of the old AirGap model by using several virtual machines to handle uh, the different components, like the graphical application, the network, the decryption process. Uh, but the majority of the complexity that existed in the original AirGap system here is abstracted to the user and is completely automated behind the scenes. When a user opens an attachment, uh, they're open in hardened, networkless, and disposable virtual machines. So the attachment is open in its own virtual machine. Once the window is closed, the virtual machine is powered off, and then all changes to this VM are discarded. This reduces the likelihood of malware to be able to persist on the laptop. So here were some of the design goals when we designed the workstation. First, we wanted it to be safe for use for journalists. And so we achieved that by ensuring that uh, first, all known vulnerabilities are addressed. So basically keeping, keeping the machine patched. So we enforce updates each time a user boots into the system. Then we wanna make sure to isolate documents and secrets in a separate virtual machine. We then want to provide defense in depth using a combination of hardening and compartmentalization to protect against unknown vulnerabilities. And finally, we wanted to use also well-established and proven technologies. Uh, finally, it's nice to have something safe, but it's very important to be, for it to be usable. Um, so we wanted to make sure that journalists would be able to use, uh, use the system and that it doesn't require any specific knowledge of users. 
So what we did, we did that by automating some of the high risk error prone processes and ensured that the workstation would be maintainable by the IT staff at a news organization. So we've detailed the rationale, the various risks and the various countermeasures we'd have, we've applied. And we have a white paper that provides more detail at securedrop.org slash white paper, if you're interested. So here's some progress we've done this year. Uh, the workstation has been in limited pilot, as I said, since uh, with Newsroom since April 2020, April of this year. And we're adding new features based on user feedback coming from this pilot. So the initial findings have been quite positive. Um, from what we've observed, it reduces a journalist's time on task from check it for checking one checking submissions from approximately 20 minutes using the air gapped method to roughly five minutes using the workstation. It also reduces the complexity and annoyances of using two laptops for journalists. So these, these two findings allow for journalists to be able to be much more responsive and communicate with them more efficiently and more quickly. In 2018, uh, the workstation underwent a security audit, which validated our assumptions and our in initial design decisions as part of our alpha. Uh, but right now, we are currently um, doing a second security audit. So the second security audit is currently underway, uh, and it is scheduled to complete by the end of this year. So here's our 2020 release schedule until now. So in late March, we've released an initial beta of the workstation and we've been shipping incremental improvements based on feedback. And we've also issued several releases to the server component um, in order to support some of the workstation's functionality, do bug fixes, and also maintenance patches. Right now, SecureDrop, both, both the source and journalist web interfaces are fully translated in 21 languages with several other languages that are partially translated. So if you would like to add a language, or if you're interested in contributing to translations, you could go to securedrop.org slash translate. Here are a few organizations that have adopted SecureDrop in the year 2020. Uh, and here, here are some other changes. So as I said in the beginning of the talk, uh, we, we are using Onion Services for the source interface. So we've updated SecureDrop to use version three Onion Services by default. So the, the use of version three onion services significantly improve the algorithms used by onion services. Um, but on the, but one, one of the implications of this is that this means that by default URLs will be very long, uh, going from 16 characters to 54 characters. So now if a source would want to reach the source interface, they'll need to type 54 characters or in, into the Tor browser to be able to reach a, a news organization's source interface. So uh, starting with Tor Browser 9.5 that was released earlier this year, uh, the Tor project introduced uh, what they call onion names. Onion names allow mapping of a human readable name uh, to a Tor onion service URL. So in this example here, uh, if you type uh, lucyparsonslabs.securedrop.tor.onion in your Tor browser, it will, it will direct you to the source interface of Lucy Parsons Labs Secure Drop source interface. So this is available by default right now in Tor browser, and this is achieved uh, using an HTTPS Everywhere rule set uh, that will help that with a, yeah with an HTTPS Everywhere rule set. So this will help um, sources more easily reach sites that they want to uh, visit, like for example secure drop instances. Uh, but also this will preserve the security and the anonymity that is provided by the Tor network. So here are some of our plans for 2021. So uh, first, we'd like to have wider adoption of the workstation by news organizations. So once the second audit is complete, we'll review the report, we'll address whatever findings are uncovered, uh, and then publish the results of the audit. And so for those who are curious, um, all our historical audits for either SecureDrop or the SecureDrop workstation are all available on securedrop.org slash research. Um, after the completion of the audit, we will expand uh, pilot participation to more newsrooms. Um, we'll then also want to make functional improvements to the workstation. So provide tools for metadata redaction and support other tip lines. Um, and we also would like to translate uh, the workstation component. Right now, it is only, only available in English. And finally, on the server side, we'll provide updates and maintenance, uh, fully deprecating V2 services by, by next year, early next year and then update the underlying operating system to more recent to a more recent version. So this is a team that is working on SecureDrop today. We have a team focused on engineering and support, uh, but also Freedom of the Press Foundation offers digital security services to news organizations, uh, which includes training, but also uh, organizational security audits. 
So developing, but especially maintaining projects such as SecureDrop and the SecureDrop workstation are pretty large commitments, um, and they would never be possible without community contributions or community support. So if you'd like to get involved, uh, we have a page at securedrop.org slash hackathon uh, that can get help you get started if you would like to contribute to the project. So whether it's translations, documentations, graphics, code, even commenting on issues, uh, any contributions are welcome. Um, and you could also support us uh, by either donating directly to us uh, or donating to other very important projects on which we and many others rely on. So like Tor, Cubes, and Tails are, are examples. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from somebody um, in Germany that's wondering um, if the, you're going to have uh, more tutorials available for people in uh, in Germany and what the best uh, way is to contact you for setting up secure drop implementations in, in Germany. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for the question. So uh, right now, um, the the source and journalist interface are all documented are, are all available and internationalized in German. Unfortunately, right now our documentation is is English only. Um, so 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 that 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 is that is uh, yeah. So our documentation is fairly comprehensive. So it would be a, a quite a large effort. But right now our documentation is only in English. And if uh, they would like to contact us, um, there is a contact form on securedrop.org. Uh, that will go to to a uh, shared inbox if you would like to contact us uh, or um, yes that would be that would be the best way to contact us okay great and what's the number again just uh, the number of organizations of news organizations that have secure drop implementations now just because I love to watch that oh yeah so, so I think I think it's 76 right now 76. the exact number I think is 76 yeah Okay, okay, we're at 76. Okay, yeah, very amazing. And we look forward to um, to watching that progress in the future. And is there an easy answer to this thing I brought up about if you are in an organization, and I know the answer is no, it's not an easy answer, but um, if you're in an organization and they ask you to do something um, that you consider unethical and you want to, um, move on quietly is the way I like to describe it. Like there's no need to throw you and your family under the bus and make some big deal out of, um, you know, publicly going to the press and letting everyone know who you are and who your family is and that kind of thing. But if someone wanted to get documents using SecureDrop, there are, they need to do more than just scan the documents and upload them, right? Because even a scan of the documents themselves could be traced back to someone at the company and, and that kind of thing. Do, do you, I mean, cut and pasting the information into a, um, into a Word document from a library computer or something and uploading it? I mean, is, is there a, any way of simplifying that process at all for the people that are wondering about doing such things? Yeah, I, th I think this is a this is a very very complex complex issue. So SecureDrop solves the 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 transfer or the transport of these documents once they are acquired to the news org, um, and then as you say, there are sort of several things that 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 someone can do um, before sending those documents, and then there are things that journalists can do after receiving the document. So for a source, for example, um, obviously uh, making sure that they're not the only person or they're not within the restricted uh, or within um, a small group of people who have access to that data, because obviously if two people in the entire organization have access to that data, well, they'll be easy to find. Um, and, then, and then it's all about sort of removing, removing metadata if there is, um, if, if there is metadata and then um, yeah, so, so, so there, there are qu quite a few things that, that, that a source can do um, on, on their end. Um, if it's, if it's you know, digital documents, maybe just copying them to a text file, rewriting them, for example, that, that's another way. Um, and, then, and then on the other side, it's around um, the journalistic processes and how uh, news organizations handle these leaked documents. So in, in many cases, um, when, when a news org receives a leak, um, it, it, it depends on the news organization, but often they will not publish the documents that they receive. They will talk about the documents, they will authenticate the documents, they will describe the documents, they might quote the documents, um, but, but it, is, it is rare to see 
um, a, a, an actual document that, that has been leaked, uh, obviously because there are very significant risks um, in, in sort of showing the file that was submitted to them, even if it's a sanitized version or a modified version or whatever. So, so unfortunately, the, the, the answer is it's very complicated. Um, and that there's sort of a lot of a lot of tools in this space for for um, addressing some of these issues, like like metadata redaction. Um, but but unfortunately, this is a problem that is that is very uh, very hard to solve. And is yeah. Very okay, so at least something to consider. It's a whole other step of the game, and then also for journalists to um, not be so quick to make the documents available because then they can be analyzed by uh, the corporation involved or, or law enforcement. Okay. All right. Hey, thank you so much for your talk and really appreciate it. And we hope to see you back next year. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. All right. So um, uh, next we have Danny O'Brien, who is going to talk to us about uh, the People's Pollster. Um, which it turns out Aaron uh, did some work in um, homebrewed polling um, back in the day when he was working on some political campaigns. Um, and um, Danny's going to fill us in on that and talk about how moving forward we may be able to uh, do our own polls. And again, um, perhaps we could do real polling that has meaning where the um, the sample group is explained completely and the questions that were given is explained and then the polls might actually have meaning. What if there was a, a, a community run open source polling um, effort? Uh, we could actually have polls that mean something done by trusted sources. And I think it could revolutionize, um, I, I hesitate to say more accurate because it's gotten comical at this point, the inaccuracy of the polls that everyone still hangs on. We just did it again for this last election and it was kind of amazing to watch. So I would uh, hand it over now to Danny O'Brien. Tell us about the people's pollster, Danny. Hey, Lisa. Um, am I loud enough? I was just a little scared that my volume control. Yeah. No, you sound great. Yep. Okay. Excellent. All right. So. Um, as Lisa mentioned, somehow over the last few weeks, I, as millions of others, have become kind of instant experts at polling and the entire nature of polling. I don't know where that happened. I've never started polling. Um, I've never been interested in it before. But it's like this sort of thing comes from heaven above and deposits itself on you when you join the internet uh, throngs. Um, it's not really surprising to me that I now have a million opinions about polls um, because actually I have a million opinions about uh, everything. Uh, and I express them all on the internet simultaneously. And one of the th reasons why I do that, and one of the reasons I enjoy it, is because none of those opinions are actually moored in any way to reality. Um, oh, I should say, um, before I spill out any more opinions, um, I'm, I'm proudly wearing my EFF t-shirt today, but I'm not wearing my EFF hat, which is to say these are personal um nonsense opinions that i'm i'm spooling out here and i say that because um eff is is traditionally uh, a non-partisan organization and i may let some partisan words slip through uh so that's just me. noted what's that i said duly noted you are yeah, not yeah okay representative Thank you. of the electronic frontier foundation this is, this is not legal advice um and i am not an american citizen so uh, where were we? We were talking about millions of opinions. And one of those, of course, is that you know the polls, polls were completely wrong, as Lisa said. Polls are actually very useful. Um, I, like everybody else, is kind of partisan. It's sort of meta-partisan at this stage. It's not like I'm partisan about the political parties, but I'm partisan about the pollsters polling the political parties. Um, I'm probably a bit of a Nate Silver partisan, and 80% of my friends hate me for that. Um, I think because they still haven't forgiven St. Nate for what he did to them in 20. 16. But I mean, it doesn't really matter, though, what my opinion is, because, you know, Nate Silver is Nate Silver. The posters are going to keep on polling. I have no control over that. And most of all, it's like a part time opinion for me. I haven't really looked into it. Um, and, and, you know, I think one of the reasons for that is, is you know, one of the people that, that probably hates Nate Silver more than even my friends um, and everybody I respect uh, is, is Nazim Taleb. 
And Nazim, um, when he's criticizing people, says the only opinions worth listening to are those from people who have, quote, can I cram the quote into this very tightly focused camera, skin in the game. Um, and he says this a lot. And in fact, if you buy his audio book of his book, A Skin in the Game, the voice person who has to read it has to say the word skin in the game emphatically every 15 seconds or so. So he cares a great deal about this. And I think it's it's fair, right? The reason why um, my opinions are uh, so prolif prolific is because they're cheap. You know, there's no loss if I get it wrong and there's no loss if I, I get it right. And, I, you know, this is one of the, the, the challenges and the problems with politics in the world at the moment is because of the concentration of power and money, for most of us, our opinions don't matter. The only ma moment they matter is in the uh, moment of an election. And even then, they only matter a little bit. And that's why everyone is sort of like grimly fascinated on the polls, because the polls give you some like vague intimation of how the magic of your um, your vote becomes uh, reality. So it, to the extent that we have any skin in the game, it's this tiny kind of paper cut of, um, of skin in the grand game of electoral politics. So Aaron, to take this back to um, the topic in hand, also had a lot of opinions. And I think in one vision of the world now, I sort of imagine that he could have ended up being, you know, a, 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 a Nathan Robertson or a Chapo Trap House or a Nate Silver or a Nate Cohen or, you know, transmogrified into another man with a lot of opinions who's probably white and probably called Nate. Um, but the, the, the reason why I think Aaron is remembered now rather than the sort of that sort of dystopian version of, of of Aaron that he could become is because actually he he had a lot of opinions but he also put skin in the game he'd not only come up with like dumb ideas for changing the world he'd also actually do them and try them out and experiment with them and he would whittle out the dumbest ideas and he would tweak the less dumb until they had become smart ideas Aaron was was a, a, a man of of action and let me give you an example of this, which I've been thinking about for the last few weeks. And if I'm really honest with you, I think I've been thinking about this um, for, for, for the last few years. Back in 2010, uh, Aaron's friend David Siegel, who uh, he co-founded Demand Progress with, was running an insurgent campaign in the Democratic primary for Rhode Island's um, uh, first congressional um, uh, candidate. And uh, Aaron went along to help him uh, win the primary. It was one of those underdog campaigns, as I say, I think there was a, it was a four way battle. Um, and, uh, and David um, actually got 20% of the vote, which isn't a bad, but it, you know, it's not enough. And, and, and one of the things that if you're running an insurgent campaign that you have to kind of take the cost of is that um, the the well funding funded candidates have access to polling right they polling is is um, is expensive um, it's kind of concentrated it's usually the dem domain of like very large corporations and well funded candidates and so they have right or wrong this particular sort of insight um, that they don't they don't always share I mean we really only see the tip of the iceberg with polling you know a lot of poll results are kept secret and therefore um, at least the people that pay for them they're seen as a competitive informational advantage but Aaron being Aaron was like you know this can't be that hard, right? So he, he he downloaded Asterisk, which you might know as the open source telephone exchange code, um, and wrote some Python scripts that just, you know, robocalled people in the Rhode Island area and said, do you know David Seagull? Press one for yes. And um, talked with his friend Dan Cohen, who's an actual pollster, and understood a bit of the math behind, you know, balancing and weighting these things. And he did a super cheap ass polling setup for, um, for, for Seagull that actually ended up predicting the final result better than the public polls and you know that was that it didn't win the election but it was it was data and I, I, I keep thinking about this and I thought about it after Aaron passed away um, and it, it, it cropped up again 
um, in in the, the the sort of fallout of the presidential election. I think one of the the I, I too have been paranoid about a coup and a contested election. But one of the things I think is a signal that perhaps we're returning to to the normality of um, the status quo after the you know frank weirdness of the last few years in the United States was as soon as the Democrats won, they'd start arguing with each other about how exactly they'd won and how it was not winning in exactly the right way and you know democrats infighting is is um certainly where i came in in america and it i find it quite reassuring um disturbing from the future of the, the country but but you know reassuring so some people said that they didn't win enough because the left of the party sent too extreme a message and some said they didn't win enough because in fact they won the, the votes that they did get through exciting and mobilizing minorities who support strong messages like Medicare for All and the Green New Deal. And, and you, you, you can see this in the fights in the um, editorial pages of the big newspapers and, of course, in terribly ratio Twitter um, discussions. And, and the thing is, uh, it struck me that this is kind of an odd debate in some ways because, you know, you, the voters are right there listening to you, right? That we are here. Like you, you could, as a member of the high ups in the Democratic Party or, you know, AOC or whatever, you could just ask and ensure, you know, um, uh, um, not all of us uh, know exactly uh, why we voted in the same way or we might lie or we might be like, you know, shy Biden voters or whatever. And maybe it's a little subconscious. But, you know, if someone tells you, oh, actually, thank you for asking. I voted this year because I completely despise Trump or, you know, uh, I really, really love Biden or, you know, they're a big fan of AOC and her policies and like she supported the local candidate or, you know, they saw a Lincoln Project ad and it so alienated them from Trump that they decided to to vote for Joe, you know, that's that's data. It's not overriding data, right? But it's 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 a little bit more information than just people, you know, exchanging opinions in Democratic conference calls. So why don't people do that? Well, I mean, there's one reason. Uh, one is that, you know, if you poll a question that you care about, really, you can only lose, right? If it says, if the polling says, actually, it turns out that you were right, well, great. I, I knew I was right. Um, and if it comes out that it's different, well, then you've got you've you've you literally paid to have someone tell you that you're wrong in public. And like, why would you why would you as a politician do that? So I know what you're going to say is that, you know, actually, do we really need more polling and potentially pretty flawed polling? I mean, you know, being led by polls is a terrible idea in politics, right? You have principles. You don't want to just be led. And this was a criticism of the um, of the Bill Clinton administration is that they would just, you know, dump everything just because the polls who we don't know or correct would tell them that they should they should go in. some they should move to the center. And, you know, I do kind of agree with that, right? I think that, that somebody like Aaron and all of us, you know, acts from our principles and we shouldn't be influenced by, by just the fact that everybody thinks we are wrong because, you know, that doesn't mean anything in terms of the principles. But, um, you know, I also think of it, so I, I think of the weatherman. Um, and not the terrorists, just to be clear, actual people who predict the weather. Um, and what's funny about the weather men is, or pe people, weather people, is, um, you know, people used to really care about them. Like 20 or 30 years ago, and it's hard to convey now, people get got really angry at weather people for getting the weather wrong. And now I really don't feel that's a thing anymore. Um, and I think the reason why this is, is because, first of all, we've got better at predicting the weather. But secondly, we're sort of drowning in weather information. We have a whole channel. I have like three apps. Like we have the, the other weather underground, which is a distributed and decentralized data collecting tool run by you know, hundreds of thousands of people around the world that, that collates weather information. And so we both simultaneously uh, I've got better uh, at weather prediction, but we also don't attach it such significance, right? If a weather person gets it wrong, well, they get it wrong. We understand that there's a flaw here. Um, the, the, when you have centralized control of a certain 
amount of data, it does a number of things. One is it's not very good, right? Because there aren't the checks and balances that you have from the public peer reviewing examination of data. Two, the people in power think it's super important because it's one of the privileges of power to have access to that. And outside the circles of power, the world divides into two ways. Some people are like extra respectful and trusting of institutions and authorities. So they just go, oh my God, if the polls say that Biden is going to win, then my God, Biden must be going to win. So, hey, maybe I won't be bothered to vote because it's all done. And another group of people, who, because they're not being shown the working, are obviously utterly cynical about this and go, this is just bullshit that the people in power are saying to like mislead you. Um, and one of the beauties about the great project that, that I think Aaron sort of always thought about was that distributing knowledge not only um, uh, makes it better, but also strips it of that magic. It makes people have a reasonable expectation of how wrong or right it is because it's just data being produced by flawed human beings and you could see their flaws open in the um in, in the world so anyway that that's that's the my question was and is and i um is could we do an error now could we open polling data to the world in the same way as Aaron sought to open you know all kinds of useful data to the world not so we could be blown away by the access to perfect knowledge but because we're not we wouldn't be awed by it and the people in power couldn't be misled by knowledge they value just because it was secret and therefore uncontested so i as you do, I, I ask the internet and, you know, it, it, it's kind of interesting. Now, this is one of those things where I have to kind of like share my um, screen. So uh, I bet this doesn't work. Also, I'm using Windows and don't judge me. Um, my other computer is a um, Frankenstein hybrid of Debian and Geeks, but um, actually I'm using Wayland and so it doesn't do screen sharing. So this, this, just forgive me, all right? Forgive me in the same way as you forgive me for uh, slightly fancying Nate Silver. Okay, so, uh, oh God, something else you have to forgive me for, actually, um, which is, um, oh, no, maybe that's not the best thing to show you first. Once again, let's try it. Um, here we go, here we go. Um, great. Hey, where am I? Am I still there? Do you still see my, my, my happy face? No, okay. Either. There we go. Yes. Can you see it? We can see what you're showing, and you you are in the lower right. Uh oh. Before we head it up, you may have to pick between the document and your face for a moment. Okay. All right. It's you know it's not that it's not that interesting, and I can just like put the link somewhere. Can if hey Lisa, if I put this in the chat, will you put it in all the millions of other chats that exist out there that sure. people are listening to? Okay. So. Um, this is a couple of things. Now, um, like I said, like, you know, if you didn't like me for the Nate Silver um, fandom and you don't like me for like, you know, mentioning polling, um, I'm also talking about the effect of altruists who are kind of controversial, I, I know. And I, in my defense, um, the rationalists were also the sort of people that Aaron was kind of fascinated in, mostly to gently poke fun at. But um, um, but I, I too like to track them. And I like them because um, they too like to try things out. And this is a project that one of the effective altruist groups who are um, basically have calculated from a utilitarian point of view that the best political action we should do is to um, stop people being cruel to animals um, and including eating them and just being basically horrible. Um, and, you know, that's an opinion and I'll, I'll go with it. But one of the things they've been doing is um, uh, 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 the lot of mathematicians in that in that community. So they went, hey, let's try doing some polling. So this was them showing their work for a poll of the presidential race. And when I mean showing their work, they go into every detail, like how they how they got the questions, the math that they used to uh, crunch it and get a result, the papers that they used in in the polling world, and you know they're kind of amateurs in this area, right? Like they're not experts, but they're doing it in in uh, public and, you know, their results were, were fine. Um, and the thing that was interesting to me was like, how much does that cost? 
And the answer is um, about 7,500 for a somewhat crummy kind of online poll. Um, I'm not judging the poll, but you know, this is not going out on the streets. This is not spending a lot of time knocking on people's doors or um, phoning them up. Um, and and it, they did fine. So seven thousand dollars is like kind of a lot, right? Uh, and you know, I'm certainly not going to splurge that to have my opinions um, summarily dismissed by the hoi polloi. Um, but uh, actually, they got to ask forty five questions, and they did this as a spin off to the questions that they actually wanted to ask, which is people's attitudes to animals, I suspect. Um, and forty five questions divided by seven thousand is actually not that bad it's like about $150 $200 a pop and you can kind of divide that again because if i have a question that i would like to ask the great american or even the global public um there's probably going to be about 10 or 20 people who are as weird as me uh and and they might throw in a ten dollars too and there we have it like we have a kickstart for every question you want to know whether the world agrees with you about um so uh uh that's interesting right and another thing that's kind of interesting is that if you try and run this on kickstarter if you try and kickstart for a poll they shut you down so um this is a gap in the market we could run the people's pollster and like we could start by using other people's systems for doing this and like tweaking our own math but we would be doing it in public and you could ask any question uh radical groups could ask any question um and also we would be showing people how to do this so that eventually we would all get a bit smarter about polling. Um, the other aspect of this is, is you know, it, it, in that kind of what would Aaron do uh, frame of mind, you know, I think he, I, I, there were a lot of things that Aaron could have made lots of money at. And in fact, he, he, he did make quite a lot of money on the side. I think his side gigs let him pay for um, his activism in a lot of ways. But, but he, you know, he, he would always be thinking about less about like how to fund this, but how to do it in a in a principled and, and, and beneficial way for all of humanity. And I think if Aaron was going to do this, if, if anyone else was going to do this, it would be like you pay 20 bucks and you get the secret, right? You get to be one of those people that has access to like the large corporations and the, the, um, the DNC. You have the secret source. And I think if you were going to do this in an Aaron way, the 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 um the deal would be you get to ask your questions cheap and we get to help you like craft those questions because that's part of the challenge of doing a poll but the 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 deal is is that we make this information public right we everybody gets to see what these polls are and um uh and and that would be great because it would let us more uh, opinions to one aspect of reality again polls can if po polls lead your principles, you're going into a, 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 a very um, uh, uh, incorrect place, I think. But if you assert something, um, it's good to have skin in the game, right? It's good. Like, if I say, I think 70% of the people here, you know, um, uh, love Jitsi, and uh, we poll that, and it's 90% or it's 30%, that would let you not only would you learn something but you would learn something about yourself and your ability to predict things and maybe you would be able to compensate for that it removes the magic of hidden knowledge and it means that we all get to have some element of skin in the game um and that you know that that's what i would be talking excitedly to Aaron about now. Um, I was Aaron's friend and Aaron wrote an amazing essay um, that I couldn't find for this, but basically he was saying um, when he runs a business or a project, um, uh, he has friends to give him stupid, crazy ideas, but he would never employ his friends <laughs> because his friends were stupid, crazy idea people um, and very entertaining, but actually um, uh, when he was doing a project, he wanted people who would actually get things done. I am not uh, necessarily a man of action. And I used to have a person of action who I could talk to excitedly and then magically great things would happen in the world. And, and, and that was Aaron and Aaron went, um, and was taken from me and taken from many of us. And now I'm lonely and I'm kind of just sort of one hand and I, you know, like all of us, I think we, we, we all need help.
to make change in, in the world. So I'm putting this out for free. Um, I, you know, this is one of a hundred things that I swear I'm going to do. And um, uh, polls suggest that I will not do it. I'm happy to talk to you. I'm Danny at spesh.com, S-P-E-S-H.com, if you want to talk to me about it. I've been talking to David Siegel. I've talked to a few people about how this might be done and, um, uh, and the pros and the cons, um, but I'm happy to talk to you. Um, just Google me. I'm Maller at Twitter and, um, and talk to yourself and talk to your friends and maybe we can be the people's poster that an, one version of the present day Aaron might be. All right, great. Thank you so much. And Elliot Harmon um, has a question. Elliot. <laughs> Elliot. Elliot has, <laughs> has a question I, for you. I, I just I just typed some random. Can, can everybody hear me? Yeah, yeah we can hear okay, you. Great. Great. I just typed some random words into the chat. Not really. I think I'd have to say them out loud. So I'll try to do my best with this. Um, this is way at the, at the beginning of this discussion, Danny. Um, you uh made this this point about the kind of recurring debate that happens after every election is whether things went for our side quote unquote uh or not because of the message or because of mobilization that's an oversimplification but though that seems to be kind of the two poles um right. and it occurs to me that um polling is is always kind of inherently going to uh, point you toward the message. Um, you know, after the 2016 election, this is my very, very rudimentary understanding of how polls work, but um, y y all of, there's a bunch of adjustments to the polling data based on demographics of who we know is actually going to vote. If you know that 30% of the of people in a certain district are going to be black, but 50% of your uh, people that you polled are black, then you adjust the results accordingly. Um, and therefore, polling will never really uh, give us hints about these surprises in terms of the demographic being very different than we thought it was going to be. And like that was the lesson in 2016 that education ended up being a big factor that people hadn't thought about before. And I don't, I genuinely don't know like how to fix that besides the impossibility of literally polling every single person who will or will not vote. Um, Which we I, call I just, an election, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I, I, I don't know how to fix that inherent problem with polling. Well, so I think we see polling as the thing that helps us predict what an election result is, is going to be. And like, that's actually like potentially one of the most difficult things for a poll to achieve for exactly the reasons that you describe, right? Because you're not just like trying to take a general survey of like what people think. You're also trying to balance it by the 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 numbers of people who um, actually, you know, either have the time or the resources or the inclination to go out and vote in the final election. So it's like this, it's like a poll predicting another poll. Um, and again, you know, I am not an expert about these things, but I think we can separate that very pretty difficult thing to do um, with the retrospective feature, because the retrospective feature, you don't have to ask someone, do you think you're going to vote, you know, or you don't have to like balance these things out. You just have to go, did you vote? Right. And um, and of course, some people lie and it's totally fascinating about who who, who lies and who, who doesn't. Um, and uh, you do have to do some rebalancing of, of, about that. Um, and I will note that one of the reasons why we have this intense level of debate is because of a kind of interesting misuse of polling. Well, maybe not misuse of polling, but like something that's kind of weird. Right. Which is that. Democrats are now comparing their success to what they thought they were going to succeed because they would they that's the deduction that they made from the polls. And you know, this goes into this sort of weird error thing, which is like actually you can't trust polls that much, right? You they're not that good by definition. So if we had more polls and we had like reflexive polls in this way, I think people would treat them with the mild disdain that they deserve, but also get to use them for 
genuinely useful things. Here's, here's my point, right, is that if there's an argument of that in the Democratic Party, um, the Democratic Party has its own institutional features and they could argue about that till the cows come home. I'm interested in knowing the answer, right? As a citizen and a voter, I would like to know what the hell is going on. And um, in the same way as I get information about that from the news sources I read, I want to be able to pick the polls that I read as well. I want to be able to have another bit of data in this so I can I can think about what you know the political experts are saying with this other angle in place. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Yes, it does. Yes. Yes, I think it does. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, Danny, thank you so much for the talk, really appreciate it. And um, so if people get excited and want to go get, was it Asterisk was the name of the program? Oh, yeah, so Asterisk like is, um, uh, uh, is, is an implementation of sort of uh, an entire telephone exchange of P PBX, and that means that you can do sort of robocalling and things like that um, pretty easily. But please check local law. <laughs> road calling. I did check and what Aaron did was perfectly legal as is always the case with Aaron. Um, um, but you know, don't go, I, I'm not encouraging rogue gorilla polling people. You follow the law. Okay. No, not rogue gorilla polling, just lawful polling, just right. accurate polling. Count, count the lawful polling opinions. Yes. Legal things are good um yeah but really um and i'm not sure how much the law is followed with the existing polling services in all fairness when you hear about them later um but the whole point is we wouldn't even necessarily have to have it be a robo calling system i mean sometimes you're actually calling people and and talking to them you know right um, right right i mean the 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 um uh, the recent priorities folks, the people that like showed their working, bless them, um, they used a sort of Mechanical Turk online uh, uh, um, system, which obviously has has its flaws, sort of dem demographically. I think one of the things that pollsters are struggling with right now is trying to find ways of getting access to people who don't respond to phone calls and are very um hard to reach and uh you know that would be a problem that you would struggle with as well but there are ways of compensating to a certain degree for that right do you think it's possible i'm just asking you this because it comes up every year every time it's an election year would it be too hard to have people opt in to some kind of system where they could we could get their opinions on things like a direct democracy kind of thing like a direct democracy but you're not it's still just what people think. We're not. We're not trying to. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, have so, it connected to any kind of thing that happens across the board once the people say they want it or anything. But at least, like for floating ideas and stuff, it seems like the everything's still so roundabout when you're floating ideas and things like that. Well, uh, you know, of course, it's 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 hard because you you end up with that thing where like Boaty McBoakface wins, right? If you don't have skin in the game. Um, then you give your opinions in a in a and and you can like um sock puppet and, and do all of these things sure right? sure sure i didn't mean sort of like a free-for-all where you could make up false accounts that's why you would have to opt into it because you would actually be you know yeah I, a person that you'd have to be a person in fact it would, it would make sense if it was tied to the voting um you know the voting things in some ways it just feels like we're still shooting in the dark all the time, and it feels like we shouldn't. Um, well, yeah. of course, the, the, there were uh, one of the waves that produced Aaron also produced um, the pirate parties, which were parties around the world that, that in the twenty tens that were already kind of disgruntled with the the political process as it was, and they've had greater or lesser success. Actually, you know, um, in Iceland, they became a pretty major party in a few places in Europe. They became part of the sort of populist wave, both right wing and, and left wing. Um, and many of those um, 
uh, 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 organizations, because they were sort of somewhat tech um, enthusiastic, did li liquid democracy that had this kind of structure. And um, again, I think it hits this problem of when your principles are led by your, if you're polling to determine directions, then you run into one problem. Or as you describe, right, if you're just polling to kind of get a, a flavor of the thing, um, then it's it's hard to actually kind of pin down what if, if people are polling because they want to change the world, it, it it changes what the nature of polling is. I think that's part of the problem. But but it's it's still a good idea. And like just because it, there are challenges to it doesn't mean people shouldn't try it. Look into it. Okay, yeah. great. All right. Well, thank you so much. And um, you, Lisa. and we're gonna um, we're gonna go right now to Elliot Harmon, who is going to tell us about the recent situation with YouTube DL, um, which is, um, well, I'll just let him tell you about it. I was going to say same old story. It's tools getting in the way of people's fair use. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll let you take it from here, Elliot. I, I, I I'm happy to take it from here and I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Lisa. Um, were we going to start with the video that we made? You can. Um, we oh. have it if you need us to play it or you can play it from where you are. We weren't sure which way. Uh, either oh, way. Okay, yeah, let's do, let's do that. Okay, let's start off with the video then. Okay, Great. cool. Thank you. Why can't. can't you download this video? In fact, why can't you download any video from YouTube? I've looked all over YouTube and I've never found a download button. My name is Elliot Harmon and I am a senior activist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We're going to talk about that question today and we're also going to talk about why basically every household appliance you could imagine has a computer built into it now. Because weirdly enough, it's the same answer. First, let's talk about YouTube. There's a tool called YouTube DL that lets people download videos from YouTube and other streaming video sites. But a couple of weeks ago, the Recording Industry Association of America demanded that GitHub take down the entire repository for YouTube DL, making the tool basically inaccessible to the world. The RIAA claims that the tool was being used to infringe on its member labels music, but let's think about that claim for a second. That certainly doesn't apply to every way that anybody was possibly using YouTube DL. Take this video, for example. This video was created by the Electronic Frontier Foundation and like basically everything that EFF makes, this video is published under a Creative Commons license. That license lets you do whatever you want with this video as long as you give us credit. You could put it into your video editor and change the colors in it and put that dancing hot dog gif in front of my face. You could even burn this video onto a Blu-ray and go out on the street and sell it for a profit. And there's nothing that EFF could do about it as long as you follow the terms of the license because we've already given you that permission when we put the Creative Commons license on this video. And yet here this video sits stuck on YouTube with no great way for you to take advantage of those rights. YouTube DL filled that gap. It created this extremely useful feature that's not available on the main YouTube site. EFF didn't ask GitHub to take down YouTube DL to protect our videos. And certainly when the RIAA demanded that GitHub take down the repository, they weren't doing it on our behalf. EFF isn't a member of the RIAA. In fact, they don't like us very much. Um, but still, they demanded that this tool that you could have used to download our video be taken off of the internet. It's not just about Creative Commons videos. There are lots of ways that you can use copyrighted material that don't infringe on copyright. There's the whole legal doctrine of fair use that outlines ways in which you can use copyrighted work that don't infringe on the original copyright holder's rights. But the RIAA threw all of that out the window and now nobody can use YouTube DL regardless of whether they intended to use it for legal purposes or not. Who died and put them in charge of YouTube? To understand what's really going on here, you need to know a little bit about DRM 
and a little bit about Section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. DRM stands for Digital Rights Management or Digital Restrictions Management, depending who you ask. What it really means is a digital lock that keeps you from accessing or modifying a copyrighted work. Section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA 1201, says that it's illegal to bypass DRM even if you're doing it for completely lawful purposes. Even if you're bypassing DRM, for example, for the purposes of downloading a Creative Commons licensed video that you have the rights to use, copyright holders have argued that you're still breaking DMCA 1201 by bypassing that digital lock. In some circumstances, the law even bars you from telling other people how to bypass that digital lock or sharing with them a tool to use to bypass that lock. And I wanna be clear, by illegal, I don't just mean that it voids your warranty or breaks some kind of terms of service agreement. I mean, illegal, illegal. There's a process that takes place every three years uh, where the Copyright Office grants exceptions to DMCA 1201. This is a very time consuming process. You have to put together a lot of evidence and submit it to the Copyright Office. And also it only covers you bypassing DRM for your own purposes. It doesn't cover you providing tools to other people for bypassing DRM. Oh, and again, it only takes place every three years. Technology has changed a lot since the DMCA first passed in 1998. Back then when most people thought about DRM, they were really thinking about things like the copy protection on DVDs that made it a little harder to rip a movie from a DVD, uh, or the old fair play system that iTunes used to have, where you would download a track on iTunes and you could only burn it onto a certain number of CDs. People were really thinking about protection for traditional media like movies and music and, and video games. Now when we talk about DRM, we're not just talking about traditional media. We're talking about farmers not being able to repair their own tractors because it's illegal to modify the onboard software on the tractor. We're talking about security researchers being barred from studying deadly flaws in medical devices or journalists not being able to tell the public when an auto manufacturer lied about its emissions tests. These are all completely legitimate, completely worthwhile uses of technology that are undermined by that legal protection for DRM. All because of those six words, a work protected under this title, meaning any copyrighted work. So the law doesn't just protect the digital locks on movies and music, it protects the digital locks on software since software is copyrightable too. Since the DMCA passed, we've had this explosion in any device you can imagine with a computer built into it. We have computerized rice cookers, toilets, refrigerators, and yes, this is real, we have computerized egg cartons. And now we're in a world where it might be illegal to modify the software on your own rice cooker that you bought with legal tender money. If that sounds absurd, that's because it is. You know, it might be tempting to forgive Congress for this whole mess um, and say, well, when they passed the law in 1998, they didn't know that we were soon gonna have a world where every kind of product had a computer built into it. On the other hand, Congress really brought this whole mess on. It's really Congress's fault because they created this extremely powerful incentive for manufacturers to build their products with DRM. Suddenly you can control what people can do with your products. By putting a computer into that product, you can make it illegal for other people to do what they want with your products. Congress gave manufacturers a huge amount of control over how people use their products, or even just how people talk about their products. Because remember, the DMCA doesn't just ban circumventing DRM, it might also ban you from telling other people how to circumvent DRM. And if you only know one thing about the United States Constitution, you should know this. Laws in the United States are not supposed to bar what people can say. Which brings us back to YouTube DL. The 
The makers of YouTube DL weren't infringing on anyone's copyright. They were simply providing information to the public about how to perform a certain task. And as we've already discussed, there are lots of reasons why you would want to perform that task that are completely legal, including for downloading this video and putting a hot dog gif in front of my face. But the RIAA demanded that this tool be taken off of the internet. That's wrong. We're still looking into what happened with YouTube DL, and we want to hear from the community on this. If you were or are a user of YouTube DL using it for legal purposes, uh, for education, for archiving, for journalism, for whatever it is, we want to hear from you. Send us an email at info at EFF.org and just be sure that you put YouTube DL somewhere in the subject line and the email will get to the right people. Uh, we won't publish your information without your permission. Right now, we just really want to collect stories of how people were and are using this tool. We're going to keep following this story and you can follow along with us at EFF.org slash DRM. Thanks for watching. Hello, I, I I think we're back now and I'm in the exact same room wearing the exact same sweatshirt as I was in this recorded video. Um, I guess maybe I'll just I'll just say a couple of things and then hopefully there'll be some some questions. I'd love to just uh, hear your questions or hear people's yeah. thoughts. Um, I, I I get in honor of Aaron Swartz Day. I guess I should I should say a little bit about Aaron. I I I did not know him unfortunately. Um, when he died, I was working at Creative Commons, um, and so it's 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 interesting that sort of all of the areas in which my work kind of intersects with his are areas that had to do with copyright, um, which is a topic that he, even though he did a great deal of activism on, he he also had this this kind of wonderful ambivalence about. Um, I think most people watching this have probably watched or read his uh, How We Beat Sopa talk. Um, and it starts with him saying to his friend, look, I'm sick of hearing about all these copyright bills. Maybe you guys are right. Maybe the MPAA is right. Who cares? Um, but but he, you know, putting that kind of sarcastic point aside, uh, he recognized that abuse of copyright is very much at the vanguard of censorship. Um, and, you know, in the we were just talking about these DRM circumvention laws and the ways in which those laws can neglect fair use. Um, and indeed, fair use is the proxy for freedom of speech in copyright law. If you have copyright law that does not work within the contours of uh, fair use, then that law should be declared unconstitutional, um, which is a very, very short version of why we have sued to have DMCA 1201 declared unconstitutional. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention really quick before we go to questions is I, I talked in that recording about the, the DMCA 1201 rulemaking process. Um, and for people who aren't familiar with it, this is a process that takes place every three years um, where essentially the public has the opportunity to make its case to the Copyright Office uh, about why you should be allowed to circumvent DRM in these certain situations um, and that doing so doesn't cause any of the harms traditionally associated with copyright infringement, that it, that it, that it doesn't cause harm to the market for the copyright holder, etc. Um, it's a very time consuming process and that's part one of the problems with it. It's a very time consuming process. It's a very expensive process and it's a process that takes place only every three years. Um, that said, we have we have gotten some some yes. great things out of it, um, including this kind of gradual expansion of your ability to uh, jailbreak uh, and repair your own devices. Um, first, we got a jailbreaking exemption for smartphones, and then that was expanded to tablets, and then that was expanded again to home devices and things like that. Um, this time around, we're going to be asking for a much broader exemption, um, which is about your right to repair or modify 
your own product with software built into it, whatever it is, be it a Google Home or be it your smart rice cooker or whatever it is, uh, your right to repair or modify it for your own purposes. And that's where we could really, really use input from the community on this. Um, your stories of how you want to be able to do those repairs and modifications, but currently can't. Um, if you go to that URL that I said in the video, which is EFF.org slash DRM, uh, you'll find a bunch of information, but one of the things you'll find is a blog post that goes into some more depth about what we really want to get uh, as, as part of this evidence that we're going to send to the Copyright Office. Um, so if you think this might describe you, then please take a look at that information and please write into us because these cases are a lot stronger when you see not just us kind of imagining what, what technologists would want to do, but actual technologists in the community saying, look, here's what we need to do and, and here's how the law is currently getting in the way. Um, okay, uh, are there, are there any- Interesting. Um, so I had a question. Um, so just in general, um, it's come up recently actually with, um, with Twitch streams. And um, again, our own media have friends that are streamers and they will try to record their show maybe something goes wrong with the show they don't have a recording and twitch used to have your last however many shows available and you could download them you sort of had more time recently there's sort of a twitch uh a twitch what's the word when it's twitchopolis uh what's the word when there's like a um apocalypse there's like a twitch apocalypse <laughs> that has happened recently where the streamers have been notified that they're supposed to clean any copyrighted material out of their streams before they are able to have a video of it. I mean, the whole thing is confusing. If you have a live stream and there's obviously copywritten materials, maybe you do a music review stream or something, maybe copyrighted material and, and arguably fair usage of copyrighted material because you're playing excerpts and you're making commentary. That is your show. All right. <laughs> So um, what do we tell people about these latest draconian restrictions that were, besides being poorly explained about how it would even take place, um, these these streamers aren't even breaking any laws doing their show, and what can they do? What would you suggest? Um, yeah, first, this is this is a mess, and we've been following it very closely, and it's a it's a quickly moving story. Um, but yeah, you're right, Lisa. Twitch took down some number of thousands of archived videos all at once based on what I understand to be this kind of backlog, backlog of, of uh, DMCA takedown notices that they had from uh, RIAA member labels. Um, your example that you gave a second ago, Lisa, of what about people doing music reviews or doing any kind of commentary or parody about music, that's such an excellent example of how you have to have this fair use regime built into copyright and into whatever mechanisms you have to enforce copyright because other were, um, otherwise you are literally infringing on people's constitutional rights. Um, that if you cannot use a piece of music, even for the purpose of uh, commenting on that piece of music, then the law is very, very literally getting away in the way of your freedom of speech. and. I think that the little coda to this story, or I shouldn't say coda, but the the most recent chapter of this story happened just yesterday when Twitch sent this email to all of its members kind of implying, oh, maybe you just shouldn't use music in your streams, which is just such an absurd thing to say. Um, it, to me, it, it kind of goes to the old story of the guy like, uh, you know, um, looking, looking, under the light post for his keys, not because that's where he drops them, but because that's where the most light is. Um, scanning for alleged infringement of music is very, very easy. So that is a thing that all of the platforms have, have built in. Um, but the idea that every single use, even just a little incidental use uh, of music would, would rise to the level of constituting copyright infringement is just kind of absurd. Well, also, I mean, EFF finally won the dancing baby case after however many millions of years. 
And yeah. How much of this isn't the dancing baby case? I mean, it seems like the incidental music or the music playing in the background is the dancing baby case, which mm. was ruled to be a fair use, right? Which was mm. ruled it was okay. So it's almost like we're relitigating issues that have been decided. Um, and, you know, especially, it, it, I guess my question is this, you know, on Facebook, there's a lot of music going around, but Facebook perhaps licenses, it, 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 could it be up to the platforms to license enough of the music to, to cover, you know, these kinds of uses to be able to keep going? Is this a little bit Clash of the Titans here where Twitch, who's owned by Amazon, is fighting with these music companies, just sort of like they're fighting until they can reach an agreement kind of thing and we're all caught in the crosshairs. Is it that all over again? So I have a couple of comments. One is, I mean, you're absolutely right that what 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 Hollywood wants is these these very, very large, you know, kind of kind of blanket licensing payments from the platforms. Um, and that's what part of the debate over the copyright directive in the EU was about. Um, and that's a debate that's happened in the United States in various contexts, too. Um, no, there was something else I was going to say. What was it? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Facebook uh i i said a second ago that every platform does not every platform but most of the major platforms do some kind of scanning for copyright infringement partly because it's it's just it's very easy to do um it's of course not easy for a computer to recognize fair use um or to to recognize like a, a little incidental appearance of a song that would in no way compete with the original. Um, but this is the thing that the labels have been pretty successful at pressuring the platforms to all adopt. Part of what's funny about the way that Facebook adopts it is that it even includes videos that you just privately share with your friends. Um, and so this what I find to be this just absurd dynamic has emerged where let's imagine that I'm just making a video on Facebook to share with my friends about how my, how my day went, how my trip to see my parents went. Um, and maybe in the background of that video is the latest Gorillaz track featuring Elton John. Um, that before I can publish this video just to share with my friends, I'll get this notification saying that I also have to share this video, this private video about the personal details of my life with Universal so that they can decide not to file a DMCA takedown notice. It's it's such an absurd, like, perversion this exists, of what? This exists now? This, exists, this has existed for like five years. Um, and it's such a perversion of what copyright law is supposed to be about. The idea that this video that I'm only sharing with my 200 friends on Facebook is in any way competing with the official channels by which you'd get the Gorillaz album is just absurd on its face. Putting aside the privacy issues that somehow in order to share this video with my friends, I have to also share it with this major record label. That's crazy. I didn't know that was going on. You know, it seems kind of crazy because they're able to, you know, if they've got AI that can detect exactly what song it is from a fraction of a second of the of the song, you'd think they'd be able to figure out that it was an ephemeral use. It was a background use. You think there would be some way of figuring that out. I don't really think it's a technology issue. I think they want people to go through that to you know, it's all part of the the um, sort of chilling effect that they want to mm -hmm. have in, in this case. I, I just put a, a blog post into the chat specifically about um, the issue of Facebook with the with the private videos. Um, but uh, like like kind of taking taking a step back on that question of why can't the filter recognize it? Um, certainly it can do things like uh, 
like recognize how many seconds of a song is playing with some mistakes because again we've all seen the stories of just the absurd false positives too where like a 10 hour video of white noise uh gets pinged for infringing on 10 different pieces of music it's just silly um but that said you could program a filter with a relative amount of accuracy to recognize things that are definitely not infringing, where it's a few seconds de minimis use, uh, where there's other sound going on, etc. You could also train a filter with pretty good accuracy to recognize if what it's looking at really is a like 100% carbon copy of the original. Um, those two endpoints leave off a whole bunch of space in between, which creates this question of what the platform should do about that space in between. Um, and I guess I'll say also, like, that's, although we're talking about this question in the context of copyright, that's not just inherently a copyright question. Um, many people watching this are probably familiar with uh, FOSTA, which was this, this law ostensibly targeted at human trafficking that wrought a lot of havoc on the internet. Um, these are also questions that come up in the context of uh, things like terrorist content or misinformation. It is very, very, very difficult to program computers to recognize this stuff in a way that understands context, um, in a way that can recognize freedom of speech and fair use. Um, and unfortunately, the, the message that we so often hear from the advocates of a more filtered internet is that the reason why the filters can't do that is because the technologists aren't trying hard enough. Um, you know, you've heard the old joke, nerd harder, um, that where Congress looks at an unsolvable problem, like how to deal with human trafficking or sale of opioids or whatever on the internet and says, clearly the problem here is that the nerds aren't trying hard enough. Yeah. And we know that's bullshit anyway, because they're not even trying to, um, when I was a member of the digital rights management working group in the early two thousands, <laughs> main reason why that whole thing fizzled out was because we insisted that they codify, try to codify fair use into it in such a way in terms of an expert excerpt and you know you can you can enter the length of something and then enter the length of the amount of the clip or you could try to you know there's ways you could try you could try to do it but but they're not even trying the, the point <clears throat> is to have this um sort of this draconian uh, I mean, the private distributions aren't even supposed to be regulated. You should be able to have a private distribution. So if, if Facebook is doing that with a private distribution to you and a couple of friends, that it's basically admitting that Facebook doesn't really have private anything, that everything is a, a public dis distribution and that they consider it to be a public distribution, even if you're just, you know, ta talking to your friends. So it sounds like they're overreaching they're, they're way into fair use territory. They have a whole new generation of kids that doesn't know what fair use is. They think it's normal to not be able to use any of this stuff in any way without paying for it. Mm -hmm. you know, Corey writes his article about unauthorized bread. You're going to have a toaster now that you can't put just any dough into. It has to be a, the authorized type of dough to be able to bake a loaf of bread. I mean, that's really what, what we're heading towards and the point that you make up about how how everything, if everything has a computer in it, then that means that even talking about these technologies now could be a crime under the DMCA. Um, how do we turn the ridiculousness of this around before it inevitably uh, gets worse? That's a good question. And uh, well, I'll say again that we have fortunately made some steps. It is a slow and difficult process, but we've made some steps through the, the uh, 1201 rulemaking process. Um, but then we're also fighting this in court. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we've, we've sued uh, to have DMCA 1201 declared unconstitutional, which we believe it is. Um, I think there's one other thing I'll tack on. Um, you, you mentioned a second ago the importance of 
building in those safety valves for freedom of speech into these enforcement mechanisms, which I wholeheartedly agree with. And when you talk about that, you also need to look at the way that this stuff plays out globally. Um, Danny, who everyone heard from just a minute ago, wrote a really excellent blog post about that exact point, specifically in reference to the YouTube DL case. Uh, you can see it at that same URL I said a second ago, EFF.org slash DRM. Um, but when you look at the way that these circum anti-circumvention laws have been globalized, primarily through trade agreements and other international law instruments, the really, really dangerous combination is when you have uh, the anti-circumvention laws and you have the kind of extreme criminal penalties for copyright infringement in countries that don't have the same kind of safety valves for free expression in countries that don't have an official recognition of fair use. That's a really, really dangerous combination. Um, I sometimes joke that the U.S. is very, very good at outsourcing the worst parts of our copyright law to the world, uh, the extreme criminal penalties and the anti-circumvention laws. We're very bad at outsourcing the best part of our copyright law to the world, which is fair use, um, which, which by its very nature is supposed to be flexible. Um, it's funny, sometime when you're bored, uh, just go on YouTube and search for uh, how to not get your video filtered or something like that. And you'll find so many of these how-tos about if you're using a clip from a movie, use less than 10 seconds of it, or use just a little bit of it so it covers just a third of the screen, uh, or flip it in the other direction. And, like, people are essentially reverse engineering the rules of the content ID filter on YouTube, trying to right. figure out, okay, if you have just this much of the clip, then you're going to outsmart the content ID filter. Trying to trick the robots, which will <laughs> right. only work until the robots figure out what you're doing and write right. the algorithm, right? Yeah. But it's also, it's not how it's supposed to work. It's turning the fair use doctrine, which by its nature is supposed to be flexible, and turning it into this very comically rigid set of rules. Um, I sometimes like saying that fair use isn't supposed to be a fence between what's legal and what's not. It's supposed to be more like a flashlight that you can use to kind of shine the way to new possibilities. Right. Okay, great. Well, um, Elliot, thank you very much. And you, as you mentioned, the, the plot is just starting to thicken in terms of the developments around YouTube DL and things like that. I was, is there any place that we could, um, you know, I always hate the whole like write your congressman thing, but what is the EFF doing right now? Are you collecting? I know a friend of mine had uh, actually Pike and I, he'll be speaking later. He had 4,000 playlist entries deleted from one of his YouTube or a number of his YouTube playlists and they didn't even tell him what it was. Mm -hmm. That's being del deleted, which is particularly frustrating when, okay, you have to delete it. Now, what's all that about anyway, deleting something off a playlist? Was that just because the item itself was deleted and so it comes off the, the playlist? And that, because it seems like, you know, there's a meta effect here. There's the person who, there's all the people who were benefiting from the thing before it was taken down. There's whether the thing or even violates, because when you do these sweeping takedowns, right, it's, it's very unlikely that they've actually looked at each one and made sure, it, you know, it, that it deserved to be taken down. Um, so for so many of us where YouTube is our, our memory, it's how we keep things organized. Um, are, is there any place where we could, you know, write up these experience, talk about our fair use experiences with YouTube or with YouTube DL? Um, uh, is that something that the EFF is collecting or? So a, a couple, a couple of thoughts. One, I'm going to, I'm going to put a link into the YouTube chat right now, which is EFF.org slash takedowns. Um, that's our that's our takedown hall of shame where we collect. Um, it's not by any means exhaustive, um, but these good representative examples of IP infringement kind of run amok on on a lot of the social media platforms. I mentioned earlier the ten hours of static video and that it got 
10 different takedown notices. You can read about that there. You can read about a number of these cases there. Um, and if people have these kind of stories that they want to share with us, then please do. Um, we use those in our rhetoric all the time. We also use them when talking to Congress. We use them in a lot of different places. So if you have submissions to that, let us know. That's number one. Um, number two is specifically for people who use or used YouTube DL for legal purposes, let us know. Um, we are compiling those stories right now. We're, like I said, we're very closely following this case as it plays out. Um, and those will end up being very useful. Um, and then number three, once again, I'll just put in a plug for the, uh, for the uh, DMCA rulemaking that we're putting together our evidence for right now. Um, if you have examples of how you want to be able to modify and repair your own devices but cannot currently, um, then we want to hear those stories too and use them as a part of our evidence to the Copyright Office. Um, now in terms of what I think was kind of your bigger question about uh, what like other sorts of activism opportunities there there are right now in in this world um we're we're at the end of a session of congress so there's not going to be a whole lot happening in congress until january that said i expect that you are going to see some really stupid copyright stuff in congress right away at the beginning of 2021 um so keep your eyes out on the eff site and there will be opportunities to write to your members of congress um, it's probably a little too in the weeds to get into right now, but there is this stupid, for a number of different reasons, idea that keeps coming back in Congress that we need to create some kind of small claims court uh, for copyright infringement that would end up putting ordinary internet users in in a lot of trouble and you know fines of like ten thousand dollars for for doing very simple things like sharing memes online. Um, like I said, we're at the end of a session of Congress now, um, but if and when this gets introduced again next year, we will definitely be talking about it and urging people to call their members of Congress about it. Okay, so it sounds like it, it's about to get worse. It's amazing to me that we're, we're fighting these battles again after fighting them for, you know, almost 20 years now on the internet and after the baby so i mean again i keep coming back to the dancing baby case i mean that took us so long to win that case and now they just do it anyway <laughs> right? so they yeah. have to know they have to know that they lost that case and that what they're doing is erroneous now there are laws against frivolous lawsuits but these these things with these RAAA notices is they don't have to file an actual lawsuit to be able to send a takedown notice. So how, again, I, I got to ask one more time. I mean, how are they able to do these things when they clearly know that their, their claim does not have merit? Um, so, well, a couple of thoughts there. One is you're right. Of course, in many cases they, they do know, um, and often we're talking about uh, DMCA takedowns that are happening just completely automated, um, where Universal has gone in and said, okay, do a takedown for anything that matches the content ID for any of this music uh, in, in our library. Um, you are right that there is a section of the DMCA um, that that specifically has to do with, 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 with uh, punishing abuse of the takedown system by copyright holders. Um, and unfortunately, not very many of those claims end up being successful um, for a lot of reasons that are a little too in the weeds to get into here, I think. Okay, no problem. Well, thank you very much. We're gonna, um, we're gonna wrap it up there. I really appreciate it, Elliot. And thank you very much. And- Thanks a lot, Lisa. I really enjoyed being here again. So, thanks a lot, Elliot. Talk to you soon. Bye bye. All right, and now we're going to go. Our uh, next, we have Mick um, at the Internet Archive, and he's going to tell us about the next generation of the Open Library, which is something that Aaron started um, right after, pretty soon after Creative Commons. It was sort of his next big deal that he did with Brewster at the Internet Archive. And uh, Mick, I'll let you take it from here.
you might you might still be muted we can't hear you mech uh how about now there we go all good all right thank you uh thank you first and and foremost lisa for for setting up this event year after year your tireless work i think you do a great service and one thing i can say is i always feel among friends um when when aaron passed away i feel like many of us felt like we lost a champion and more than anything else aaron swartz day brings back uh not only the spirit but a lot of champions that i look up to it's so so nice to be presenting alongside some of my personal heroes like tracy and corey and danny and brewster uh, so, so thank you uh, yet again, uh, Lisa. Um, uh, so my name is is Mac. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, I have the privilege of helping uh, continue to direct Aaron's Open Library over at the Internet Archives. Uh, today, I'm overjoyed to be joined with my my teammate Drini as well, uh, who will be sharing right after myself. Like Danny O'Brien, my words are my own. I'm not I'm not here today to uh, to represent the Internet Archive. I'm representing myself, but uh, hopefully, I'll I'll get to to show a bunch of of stuff that I get to work on. And of course, this talk is dedicated to Aaron Swartz and uh, my, my dear friend Ilya as well. So this talk is called How to Build a Library in the Matrix, and it's kind of cheekily framed after one of my favorite essays by Aaron of how to be more productive. So if my talk bombs, you can at least click on this link and, and read one of my, my favorite essays. And I only really get one good talk a year, uh, and this year I was asked to give a talk at Hope 2020 and I, I gave a talk specifically on how I ended up at Open Library and the, the influence that Aaron had on my life. So uh, if you happen to like the, the talk that I give today, I do encourage you to uh, learn more about Aaron and, and my journey in, in my talk on doing good enough. Uh, and of course, thank you to everyone who, who paved the way. So in order to understand the present, you really need to understand the, the past. And there are a bunch of problems that exist in the library world. Like, how do we make sure that books get preserved over time? And who actually gets to pick which books are acquired? And how does the whole lending thing work? Uh, is it different online versus in person? Um, how are books discovered by patrons? If there's 20,000 books on animal history, then how do you know which one to choose? Uh, what affordances do people need in order to read a book? Some people have different accessibility needs. The print disabled audience might need uh, something that has a screen reader or people who have dyslexia might require special read aloud affordances. And how can libraries leverage shared infrastructure? It really gets to the, the point of like, what is a book? Is it that, is it that thing that sits on our shelf uh, or is it logically equivalent to some way, uh, in some way to all of these web pages on the internet linked together? So to start our journey, we have to jump back to 1730 uh, in the United States. There were several things that were true. One is that books were really expensive and difficult to produce and distribute. Uh, and this meant that only privileged people could afford books. Not many people had a library in their home, nor was there a library in their uh, general area. And so if libraries did exist, they were not this mainstream thing. They were highly centralized monoliths. Um, and they didn't really coordinate with any sort of catalog system. And so if you did have a library, you were walking to it. You were, you were riding a, a, a horse to it. It was not uh, in your backyard. And uh, Ben Franklin changed this right around 1731 by starting a subscription library. And if you read his autobiography, which is available, you can click this link. Uh, by the way, if you go to mek.fyi slash uh, ASD 2020, you can get to these slides and, and follow along and most of the graphics are clickable and you can go to the, the source material. Uh, but in this book, Ben Franklin's autobiography, uh, Franklin is talking about a Junto group that he runs with all of his close friends. And to his chagrin, every time they change the location of the meeting place, they don't have all of the books that they're referencing. And so they feel like they're in the dark ages, even back then in 1731. So they thought, well, why not uh, create local action and start a proof of concept of a subscription library that's open to the public. And here, one of my, my favorite lines is, these libraries have improved the general conversation of the Americans, made the common tradesmen and farmers as intelligent as most gentlemen from other countries, and perhaps have contributed in some degree to the stand so generally made throughout the colonies in the defense of their privileges. 
I think that's a, a really beautiful quote. This didn't help people in other states. And so we had to wait another 100, 150 years from, for Andrew Carnegie, the, uh, the steel uh, pioneer, to, to come along to create the first Carnegie Library. And over the course of the, the next 20 or so years, there started to emerge over 3,000 different libraries in the United States, half of them funded by Carnegie. And the way that he did it was pretty ingenious. This is one of the reasons it even could happen. So there was this ingenious Carnegie formula where in order to qualify for funding and assistance from Andrew Carnegie's foundation, you had to demonstrate the need for a library. You had to show that you had a building site. You had to pay staff and maintain the library. And you had to have a, a mechanism to draw from public funds so that once it's created, it's not just a few generous donors who are ensuring that the, uh, the program exists. And as we continued down the road, we realized other problems within the physical library, such as uh, because books were hard to produce, oftentimes the library that might be within your horse and buggy distance might not have the book that you care about. And so as early as 1894, I believe interlibrary loans came about so that libraries could share with each other enabling uh, new use cases. And then getting over to the, the late 1960s, there was someone named Frederick uh, uh, Kilgore who helped establish the OCLC project, which originally was the Ohio College Library Center, and then became the, the Computer Library Center. And he was really credited for popularizing the idea of using Dewey Decimal um, and trying to computerize this and enable libraries across the country to exist within a, a network to share their holdings and to coordinate efforts. And so by 2010, the American Library Association estimated that there were more than 100,000 libraries across the United States. And uh, the Museum and Library Services Institute shows that in 2015, more than a billion uh, people visited a public library. A billion people, uh, or were visited a billion times rather, sorry. Uh, but what's surprising is in the same year, 2015, Wikipedia had more than 378 million patrons visit the homepage in just a month. So something was happening here. And Aaron knew what was happening all the way back in 2006. And he saw that for libraries to have a role in the future, they had to go digital. So unfortunately, since the time that OCLC had founded, that was the catalog stuff I was talking about earlier, they had changed pretty drastically around the time that, that Aaron was conceiving of this idea of open library. And the problem was in order to work with OCLC, uh, they required you to sign a waiver that said, you're, if you're a library and you have a catalog of, of all of your books, that you cannot, if you share it and if you work with OCLC, you can't share it with anyone else. And so they had a monopoly on books. It was Amazon, OCLC, and the community just couldn't create projects that would leverage an, an open book ecosystem. And Aaron took arms and started writing uh, a petition and essays and coordinating with OCLC and turning up the heat. And in addition to foreseeing these challenges, he also saw a lot of opportunities, such as the need for open metadata. Uh, the, the value of having linked data and breaking books from their silos and connecting them in useful ways. So uh, if you have a book and it mentions a citation, but you have some shred of hope of finding the other book that it's talking about. And of course, teamwork. Uh, the way that we really survive into the future is by getting people to work together, by working on things like wikis. That's, that's how Wikipedia has come so successful. And just sharing our efforts and time. We want to be in it together. So uh, someone please do speak up if the audio doesn't work on this, but this is one of my, my favorite sliced clips from, from Aaron. Today I'm gonna talk to you about the Open Library Project. So way back in January this year, we brought together a bunch of librarians, programmers, book lovers, all sorts of people to meet at these offices, the Internet Archive up in the Presidio in San Francisco. And what they wanted was a way of digitizing a library, a way of putting catalog records up on the internet and that was something I was really interested in, too. Um, I love libraries. You know, I'm the kind of person who goes to a new city and immediately seeks out the library. My face lights up when I see a library. I was just thrilled by it. And what really interested me was the question this project faced was, what does an online library look like? 
how do we take these institutions and move them into a world that's digital, that's online, that's on the web? Uh, today I'm going to talk to you sorry. about. Let me. So today we have OpenLibrary.org, uh, which we like to think of as the world's library catalog. It's a little bit like Goodreads, where you have more than 20 million books that you can mark as, oh, I want to read or I've already read it. And we have an additional 5 million books that you can read or borrow directly from your browser. This is not a paid service. It's nonprofit run by the Internet Archive. It's uh, free and also open source. Um, we have a, a program which allows people to contribute to which books end up in our uh, controlled digital lending library. And finally, it's a wiki. So if there's something wrong with the data, anyone can feel empowered to use it or contribute and fix it. Uh, so the Internet Archive processes around 50,000 books a month. And when you borrow a book, uh, you're borrowing one of the books that is in the warehouses there. So one of the reasons Open Library has been so successful is because it has an enormous and dedicated community of volunteers, everything from librarians to designers to project managers uh, to people working on data engineering. And we're really grateful to, uh, to be working with this community. And you can volunteer as well. Uh, so one of the reasons we knew what to do uh, next is that Aaron left really good breadcrumbs. There's a wonderful uh, video from the Berkman Center where he spends an hour detailing all of the things that haven't been built that he still wants to see. And they really lean upon these four main things, being open, having good teamwork, using the web, and having a linked data. And so I'm going to skip that for now. So one of the big first challenges that we undertook when we were taking over the, the responsibility of running the open library was, was trying to make it, uh, to take it away from being a monopoly and instead making it democratic. So traditionally, only libraries get to choose which books represent its people. And we thought that a library is something that people should work together to build. Everyone's library should represent them. And so we, we started the book sponsorship program, which allows folks in the community to contribute books that they feel represent them. And uh, both Jessica, my colleague at the Internet Archive, and myself have both digitized uh, books that are from family members, one on the Patterson Silk Mills and one uh, by uh, Jessica's mother-in-law. So we also saw opportunities to get up to parity, up to speed with, with what can be done on the web. So if you have a library that looks like this, how do you find all of the books that contain URLs? Are you going to look through them manually? Probably not. And so thanks to the work of GEO over at the Internet Archive, we have a full text search uh, offering where you can look for HTTP and see that there are uh, 900,000 books on the Internet Archive accessible through the open library uh, that contain URLs. And since then, we've worked on all sorts of, of uh, cool augmentations, such as an audiobook reader, which uh, uses Google's high quality text to speech to read things in the browser. Uh, Giacomo helped us implement text selection for uh, for public domain materials. And in fact, we're trying to, to add clicking functionality as well, kind of like a web page. So if there's a link, you can just click and it'll bring it open. Of course, search inside. And thanks to the, the product team, uh, Jim Shelton and others who, who worked so hard to, to pull this together. Uh, we have a bot called BorrowBot on Twitter, which lets you just reply to an Amazon URL or post an ISBN, and it should let you know whether that book is available to borrow. And so if you're interested in working on the Open Library project, please do click this link uh, and, and get in touch with me or any of my teammates, and we would be happy to work with you. So the real question is, now that we've caught up to present day, how do libraries survive the jump to digital? And the problem that libraries face today is they don't have the funding to get a software engineer. Uh, they, many of them don't even know what to do if they were to, to uh, have a software engineer on their team. And how do you digitize the books themselves? How do you go from the, the model of brick and mortar libraries to a landscape online? The books have to get onto the computer somehow. And what about design, coordinating between libraries, policy questions, and not to mention risks uh, the libraries only have so much money and they're very risk averse this is fine because every united states library taxpayer just funds uh, for libraries to work with a japanese uh, for-profit called rakuten which runs overdrive you might have heard of libby and they're a monopoly uh, and you can use their their service which charges libraries for the same book every year over and over again forever until libraries can no longer offer less popular books 
because they don't have enough money to release them and it isn't uh, uh, to release them uh, and it isn't cost effective anymore, uh, which really isn't fine. And so in order for libraries to to secure their future, we have to stop thinking about where libraries are today. Most of them aren't digital yet and think about where the puck is going to be. And there's a huge flourishing ecosystem of programs. There's the Open Libraries program run by Chris Freeland, which is an effort to get libraries across the United States to work together and to, to share and combine their holdings so that we can create some sort of national library uh, a program for, for controlled digital lending. Uh, and there's all sorts of protocols which, which help uh, libraries and, and vendors in the space work together. The first rule is if you're going to work with, with something or someone, you need to have a common language. And in this case, I'm not talking about Chinese versus English, although uh, internationalization and, and being accessible to different audiences is important. In this case, I mean computer languages. And so there's one group out there that's working on a protocol called IIIF, and their goal is that any institution should be able to deliver images in the same way and work with each other's assets to any user on the web. And so what that ends up looking like is uh, different organizations might have different images on different machines, but because of this protocol, they all speak a common language and they're able to do things like take two resources that might otherwise only be at two different rare libraries across different areas of the world. Usually you have to fly there into a special room and look at a collection. And this allows you to do something that would be impossible otherwise, because a lot of times the materials can't leave the room. And so here you get to look at two rare manuscripts side by side. And there's another demo, which uh, I don't think I have time for right now, but it's an Otto Ege uh, uh, demo. He was a biblioclast that would cut up books because uh, the individual pages earned you more money to sell than, than trying to sell the whole book. And there's an example of this triple IF protocol being used to pull together an Otto Ege book that had been cut and distributed to over 17 different libraries. And that's something that would just be impossible without these technologies. The Internet Archive runs a, a similar program uh, called OPDS within, it's like a syndication uh, book API within their ecosystem. And the OPDS service allows us to participate in a whole network of different libraries that each have their own feeds. They all speak the same language. And as a result, they can all be used by the same application. You can choose which library to, to display books for and then borrow them or learn about them. And so this really boils down to the, the teamwork aspect of when libraries work in an, e an open ecosystem and work together, then we can start building shared infrastructure and today, more than 281 libraries are working together and have this different protocol um, implemented. And they all work in the New York Public Library Simply E app. Uh, and, and by now, Andrew Carnegie, who, who developed his ingenious system, was saying, I see what you did there. So we did it, right? Uh, sorry, kid, not exactly. We, we still have a lot of challenges. Most libraries are still not digital. Monopolies are a thing, they're real. There's a lot of open policy questions, as you've probably heard in the news. Um, getting books digital within itself is a challenge, and coordinating libraries is very hard. And of course, there's this. Uh, libraries don't live forever. Uh, they can be destroyed. And I I'm sad to say at one point, um, the picture on the right here is the annex of the Internet Archive of all places catching fire. Um, and fortunately, because the Internet Archive has all sorts of, of RAID infrastructure, uh, they were able to ensure that lots of copies keep st uh, stuff safe. And so no data in that case was, was lost. And it makes us think that as we move forward, we're going to have to explore not only digital preservation strategies like RAID, but also decentralization, federation, um, et cetera and distributed content such as IPFS or DAT or secure Scuttlebutt in order to make sure that uh, that we live in the future. And there's a wonderful project that Mouse worked on called Bookworm, which uses open libraries data and is a first stab at decentralizing it. So finally, we're, we're looking forward into what does it mean to be a library in the matrix? And so if we take the, the red pill here, um, a book is kind of an arbitrary artifact. It has a front cover and a back cover, but in reality, 
there's just a, a stream of information. And, and the fact that they are siloed is just an artifact of our physical world. And so how do we take books out of that context and create a post-scarcity world where everyone has access to learning material? Uh, and, and what interesting use cases can we support? So uh, Carl Sagan has another great quote. If I finish a book a week, I will read only a few thousand books in my lifetime, about a tenth of a percent of the contents of the greatest libraries of our time. The trick is to know which books to read. If you go on Amazon, there are 30,000 books on calculus, and there's no way that we can manually go through all that content. So how do we turn a pile of books into something structured where we can make decisions together? And one way is in 2003, there was this wonderful project called the Book Genome Project, which unfortunately got acquired by uh, Apple and is no longer around. But they took it upon themselves to follow Pandora, the, the Music Genomes Project, and do the same thing for books, to try to process the books using computers and, and try to glean insights such as what are these books about? Uh, what are the, the storylines? What topics do they cover? What are the characters like? And when they shut down, the Internet Archive decided that maybe we could do something similar with the community and determine reading level, pace, identify terms, generate summaries, and make books more connected and useful to the community. And so a group of volunteers uh, worked on this new thing called the, the Open Book Genome Project. There's a white paper, there's some open source code, and the idea is to create a pipeline that anyone in the world can contribute to that will run against the Internet Archive's books, and everything will still run within controlled digital lending in a protected way, but we'll be able to surface new analytics and make them publicly accessible and available for the ecosystem use. Uh, there was a, a wonderful s service online called Storygraph, which is taking a different approach of having people provide their own interpretations of how to tag books, such as this book was informative or this was reflective. And thanks to, to James Champ and our community, um, we have a, a project that loosely resembles that as well, which we'll be rolling out in the next few weeks. And then, of course, uh, Lauren and others uh, within our, our community are working on this new website of moving away from star ratings, which are really hard to determine is someone just rating something three stars because it took too long to, to deliver from Amazon? Well, there's a less wrong article, which I love, that, that suggests what if the only way you could give a book recommendation is if you've read two other books on the same topic? Then you really, instead of just having a point, you can create a line and you have a, a derivative and you understand how these books are related and why one got uh, voted as better than another. And so between all of these projects, uh, we've we've created new opportunities to move into uh, a type of world where you can start connecting books up in really novel ways. So here's a, a timeline of all of the Greek classics, and you could choose one of them, such as Rene Descartes. Uh, something that's special about Rene Descartes' book, The Geometry, is within his treatise, he references a, a picture directly from a proposition of Euclid's elements. And here, uh, using linked data and things like IIIF and, and web annotations, we're able to link them up and just at the speed of thought, uh, open both of them up side by side and have this source material in front of us. Okay. So as a recap, Open Library, best book on the Book Genome Project. We would love your help and I would love to um, Maybe we can save questions until, until after Drini takes us into the matrix and, and shows off some, some work that, that he's been doing. And thank you so much for, for your time. Okay, great. And take it away, Drini. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you great. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, let me uh, try to sh share here. Uh, uh, share entire screen allow all right can you see my screen <laughs> yes we can perfect okay so i'm going to be talking about library explorer which is a project we've been working on uh, at open library that tries to bring physical libraries uh, into your browser essentially so one of the things that uh, we found difficult with finding books on open library or on websites like it is that it's hard to sort of discover not only books but uh, fields of knowledge which you might not have information on so websites like youtube or netflix try to solve this with algorithms that suggest books to you but even those don't really let you move outside of your knowledge bubble because they're based on what videos that you've already seen so one of the 
techniques we're trying here is using an old technology, so classification systems. Uh, here's an example of the Library of Con Congress classification. Uh, and it's fascinating to see how much information is embedded in these tiny little numbers. So we're wondering if we could use this information about the subject matter of a book to create an experience that's more like a physical library and that pays homage to how physical libraries work to let users discover books sort of without limitations. Uh, so this is Library Explorer, and I'll jump right into it. Uh, so the way you navigate Library Explorer is through two dimensions. So moving left and right uh, lets you look through sibling subjects. So for example, science, technology, arts and recreation, these are all siblings of one another. Moving down lets you look through children. So under arts and recreation, we see that there's general arts, area planning, architecture, and so on. The next way that you can navigate is by using these little arrow icons on the side here. So if you're very interested in, let's say, sculpture, uh, and you want to see more books about it, you can go in and see the first child of that node, which is sculpture and related arts. The next child is processes, forms, let's give that a retry, processes, forms, subjects, and so on, and so on. There's also an index option here, so you can view the list of the subclasses of sculpture and jump to a specific one. If you're really interested in sculpture and you want to see all the categories at the same time, you can click this little expansion icon, which basically converts this row into an entire bookcase. And you've, based, you've kind of stepped one level deeper into the classification tree. So here under sculpture, we have now all of those uh, children that we were looking at in that sort of micro view now each have their own dedicated shelf uh, here. And because we're we were in the arts bookcase initially, we still the siblings have changed. So now sculpture has as its sibling architecture. Because if you're interested in sculpture, you might want books about architecture, and you're in essentially the arts room is the way we're thinking about it. And we can go back by clicking the little go up button here. One of the features that this enables, which is kind of interesting, is the ability to apply a filter to your entire library. So up to now, we have sort of parity with what physical libraries let you do. But we aren't in a physical library. We are on a digital library, and we can completely transform this library and filter it. So right now, we're looking at modern books, which have an ebook or a preview on the Internet Archive. But we can, for example, turn on the juvenile filter, and this will inside that same structure with all the same interaction rules as before show us only books that are labeled as juve as for children let me reset that here and because these books are all on open library you can apply any filter you want so if you want for example biographies you can do subject biography and same thing now you have biographies throughout the entire library across all the different sections Right, let me clear that. And then the next thing I wanted to share here is some of the uh, sort of nicer settings. So right now we're viewing the library using Dewey Decimal. Uh, we also have an option to view it uh, using Library of Congress. This just applies, and you can see the numbers have changed down here. Uh, and now you, you have that uh, option. And then one of the more fun options is changing the style of the, of the library. So we can change the books to be these little 3D cuboid forms, if you're feeling nostalgic. Uh, and as you can tell, the books uh, change size because we're fetching the length of the book from open library. So the thickness of the cube is proportional to the actual length of the book. And something else I like to demo is if you're feeling nostalgic for a physical library, uh, zooming out on this page a few times, and as the books lazy load in, <laughs> you'll see that it starts to look kind of like a physical library uh, you might be familiar with, although not particularly useful from this scale, but a little nice to look at, seeing everything come in. Uh, so some of the things we're hoping to do in the future with this is uh, increase the classification depth. So right now you can only navigate three levels, but we have more data than that, so just sort of making that possible. Uh, the ability to view books in order so right now we're sort of grouping them by the classification, but being able to also view them in order, which again, the AP, our uh, 
search engine supports now, but we just haven't enabled in the UX. Uh, classification nodes as open library entities. This is a really exciting proposal. So that would basically involve, let me just reset the zoom here. Uh, this would basically involve, for example, setting the fact, uh, giving the 600s, which are about technology, their own open library entity. So then we could cross link that, uh, as Mike was speaking about linked data, uh, with, for example, the Wikidata ID or the Wikipedia page, and then be able to find books based on a Wikipedia page and vice versa, which would be very exciting. Uh, more open library integrations. So if you're, for example, looking at a book on the regular open library interface, having an option that lets you jump to that book on the shelf, which would be fun. Uh, some more usability improvements. So having a breadcrumb, uh, breadcrumb view, which is very common for these sort of tree navigation uh, techniques uh, and a list of all the subjects or a tree view, so you, tree view, so you can quickly find a shelf and an option to jump into a book. So being able to click on a book and be taken straight to the Internet Archive preview of that book and being able to borrow it straight from this view. Currently clicking on a book will take you to open library where you can click the read or borrow button. There we go. So uh, that's the demo. Thank you. Uh, the link for this, if you want to try it, is openlibrary.org slash explore. Uh, and we'd also love it if you want to give feedback. So here we have a Google Forms feedback form if you just want to give free form feedback and a little share on Twitter icon if you want to help get the word out. We are still calling this in beta, so there will be bugs. Um, but try it out and have fun. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you to, I forgot to do thank yous. Thank you to Meg for uh, inviting me to speak here and Lisa for organizing. And that's all for okay. me. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Jeannie. Really appreciate it. And it's really nice to have something working. We know it's a beta, but um, it's really nice to uh, be able to see things moving along and, um, and that people can submit information, can submit feedback to us and we'll be sure to get it to you. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, my camera's off. Damn it. Hate it when that happens. Thank you very much um, for, for you guys. And um, we'll keep us posted. And we love it coming back and finding out more about Open Library. Uh, it's just a really important thing, a really important thing that exists. And really appreciate getting the updates every year. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Our next talk is. Uh, our next talk is Ryan Sterlnick, who's going to let us know about privacy and security in the XR future, which is um, right now, it's sort of a, um, uh, oh, wait, I guess he's coming on. Wait, it does suck. Yeah, you can take your mask off too, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Wait, it, uh, so uh, last year, Ryan, I'll just give a little background. Last year, Ryan talked about um, virtual reality and was sort of giving an update just on the technology side of things. And um, I think Facebook may have been still assuring us that they weren't going to require an account. Yeah. I can't remember. Um, but basically, things have gotten to the point now where uh, we're a little bit at their mercy in terms of if we want to use the headset, there's things that we have to do now. Um, and it just is taking sort of the anonymous features that we like to have over anything happening over the web, taking it right out of VR. And so what would it look like? What do, would good security and privacy look like in VR if it were to exist? And that's what Ryan is going to explain to us. Yep. I am did double checking that everything's still working and um, need to get my camera working again. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Present. And do, do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm switching cameras. Oh. Uh, Are you at Noise Bridge? 
Yeah. Right. So Ryan is is uh, broadcasting from Noisebridge right now. Noisebridge is a hacker space in San Francisco that Aaron writes about when he did the afterword for Corey's um, Homeland book. And um, it's a wonderful hacker space that is responsible for all the work I was able to get done on the Virtual Reality Museum. And it's, um, it's it can be a model there we go. for a, a lot of community projects. And that's why um, I was very excited uh, to be learning from there and working from there for the VR Museum. Okay, you ready to go? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Shoot. And okay. We'll just, we'll just yeah, about 20 minutes is good because we are wrapping up. We've got two more speakers after yep. you. Okay. okay, you guys can see the presentation and everything? Yes, we can see the presentation. So ladies cool. and gentlemen, I give you Ryan Sternlich. Hello, I'm Ryan Sternlich. I am raised in San Francisco. I often do research and development on a number of different projects around the Bay Area. I also have been helping Lisa with the Schwartz Manning VR Funhouse and have been trying to help do a lot more in the community with regards to sharing information and the knowledge I have because I, I like to research a lot. So I generally want to share anything I learn. And this talk is something I threw together pretty recently, but me and Lisa and a couple other people have talked about for years, which in privacy and security in VR, AR, and XR extended reality in general. And we have a lot of issues right now, but also a lot of solutions and a lot of possibilities on where we can go with all this. And I first want to quickly mention why this matters right now, which is that right now everything is changing. We're pretty much at the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution. And this revolution has a lot to do with you as a piece of data. Every person has a massive amount of data connected to them. And a lot of it, the user is not in control of. The companies are in control of a lot of that data and with extended reality, it gets even more dangerous because of how much that data tells you about yourself and intrinsic things to your identity that is often not able to be found in traditional data techniques um, on the web or on social media. So. The current issues, the most well-known right now is the Oculus problem that started about three months ago when Facebook changed their security requirements to make sure you have to have a Facebook account to log into a new Oculus device and any old Oculus accounts will be unusable at the end of 2023. And this has a couple good and bad points. They can monitor certain things and more easily delete accounts of people who are trying to act and whatnot. But that's just a very surface level thing because it also lowers the amount of privacy a person has in virtual reality, which is very dangerous. I'll explain in a minute. So Facebook accounts must be a real identity. You have to use your real name. And right now, when 
accounts have been accidentally banned consistently recently for Oculus devices when they're being set up. And to uh, get those reinstated, you literally have to send in a real ID of some sort. Um, some people have used birth certificates. Some people have used their driver's license. It's literally giving Facebook your government issued ID, which I and who knows if they delete that later on. There's a lot of issues with forcing people on social media to use their real identities. And there's also issues if those identities actually match that person. Um, there, uh, the reason this can be dangerous often is because there's a number of possible ways that these devices can be hacked. One of the most well-known hacks or tests of a hack that got patched was last summer big screen beta had a hack called Man in the Room where a third party could literally capture anything you're seeing in the big screen and it can access the web and download malicious info onto your computer, including worms and all forms of malware because they big screen accidentally left a vulnerability in their when they built their system exposed, which they had to patch, um, and now is being heavily warned about in general not to use this specific permission. Um, another thing that has been talked about many times is most of these headsets have cameras. I have a five right here and it has a camera on it this camera isn't used in that many apps but if you have a quest or a quest 2 you have four cameras that are always 3d scanning your surroundings and those data sets are saved on device and facebook's terms of service says that certain things can be sent to Facebook and HTC has similar issues. Um, but a lot of this, even if the companies are good, we still have the problem of developer trust. We have to trust that the people developing the apps are not going to use the data they can acquire maliciously. So these pretty much VR apps right now are pretty unregulated. The code isn't scrutinized all that well sometimes, which means you could publish a straight up malware game that will be able to track your movement, scan your room or wherever you play it could identify your voice there's all these things that these headsets have on them that and once eye tracking and biosensing become more common they will have a treasure trove of bio data and data of your life and where you live that theoretically could be used either on purpose or by accident by third parties or be hacked and taken from a game, especially games that allow mods. So I would not be surprised if it, a researcher was to create a Skyrim VR or Fallout 4 VR or Beat Saber mod that allowed them to collect the tracking info of you playing and
And recently, Stanford showed that just based on your movement data, you can be identified. So if they can get around five minutes of movement data and then look at just any other movement data, even de-anonymized movement data, that can be linked to you. It ha They only did a sample size of 500, but it is pretty amazing how accurate it, your, our bodies are in terms of being unique. We all have different movement methods and either idiosyncrasies and this can be exploited. So the main future issue with all this will be bio tracking. Eye tracking, heart rate, EG, EMG, full body motion capture. These things are have been shown in a number of scientific research studies that they are useful for medical level research in predicting certain things. And they also can tell certain things about you that even your doctors would not know. And now this data is going to be in the hands of Facebook, Google, HTC, Sony, Microsoft, Every major tech company that does VR, AR, or XR will be able to gather data that is generally considered private and is held at a like security level that even most people can't access their own data all that easily. And that's kind of scary to, to think about. And there's a lot of ways that can be used for targeting. Like Cory Doctorow said, targeting, it can be used for good or bad. Like if it's good, the targeting could literally tell you, hey, you're going to have a stroke in five hours. Go to the hospital. Or, oh, you have this eye condition that will show up in three years. You should get it checked out early, or you have, there's so many things VR and AR are currently being tested to see if they can predict or help with in terms of how our bodies work. And that's really cool. But on the other side, eye tracking data is pretty much the most valuable data for advertisers out there. It can tell so, and movement is a close second, but eye tracking can tell exactly what interests you and how long you are engaged with things. There's a reason why Toby eye tracking sells the glasses that allow people to watch or read stuff, and it looks at what they're reading and their eyes. Those headsets cost between uh, ten and thirty thousand dollars, and ad agencies buy a ton of them because they want to see exactly how people react to stuff. And if you combine that with EG or heart rate, you then start to have your body become a part of this too. Are you excited? Are you scared? Are you aroused? There are so many different things that this data, when put all together, can do. It can do good or bad. And we generally want it to do good. So there are a lot of things we'd have to do to get this right. High level anonymity for the data and for the user is going to be an important one. You should not need to tie this to your real identity. You should be able to air gap your VR avatar and character 
from you such that there is a um, lower chance of things being correlated to you yourself. There are times this won't always work, and there are ways of giving researchers or giving companies de-anonymized data that has been changed in such a way that it can't identify you. Movement data is still being researched a lot about what it can and can't predict about a person and how hard or easy it is to de-anonymize, but we've had eye risk scanning and eye tracking in different things in governments for years, and they know that there are ways to de-anonymize my uh, to anonymize different parts of the tracking data and what you are seeing and get rid of any chance that you can be identified for from some of that data but we do want this data to find its way to medical and scientific researchers because of how important this is for medical research but there are going to have to be a lot of developments in terms of making sure the data is anonymous. Another important thing is the user should own the data, not the company. This could be kind hard to implement, but uh, if you create these devices with a plan that the data is hosted locally and you choose when to send stuff, then you will have more control over how it's used and how far reaching that data can go. And another thing is transparency. We need to know exactly how this stuff is being used and also exactly how it is being developed, including from the developer side, from the user side, when they select different permissions, and from the software or hardware side. And also, this means we can do more stuff offline, which is important because a lot of these systems do not need to be hosted in the cloud. There's a lot of algorithms that can be run on normal GPUs, and we should do that. Might not be as fast as going to IBM Watson or whatnot, but it's safer. And opt-in over opt-out, I already talked about a bit. And just to finish up, you have a virtual identity. And it's important that you are able to identify with it and it is yours, not the big companies. And this can matter a lot in the future. On the bad spectrum of possibilities are things like a snow crash scenario where, pe where a hack into one of these headsets can actually kill someone if it knows that how that person reacts to certain things, whether it's sound, light, or any number of things. And that it it's very close to being possible to do this. So we need to keep it from happening. And we also need to keep companies in check. Thank you very much. I will post my research I did on my website soon. And I am in Darren Schwartz Day Discord. I'll, I am generally available to talk with people because I talk a lot and I love hearing what other people have to say. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Ryan. And yeah, Ryan will be around on our weekly meetings and he's very reachable. Um, 
We like, especially with the VR information, we love user data from people. So if you go to try to use the VR museum and you have issues, please let us know your issues. We can help you figure it out. And then we get our hands on your, on your use case and can understand as actually people try to use stuff, what's going on. Um, so we're going to have just two more speakers now, and I'm really excited actually about these last couple of speakers. It's really exciting. Um, Freddie Martinez, um, who is at the Open Policy um, Project, uh, is going to talk to us about Clearview AI, who are just this caricature of, um, of creepy people at a creepy company doing creepy things. And it's yeah. not even, it's not, even, it's not like a, an overstatement or anything like that. It's, it's um, sad but true kind of thing. And Freddie is going to explain it all to us, how he figured it out. And hopefully maybe what we can do to take steps to protect ourselves against these people. Freddie. Uh, how's my audio, Lisa? You or and everyone great. on the yeah, chat? Yeah, you sound great. We're great. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, and then I also need to project my slides. Give me one minute here. Um, I used to use Jitsi a lot and now I don't. Um, and so now I'm just trying to figure out how it all looks. Um, sure. Did you hit click the little share screen? No, no, yeah. I know. I'm trying to figure out which one it was. Ah, okay. They changed it. They like, changed it like a lot in the last two years. Let me see. They um, have, right. So you have to actually pick what window you want out of every okay. window yeah. that's open in any application. Um, computers, how do they work? <laughs> the files are inside of the computers. Um, let me see. It's little hamsters on little, little. Uh-huh. 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 <laughs> Wait, hold on. I like seriously can't figure figure out how to how to broadcast my screen. So hold screen, on a second. The screen share is lower left. Lower Bottom left, left. My little hand. Yeah, the lower left. The middle one is Oh it's the hand. Is it's, it's a hand or the, the hand. Okay, okay. Ah, I got it, 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 I got it. Yeah. Got it, got it. Uh, oh, all right. Are are we seeing this? Okay, are good. We? I think we are. Okay, yeah. perfect. Perfect. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for all the assistance on that. Um, and thank you, Lisa, and thank you, everyone, for organizing Aaron Schwartz today. It's so good to be back. Um, this is my favorite event of the year. So thank you, everyone. Um, and uh, in particular, I, I wanted to talk about Clearview AI um, because I think a lot of um, when we talk about surveillance, when we're talking about these very, very horrible companies and groups, uh, we sort of, I, I feel like it feels a little bit detached, right? Like, like what I always tell everyone is that I, I feel like I'm a fairly smart individual, but I'm uh, not I'm not special, right? I, I feel like what I talk about when I research surveillance, um, I can talk about my research methodology, but like what I do is not unique or special. And, and w the reason for creating this talk is because like Clearview AI was one of the worst surveillance companies that I've ever discovered in my entire life. But I thought that it would be interesting to talk about how we learned how awful this company was um, in order for, for everyone to realize that, that what we do is not, um, it's, it, it, it's not unique, you know, like what I do uh, as a researcher is very approachable and that anyone else in the world can sort of do this kind of work. Um, and so that's kind of was the motivation for this talk. Um, and so that that's really why I'm happy to be at our shorts today. Um, and just for a little bit more background about myself, I am a policy analyst at a group called Open the Government. Um, and so what we do is we sort of try to promote transparency on all levels of government, um, especially on the government level side. So we do everything from 
uh, dealing with national security over classification to FOIA reform. Um, and, and really what we do is just sort of try to figure out, like, you know, be the center of organizing for, you know, hundreds of groups. Um, so we have about 110, 112 partners uh, that we organize in all of these issue areas. So, so again, everything from national security to uh, FOIA reform, and and I work there as a policy analyst. That's kind of how I came to be um, to understand Clearview, um, and so even for a little bit even more background. Um, half of all Americans are in some kind of facial recognition database. Um, mostly if you like ever get a license, like you are automatically enrolled into uh, the FBI's facial recognition database. Most people don't know this, but but that's at least half of all Americans. Um, and, and a lot of this stuff is being bought and sold in secret and that raises a lot of concerns. The other, the other thing about facial recognition that I think we should talk about is that, like, not only are there very, very strong demographic effects. So, for example, if you're a woman, if you're black or brown, uh, it's less accurate on your face. Um, so, the, so people obviously have a lot of concerns about these kinds of technologies. But I also think that it, the opposite is also true, that even if facial recognition was 100% accurate on black and brown bodies, we would also still have the same problems. Because, like, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I don't want to be picked out of a crowd as black or as a brown person, like, 100% of the time with zero uh you know problems of accuracy, and so so there's like all these problems with facial recognition. Um, accuracy is one of them, but also like this strong demographic bias and strong use of it by law enforcement in particular means that this is a technology that we should not rely on. Um, and so so yeah, so facial recognition is is a very problematic technology. Um, and in particular, where what I have done at Open the Government is that we talk to members of Congress, we talk to staffers, we try to get them to understand the issues. Um, we've long supported a moratorium on the use of facial recognition technology. And then the other thing is that, like, for people who have seen me at previous Aaron Schwartz days, um, you know, I'm a technologist, and and I think it's very important for people who are in our space to you know uh try to get involved with 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 members of congress try to get on the hill try try to really bridge that gap because um the research that i did was not particular or that unique but being a technologist really did help inform that work and it was it really did help um so i think it's very important for all of us technologists to to try to you know, expand that 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 space that we take. Um, so, so I think that's a very important. Um, I, w if you take one thing away from this entire conversation, it's that like technologists do need to be involved um, and need to be working more closely with these specific areas. Um, so, um, how did we get here? Uh, so when I joined Open the Government, you know, we began, uh, you know, I'm an expert in public records laws, I'm an expert in police surveillance, um, I'm not an expert, I was not an expert on public policy, and so what happened is, like, what well, I joined this, this group and, and I said, well, how do I get involved, and one of the first things we did was created a guide for how do you use public records laws to find police surveillance in your own backyard. And we've particularly focused on facial recognition technology. Uh, we partnered with a group, uh, Muckrock, who I, I think we all know um, are, are great partners of Aaron Schwartz Day. And so we created a guide and we sent out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of FOIAs, or maybe 150 FOIAs. And um, you know, Muckrock is a great partner. They 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 are one of the leading public records uh, laws, like like organizations that that really do try to help people understand what's happening around the world or around the country. Um, and so they're just like a natural fit for the kind of work that 
uh, I had been doing, and, and they're just a great organization overall. Um, and I guess I guess the first major hit that we hit upon was Atlanta police. Um, they had been ignoring us for I think two or three months, and every time that I would contact them, they would send me to a new person. And I think at one point I talked to their chief of police, and they just spent a lot of time like sort of ping ponging me around. And at one point, I just got kind of sick of it. And I just said, like, yo, where are my records? Where are my records? Where are my records? And actually, like, the tip of the iceberg was Atlanta Police Department. Um, and it became kind of an interesting thing after the fact that, that, like, I was exercising my right as an individual to get my records. But also, um, if I didn't do that, then I'm, we might have missed the entire story. And so I guess another takeaway is that like, as individuals, as humans, we need to be exercising our right because if we don't, then we're going to miss out on these extremely important stories that have really deep consequences. Um, in particular, uh, you know, Atlanta police started giving us these emails. One of them was like, this software costs two thousand dollars a month, which was very weird. Um, facial recognition licenses cost usually in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I see two thousand dollars a month a year, and and I know that there's something weird happening here. Um, so that was one of the first sort of red flags. Um, another one is that they claim that like uh, you could do unlimited searches using their technology, um, and then this one, like just putting it all together, is that like I, we knew that it was a very cheap tool. Uh, they claim that you could do unlimited searches, um, so which means you could search as many things as you wanted, and then really like the thing that. I guess set it all off for us was that they had produced to us this legal analysis um, that was was kind of on the level of of um, the the white paper that they gave us in these public records. Um, what was like like if I thought that the, that the you know two thousand dollars a month was red flag, this is like sort of setting the you know up on fire type of thing and and I just want to talk about it very briefly here um, first of all uh, it's very rare that police departments give you their interactions with their lawyers they had mentioned that it was legally uh, privileged um, and so that was very very strange and then in particular like you know, I try to break it down a little bit. Um, I, I talked to some friends who are lawyers. I um, and they, you know, said, "Hey, look at this. Look at that." Um, and, and I think, you know, for me as a technologist, like I don't. I mean, I know who Kirkland and Ellis is, but I don't know who all of these individuals named in the documents were. I think it's important to just be able to find you know, legal experts, uh, technical experts, like, like you have to, when you're confused about these things, you just have to like try to find your people, you know? And I ha I was thankful to have a friend who read through these documents and said, hey, this is attorney client privilege and they gave it to you and that's weird. But also check out all of these other things. First of all, Kirkland Ellis is, is I think the second largest law firm in the U.S. Um, their client here uh, underlined is Clearview AI. Uh, the person who signed the document was Paul Clement, who was so Solicitor General under George W. Bush. So imagine if it, this is like James Cuomo or Eric Holder who's signing one of these documents that, that some facial recognition company had asked them to produce. Um, and then they, they talk about like legal applications of the technology and they also talk about that uh, these documents are user uploaded images of faces and publicly available images. 
They also claim that state and local biometric privacy laws don't apply to them, uh, which again is very interesting. Um, and they also claim that uh, these documents include billions of publicly available images. So, so reading that 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 one sort of very short policy memo, that the legal memo, um, is just throwing up all of these flags that I'm like, we actually need to investigate who these people are, like what's happening here, because this is something that's quite bizarre, quite unheard of. Um, and reading it more closely, we saw that Cleary was collecting images off of social media. And what they would do is, is something quite bizarre is that they would sort of capture your face they would do their facial recognition and they would say like well i think this image of freddie kind of looks like this previous photo that we had found on the internet um and this is his instagram page or this is his linkedin profile or this is his WhatsApp profile. And so really what like LinkedIn is doing is that like they're basically ignoring every single kind of privacy law that exists in the US or in the States and creating these profiles of, of people over long periods of times. And, and, and like imagine that you're a woman walking down the street and and someone takes a photo of you and and then they're able to discover your like linkedin profile your GitHub profile um and so I, I i don't really like to think of them as a facial recognition company but uh, what i do think that they are is it's a mass surveillance company um and so what i think i do is a really kind of like this is this is a privacy violation on a level that I think most of us couldn't even fathom, you know, maybe four or five years ago. And so I don't like to talk to them. About, uh, don't I don't describe them as a facial recognition company. I talk about them as a mass surveillance company, and I think that that's the proper way to be describing it. Um, okay, so. The other thing that's important to talk about this is that they claim that if you put a photo on the internet ever, and like let's say I put it on my LinkedIn and then I made that LinkedIn private, that I can't sort of take back that kind of privacy, um, which is a very interesting way to think about consent. And like, and I think that that's also extremely problematic. It's like this idea that like if I ever venture into public, then therefore everything I've ever done um, as an individual should be public. Um, I, it's a very bizarre interpretation of, of how privacy should work. And, and there's no meaningful interaction with consent. The other thing that's important to note is that by the very nature of how social media uh, platforms are built. You know, Facebook requires a real name. Uh, you know, a lot of these companies require a name, a birthday, a face, uh, some kind of identifying information. That's what makes it social. And these are the inherent uh, underpinnings that are being exploited by companies like Clearview. Um, and I don't know how to fix that because like you just basically have to require basically all social networks and never collect any kind of identifying information. Um, and, and so where that really leaves us is that like we're not talking about one privacy violation or two privacy violations is that we're talking about like a, like like 10 of them all at once and and what's happening here is that like i i don't know how to describe these problems because they're so big and massive and this company is doing so many awful things um and and we're just like learning about it by like one or two like you know these legal papers that we had read um and some of these documents that we obtained through foia and so really like we i was i was like who is this company what are they about um and they are very very shady they're 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 not good people um 
I started looking for email addresses, mailing addresses, names, uh, websites, uh, who, what their email provider were was, and I could like basically find like nothing. Like I, I found that they had been um, established in 2018, Mar uh, May or March of 2018. Um, I found some of their website registrations. Um, I found a woman uh, who was linked to a election effort in Alabama. Um, and I found a bunch of addresses and I was like, what is happening here? Like I, I couldn't put names to faces. It was very, very, very bizarre. I was like, what is happening? I, I'm pretty good at finding, you know, information on the internet, but I just couldn't link this company to names and, and something was happening. I was just like, this is very bizarre. So what I had to do was I called in some friends, you know, I talked to Dave Boss at the EFF, who you talked to. Um, I sent a lot more FOIAs out to find anything that I could um, find out. Uh, I talked to other experts on facial recognition and everyone was stumped. We, which is how you know, kind of the like you're on the right track is that like I, everyone doesn't know what this is, but like this is we're, we're figuring it out together. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so, so we, we started getting small tricks, trick, uh, like things were trickling in, right? Like Florida, we sent out about FOIAs there. Florida has a great public records laws. So uh, we started getting uh, records back on uh, from this network called Crime Dex. Um, the company claimed that it had 200 police departments using it, but nobody had any contracts. Um, there was no paper trail anywhere. Um, and so we began to realize that like what this company is doing is so cloak and dagger that like I'm hitting a dead end. Like I, I don't know what to do. I, I know how to do boyas. I know how to find companies. I know how to find website registrations. But this is as far as I could get. Um, so we were hitting a dead end, and what I what we did was we called in, you know, our friends at the failing. They call it the failing New York Times. Um, and and I, I basically had to say, like, uh, I, I'm hitting a dead end. This is as much research as I can do. Let's give it to our friends. Um, and so the New York Times did an incredible job at finding uh, everything else that about this company. Um, so Kashmir Hill, uh, who is an incredible journalist, uh, really took all the documents that we had obtained and, and, and just went to town with it, right? And they learned a lot about this company. Um, uh, one of the things that like we found about this company was that like they had registered to a bunch of places around Manhattan and um, you know I asked Kashmir like hey where is this company it's supposed to be like five minutes away from you and she walks down there and she says that the building that the building itself that this company was registered to did not exist like that physical address was did not exist um, and so like we really began to see that there's this this kind of very shitty company um, that doesn't actually exist anywhere that's doing all of these really really bizarre things um, Kashmir in particular like really did track down the people who actually work there and, and talk to them and try to figure out what's actually happening um, the other thing that happened is uh, like uh, there, there are there's a, a article that was written by the New York Times, and there's a podcast uh, that they appeared on. Um, and so both of those are really interesting because you can actually see some how how the gumshoe worked and, and stuff like that. So uh, I would recommend viewing either of those. Uh, but but that is to say that it was an incredible amount of labor um, to figure out really what the story is with this company. Uh, and so, and so here it is. Like the front, they the New York Times front page story on January nineteenth, um, 
about how this company exists. And, you know, it's right up there with Trump's impeachment, right? Like, it's it's a it's a front page story. It's an incredible story. They did an amazing amount of work, um, but it's very clearly like probably one of the worst privacy violations kinds of stories. Um, and it's a big deal. People should care about it. Like, uh, in, and I was so happy to see like the impact that this story really did hit. Um, and and they they were able to confirm exactly what we had been talking about that there are three billion images in their facial recognition system. They were able to confirm that hundreds of police agencies are trying to use Clearview, and one of the reasons that they were it was so difficult to get like paperwork about these companies uh about this company's business was that they would just call people up and say like hey i'm going to give you a, a, a trial to clearview um so um we were really kind of confused about why there was no paperwork um and it's because you know clearview would just call people and just say let me give you a free trial uh, use Clearview. Tell your friends and family about it, um, and, and and you know, don't you don't have to sign any paperwork. You're good to go. Um, so we confirmed a lot of our ideas about like why this was so shady because they're, they're, this is the shadiest company I've ever heard of in my life, right? Um, and so that was interesting. Um, the other thing was that like. Clearview was spying on its own uh, on the New York Times reporter. So what Clearview can do is they could, they can see um, all of the searches that the police were doing, you know. And so they were able to see that, like you know, the founder of uh, of uh, Clearview, this guy Ho and Don Ta, like they were able to see that that person was being searched by police departments or by you know the journalists or whatever and and they started like asking and telling police departments like don't talk to journalists um and so it was very very bizarre kind of uh reporting process for sure um and 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 so what happened you know there was this uh there's this big big report in the new york times and almost sort of immediately let me see what happened oh uh, uh you know the company gets hacked um the company gets sued uh the the social media companies go after it um bizarrely clearview uh claim that they have a first amendment right to collect your face on the internet and sell it to law enforcement um then so this you know the story goes you know obviously very viral but it also gets picked up and and, and reported all over the place and, and a lot of companies really started pushing back on on what clearview was doing um BuzzFeed News had a great series of articles on Clearview um, because I, I think it's important to talk about them because like not only were they selling your data they collected illicitly off the internet to law enforcement but they were also selling it to banks and the NBA and Macy's all of these sorts of things um, and and they're just like notorious liars. They're they're grifters. I, I don't know what the word is. Um, and and what they were doing, you know, they would they would tell cops that they had helped identify like terrorism suspects within a second. Um, and even NYPD had to be like, no, that stop using these terms because that's that's total it's a total lie it's a total fabrication um and, and it's important i think it's important to, to read the buzzfeed articles just to see like kind of the contrast of like what clearly said that they were doing versus what they were actually doing um and so so buzzfeed uh carolyn haskins and and ryan mack uh, in particular, had great series about the about what Clearview is actually up to. So I recommend you you do read those if you're interested. Um, other fallout, obviously, they got sued a lot. 
uh, the attorney general in New York, New Jersey, said that like, law enforcement had to stop using this technology. Um, Congress got involved and started probing them to ask deep questions about what they were doing. Uh, that is just to say that this company um, is not doing very well uh, because they're under a lot of fire from a lot of different groups uh, to, to really answer questions about what, what it is that they do. Um, uh, John Oliver did a piece on Clearview. You should check it out. It's tiny.cc slash John Oliver face um, with the, with the proper capitalization um but you should you should read it you, you're, you can watch the video if you're interested uh, that is just to say it, it got a lot of attention you know um this company is not a good company at all and it, it's important to to highlight what it is that they do um and then just a few minor things like lessons learned is that i really did not know how big the story was going to be um i just knew at one point i got overwhelmed so i just knew that i had to reach out to other friends i i, I had to sort of push hard to just say like 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 here's the thing that i think is interesting someone should do something with this um so it's just important to know where your limits are and and know where to you know hand over something to a journalist or 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 give it to your friend or ask for help um I, we did a lot of foias and and with those foias i learned a lot just by calling up police departments and asking them where my records were um and it it took a long time but but like calling people and asking them and bugging them really did help and it taught me a lot about what clary was doing behind the scenes um, you know, I had to document everything. Uh, I, I, there's a lot of ongoing litigation with Clearview, so it's important to just have your records in in order. Um, and then, I mean, I think the other big takeaway is that, like, I, I as a technologist, as a person who grew up in tech, who did not expect to be in public policy, um, I learned. I, I had a lot of help from from lawyers. I had help from people who work on the you know on capitol hill um it's, it's just important for for us to be thinking about how do we you know get us in these kinds of systems where we can break these kinds of things open because because i i guess i would say that if it, if i did not have the same technical background that I did, then I wouldn't know how to pick out the fact that they're scraping LinkedIn and, you know, collecting this data over 15 years. And there's this, you know, law firm giving all this advice. And there's also, you know, and I think it's important just talk about all of that all at once, because it's very hard to do all of that all at once. But it's important for technologists to have some teeth in the game, I guess is, is where I, I'm heading with that kind of com uh, comment. Um, and then finally, you know, I guess you should talk about surveillance in your own backyard. You always find it in the weirdest places. Clear it was being used by small police departments, state police, district attorneys. Um, uh, you should, you should, if you're interested, go look for surveillance in your own backyard. Go, go do the Atlas of Surveillance that, that, um, is being organized by, um, Aaron Short's day. You, you just have to go look. Um, and, and I would also say that even um, in the police departments that we found using Clearview, a lot of it was being hidden from the city itself or from the police department itself. And it raises a lot of questions about oversight and transparency within their own police departments. Um, with that being said, transparency matters. There's a lot of uh, groups that are really interested in transparency um if you can't speak up you should there's a lot of technical ways to reach journalists there's a lot of ways uh to use your voice if you if you start seeing things like these very messed up technologies uh journalism matters and and, and i think it's important to talk to to be talking about how uh communities should be uh 
controlling the use of technologies like Clearview. So, so it's very important that that uh, regulators get involved um, and either outright ban these technologies or or really like muzzle them down and, and control them because uh, the future that's being built right now is it's not great. Let's put it that way. Um, and so I have some resources. Obviously, uh, you know the the FOIA guide to facial recognition is one that we built. The Atlas of Surveillance. Uh, you can always email me info at openthegovernment.org. Um, use Mock Rock, and I think that's where we're at. Uh, I just want to thank a lot of these people: uh, Cashmere Hill, Dave Moss, Claire Garvey. Uh, everyone at BuzzFeed, Burl, Lipton, at uh, Muckrock, um, and Senator Wyden and Mark, and Marky in particular, um, have been great allies in our fight. So I think that's where I'm at. Questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Freddie. A lot of people just thanked you in chat on YouTube. They just wanted to thank you for your work. And um, yeah, I, I don't know. Go ahead. Wait, listen, I, just from a perspective, should I stop broadcasting for on Jitsi? Should I stop sharing my screen? Oh yes, you can. Okay, share okay, okay. Your screen. Yes, because it'll just be you and me if we're gonna. Um, yeah, perfect. We are okay. Cool. Um, cool, cool. So yeah, so I just want to emphasize too, as somebody who's new, because I'm very new to. Um, to the filing public records request work. And in just a few years, we were able to get to the bottom of some really shady stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that the regulations that you're talking about having or the laws, you know, privacy laws or um, just uh, trying to stop people from, they're breaking existing laws. It's mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. they're doing something new that needs to be, you know, um, right. regulated. So, um, yeah, no, I think you were really thorough in, um, in what you talked about, especially about this point where where you just realize, to realize when you have too much information and to ask for mm -hmm. help. And um, mm -hmm. so I'm going to um, include those links on the page when we put the video up sure. and make sure that people have those resources available. Um, so thank you very much. Are there, am I supposed to have answer questions or oh, are we just, um, we're good? I didn't or, see the question, the, um, the one question that someone wrote that was a little complicated okay. for, um, really to go into, but I will mention it only because it's Long Beach and we in our own, in the Air and Sports Day Surveillance Prose uh, Project are also eyeing Long Beach for its, okay. Uh, weirdness um, where it just is, isn't quite right. Um, so let's see where they, and when I say not quite right, I mean that they say um, that they don't have literally no responsive documents when people have seen equipment um, being used. And sure. so um, the question that the person was asking um Do you know anything about a free trial order about about these free trial programs that um, Clearview AI was using sure. and when those stopped? So I, I guess the question is that um, they're trying to figure yeah. out, yeah, how these free trial uh, programs fit, fit in. I can answer that question. It's, it's a very great question, actually. So mm -hmm. the way that Clearview would, would get business is that basically they would email anyone and everyone that they could um, and say like do you like Clearview send them to our website and sign them up um, and basically as long as you were anyone with a heartbeat they would like give you a free trial to their to their software um, police departments, Macy's, NBA, like any, anyone and everyone, right? Like, and so what they would do is that uh, because there's no, so what was frustrating for me when I was doing these FOIAs is that I couldn't find contracts because I didn't, there was no contract. And I talked, I called the police chief once and I said, hey, what, what's going on? Where's this contract? 
Um, and he said, oh, no, I, uh, the Clearview guy just called me on my phone and he said, do you want to try it out? And, and I said, yes. And he just set me up with a free trial program. And so, so what we ended up having to do is that our FOIAs became different because we wouldn't ask them for contracts. We would ask them for sign-up emails. Um, and so... Mm. To that point of like the question is that like there's no documents that support that that they this thing happened. It could be one of two different ways, right? One is that like the documentation doesn't literally, literally doesn't exist because um they're doing like sort of an end around. Um, and that's why I said it's very important with your FOIAs to pick up the phone. Like I didn't know that until the, I called that police chief and like like. Uh, I'll say, don't talk to the police ever. Um, but, you know, in Let's this case, it was very helpful <laughs> to call the police chief and say, like, what's going on, you know? Um, and, and and that's that's kind of like that point that I was making, is that with FOIA, it's very important to be over-communicative. Um, and then secondly, like, so when I hear these things, like, we don't have any records, it's either that they do something shady like that where they don't you know there's no contract but there there's there is a agreement or you know the 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 less nefarious side of it is that they just never search for the records and and they just you know said whatever like screw you you know but that but that's also what happens with FOIA because like the principal people who violate it, it's a tragedy well it's 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 a tragedy, but it's not unexpected that the people who violate the laws the most are law enforcement. Um, and and there were there are some of the most obvious and the most they they just ignore all public records laws. So when you when you are told that there are no responsive records, you know it's either that they just ignored the law and didn't search for records, or they did something else like like what they did with Clearview. They just um, hid the records, you know, through right. a shady process. Right, and so, then if it's a great got, question. If they got the software from Clearview and installed it, do you have to install software to look through the database? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a web app. It's like an, you know, imagine Instagram works on your phone, it works on your computer, but it's it's essentially the same, right? Like like okay. the the app itself is just a wrapper for the. So there's probably some terms of service that they're agreeing to by running the software. Is what I'm saying. So even if they're not in a you know, especially something releasing clear view from liability. <laughs> sure, um, sure, but 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 if you just like ask people to search for um, help at clearview.ai or similarly, it's when when you sign up, those emails. That's what we were looking for the sign up emails. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. and that's actually we start where we started getting a lot more success because like everyone would be like, we don't have an invoice. It's like you're right. You right. don't have an invoice, but you do have emails and stuff. So so it took a while to figure that out. Okay, so it would be an email in the FOIA that we file, or the public records request that we file. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. instead of asking for documentation regarding the purchase, purchase orders, blah, 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 we might say records of phone conversations or emails. I, I just I just started requesting every email from, you know, asterisk at clever.ai, and that ah. sort of blew it open the door, blew open the door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. And, and that, and that, yeah, that was a kind of a little bit of detective work, you know. At some point, I realized, like, why am I, like, I'm pretty good with FOIA, you know. I'm pretty good at police surveillance, and then, and then I was like, why am I not getting any records back? I talked to everyone, yeah. and they're like, mm, something's happening. And then I was like, oh right, I realize what's happening now. They're they're just liars. They're hiding well, it. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna write some a template and show it to you to see if you think it's a good um, letter because. That sounds like something that could be useful as a template mm -hmm. for these muckrack requests to be able to Absolutely. ask for a companies by name and mm -hmm. any emails with those companies. Yeah, that's great. Absolutely. That's great. All right. Thank you so much, Freddie. Really appreciate it. All right. Much love. Bye-bye, Elisa. Bye. All right, everybody. Our last speaker, um, Madison Villapando, and she works with um, she's a privacy advocate and a freelancer, but she also works with Dave Miles at EFF, and she's a former EFF intern. And she's going to talk to us for our last talk about when cops get hacked, lessons 
unlearned from a decade of law enforcement breaches. So welcome, Madison. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be presenting this to you guys today. And yeah, let, let me get started and start sharing my screen. And we will see. Um, let's see if this is, is, okay, here we go. All right, so can you guys see everything? Yes, it looks good. Perfect. All right. So I guess we should just jump right in. Um, as it said before, before, this is when cops get hacked, lessons unlearned from a decade of law enforcement breaches. Um, a little bit about me. My name is Madison Valpando, and I'm a recent graduate from the Reynolds School of Journalism at the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, in 2019 and 2020, I worked as a student researcher and intern with the Electronic Frontiers Foundation Threat Lab. And what started as a three month internship on EFF's Atlas of Surveillance project turned into my continued volunteer work and eventually an independent study project my last year of college. Basically, EFF just couldn't get rid of me and I just was too passionate and stayed. Um, during my last year of college, I worked on a final project where I spent over 200 hours researching and collecting data on cyber attacks and their effect on law enforcement agencies. So a little bit of background on this. Throughout my work at EFF, I worked on the Atlas of Surveillance, which documents the most pervasive technology used by law enforcement agencies throughout the United States. These technologies included automated license plate readers, facial recognition, cell site simulators, as well as many others. The project uses open source intelligence to map where surveillance tech is being used and by what jurisdiction. And during my time at the beginning, we had been collecting instances of surveillance concentrated on the US-Mexico border and had begun with about 200 data points. Since then, the research has moved nationally with over 6,000 data points since Atlas went live. And I really recommend going over there and adding more. This is such an, an amazing project. Um, with the data clearly showing the exponential increase of law enforcement agencies buying into surveillance technology, I noticed that the rate at which surveillance technology was evolving was not matching the rate at which IT resources were evolving. And this led me to believe that the allure of technology is overshadows the implications and threat of poor IT resources. In fact, it seemed to be the last thing on everyone's mind. In fact, with one quick Google search too, it was quite clear that data breaches and cyber attacks were slowly but surely becoming a more pervasive threat to privacy. I started to form in my observations a few overarching questions to implement within my own research. And of course, I was allowed to do this research um, with the help of everyone at the Reynolds School of Journalism. And these questions included how many law enforcement agencies experience cyber attacks and breaches or a data leak? Um, how are they protecting their digital evidence? In these leaks, what information is generally exposed? And are law enforcement agencies properly equipped to protect their technology? With these questions in mind, I began collecting news articles, press releases, public records, and writing FOIA requests. Basically, any open source intelligence I could find to create a database that could potentially answer my questions and show whether or not the protection of data was a high priority for law enforcement agencies. So in the 200 plus hours that I've been working on implementing this project, I have documented that over 195 law enforcement agencies have suffered some sort of data breach or cyber crime since 2012 or leak. Uh, when I first presented this in June, it was actually 125 law enforcement agencies. Um, the data in these, these, these attacks usually included um, social security numbers of officers and staff, phone numbers, addresses, financial information, in addition to more pervasive information, including license plate information, fingerprint identification information, and data from fusion centers. And, and back in June, with months and months of research under my belt, I woke up on June 19th only to see that more than 269 gigabytes of law enforcement data was published on the, the, on the Distributed Denial of Secrets website in the Blue Leaks hack, with most of the data taken from fusion centers and local police departments. Um, the research that I've done so far and did in the past could have only alluded to a major data breach that would affect the data of thousands of people. And it took me three months to collect tripled in near seconds, and I'm still working to compile a list of agencies and what information were included in that leak. Um, 
to me, Blue Lakes has magnified the importance of this research. And so to create my database, I wanted to use information that could help me verify any trends and whether or not my observations in my independent study held any weight. And the categories included the name of the agency, technology breach, type of attack, whether that be malware, DDoS, insider threat, method of attack, whether it be ransomware, Trojan horse, spyware, other methods, if this was through phishing or drive-by downloading, ransomware, and if there was ransomware, whether that not that was paid or unpaid, um, information stolen and breach, and of course, the year of incident. Um, in addition to creating a database, I also began development on a map that would show overarching trends. This map right now does not reflect the 195 law enforcement agencies, but that will be up very soon. And the map that you see is representative of the data of, you know, prior blue leaks. Um, this map includes instances of ransomware, DDoS, telephone denial of service, viruses, negligence, physical theft. And right now there were several trends that we, trends that we can take away from this map. Most notably is the quantity of breaches that are concentrated in the South and in the Northeastern parts of the USA. In fact, both Georgia and Texas experienced most cyber attacks, specifically ransomware, which I found to be the most common form of cyber crime on law enforcement agencies. So ransomware at this point took up more than half of the cyber attacks that affect law enforcement agencies on this data set. Um, ransomware is one of the most expensive cyber attacks that law enforcement face. And because of this, I also tracked how many paid and how many did not. Um, the most common method at which this happened was phishing, when an employee or volunteer would accidentally open a malicious link from a third party email. This is not surprising given that in 2017, Digital Guardian reported that 91% of successful cyber attacks are launched via a phishing email. Furthermore, in a report from the International Association of Chiefs of Police, between 2014 and 2017, 17, Michigan auditors conducted a phishing attack on 5,000 randomly selected state employees to see how they would deal with a potential threat. One third of the recipients opened the email and almost one fifth provided their user ID and password. And if this is the case, then the lack of cyber knowledge of these employees has the potential to create a very expensive crisis. Um, for example, the Rivera Beach Police Department paid $600,000 in order to restore their systems after a ransomware attack. And the Lake City Police Department in Florida paid 470,000 in both instances, not including the cost of IT resources the state and respective cities had to pay over 1 million to restore their systems back to normal. According to Motorola Solutions in their cyber report in 2018, the average cost of these data breaches uh, was estimated to be about 6.53 million. However, in many cities, the cost could be even higher and the price of failing to secure these networks is clearly rising. Um, in fact, in 2018, Atlanta, Georgia was the subject of a massive ransomware attack that demanded the city pay $51,000. Uh, the ransomware forced most of the city servers to go back to paper forms. And it's whether, well, it's unclear whether or not this police department did pay their ransomware. The city did pay $2.6 million to restore their, initially paid $2.6 million to restore their systems. Um, prior to this attack, more interestingly though, Atlanta had been criticized after an audit in 2018 revealed over 1,500 vulnerabilities to the city systems. The inspectors claimed that there was clearly a relaxed approach to cybersecurity practices. And in fact, weak passwords were to blame for the expensive attack. In 2019, State Scoop reported that the initial payment was not enough and the city had to pay 17 million to remedy the loss. In 2019, most of Baltimore's government systems were infected by ransomware. The perpetrators demanded the US equivalent of 76,000 in Bitcoin to restore access. Um, according to another report by State Scoop, Baltimore was successful, was susceptible to an attack due to its poor IT practices, which included decentralized control of their IT budget. This ended up being a really serious issue after the city refused to pay ransom and said had to allocate over $18 million to restore their servers. Um, and so the decision to pay or not to pay ransomware, of course, is an absolute gamble. In fact, the FBI and Secret Service advised against paying ransom as it could embolden more tax. And in ca the case of Baltimore PD, their expensive decision stemmed from the belief that paying ransom is rewarding criminal behavior. Uh, this is kind of the consensus as last month, in fact, the U.S. Treasury Department announced that facilitating a ransomware payment 
could, uh, could you could face up say, face sanctions, um, and companies that pay ransom could face civil penalties and fines up to three hundred thousand dollars. So, in another important case of ransomware discovered in this research, in two thousand sixteen, the Cockrell Hill Police Department, Texas, lost over two hundred thousand records after the chief of police decided to wipe the servers rather than pay the ransom of four thousand. Uh, the department lost all Microsoft Office suite documents, such as Word documents and Excel files. In addition, all body-worn camera video, some in-car video, some in-house surveillance video, some photographs that were stored on the server. And to make matters worse, the Cocker Hill Police Department failed to maintain their digital evidence, which had pu some public defenders worried since at the time there were multiple cases relying on body-worn camera footage to prove innocence. And these cases were ultimately forced to reply on the, rely on the police reports, which brought a lot of scrutiny to the police department. And in cases such as this, the ransomware attack not only undermined police duties, but eroded the trust between the department and the public as they lost over eight years of evidence. Within the data set, the second most common form of cybercrime was a breach implemented by a third party individual or individuals. Uh, third party breaches often resulted in this confidential data, such as personal data, passwords, important information, et cetera, um, to be exposed. And for purposes of my research, um, any method in which there was a breach was accounted for within this category, whether that be through physical threat, theft, uh, phishing, Trojan, or any other methods. And a lot of this was pre-Blue pre Leaks, but Blue Leaks is definitely involved in that. Um, in 2019, the information of thousands of federal agents became public after three chapters of the FBI's uh, National Academy were breached and more than 4,000 records were exposed. Um, in addition to the breach of information of, on federal agents, in 2019, the LAPD was also breached, leaving the personal information of over 20,000 applicants open to the public, in addition to hundreds of sworn-in officers. The information that was potentially stolen included email addresses, birth dates, last four digits of social security numbers, and passwords used to log into the database. The department found out about the breach only after the perpetrator revealed themselves to the agencies, revealing knowledge about a database of the people who applied to the LAPD between 2010 and 2018. But luckily, in response to this, the LA Times reported that the department did bolster IT funding. In a less known but more common to the types of breaches in the data set, in February 2012, hackers breached the Dallas Police Department's internal server and stole usernames and passwords for several officers, including information about informants and jail inmates. A smaller scale breach such as this one, however, was notable because it occurred in 2012, again in 2014, in 2017, and recently in 2020, to me showing no real changes in IT practices. Um, the third most prevalent form of cyber attacks on law enforcement agencies was the distributed denial of service, which took up about 15 instances within this data set so far. Um, I'm certain there are more, but as of right now, this is what we found. Um, in instances of DDoS, the access to emails, websites, and servers, and legitimate traffic were often disrupted. Um, and for example, in 2017, an Akron man executed a distributed denial of service against the Akron Police Department, the Ohio Department of Public Safety, and the Department of Defense after he uploaded a video to Twitter saying the Akron Police Department abuses the law. In the last slide, I forgot to say that this is often used, a tool used for hacktivists against police. Um, for example, in 2014, the St. Louis County Sheriff's Office was taken offline for several hours as a result of a DDoS attack in retaliation for the police shooting of Michael Brown and in support of the protests that resulted from the shooting. Um, another concerning trend is the denial of safety services from a telephone denial service. While TDOS seems to be more uncommon, it is on the rise. In these instances, communication systems become inaccessible due to an attack. Um, these types of cases found in my data are more dangerous because people who are in need of critical care lose access to it. Uh, for example, it was reported that in 2017, a six-month-old Dalit boy died after his babysitter's 911 calls were delayed during a TDOS attack. Furthermore, it is also dangerous for public safety professionals as paramedics cannot request police support and firefighters cannot call for mutual aid. 
So what does all of this data tell us? Well, the unauth unauthorized access of law enforcement data due to a cyber attack has serial, serious operational and privacy implications. Um, a cyber attack could compromise an agency's ability to protect the life and maintain order. Um, and at the rate that law enforcement agencies are being breached, I think it's an important reminder that law enforcement agencies are a high profile and need better protocols. In addition, law enforcement has been purchasing and using more pervasive data collecting tools without first flushing out their IT departments or providing funding to provide a cushion for when these cyber attacks occur. Furthermore, cyber attacks erode trust and the credibility of an agency uh, further calling into question these, these actions. Um, in addition, there seem to be two major attitudes that affect cyber safety for law enforcement agencies, and that is compliance and negligence. Uh, law enforcement and their respective leaders do not treat the cyber risk as a system-wide threat and often attribute it to underfunded and poorly equipped IT departments. But it's important to keep in mind that this is a system-wide threat and all members of the agency and system must have some responsibility to keep it protected. Um, you know, it takes one week password. It's also incredibly easy to be negligent, whether that be through lack of training or knowledge um, about cybersecurity risks. Staff members and officers uh, cannot afford to have staff members who know the risk and dismiss security protocols. Staff members can't use old passwords. They shouldn't be downloading software that they know nothing about or plugging USB devices without verifying its safety. And I find it quite sad that I, that I have to say this right now. Um, in addition to compliance and negligence, major surveillance companies such as Axon and Vigilant Solutions have profited from the rising need for surveillance technology. In fact, just recently, Axon came under fire after decommissioned body-worn cameras were found to still have raw video data on them. In addition, Clearview AI, DroneSense, and Perceptix, all major surveillance companies, suffered major data breaches in the last 10 years. Uh, Perceptix came under fire after they, against their contract, copied images of travelers' license plates um, onto their own third-party network and were subsequently breached. In fact, there was a great article just recently that um, said that a lot of uh, that the DHS just came out and said that they had um, found that a lot of that data was on uh, was being sold. Um, Clearview AI's client list was breached in an incident that affected law enforcement agencies as well, whose names were exposed publicly, and information was also released as to how many accounts each client opened and what searches they had conducted. Um, it's very clear that the need for new technology has overshadowed the need for better security protocols. In fact, in 2018, a report by the National Association uh, State Chief Information Officers, most states only allocate about 3% of their IT budgets to cybersecurity. Um, and to me, this doesn't make sense. If departments are going to be collecting our data in the future on a grand scale, then, you know, they should be protecting that data because there is a huge risk for that to be leaked. So let's go back to the research questions. Um, you know, in the last decade, how many law enforcement agencies have experienced cyber attack or data leak? So 195 so far, I'm doing blue leaks in a separate database in which, you know, I will add all that information as well. It's just taking me a little bit longer than I thought. Um, so how are they protecting their digital evidence? Well, they're not. Uh, poor passwords and protocols evidence a lack of care and knowledge about the importance of protecting this data. Um, what data is generally exposed? Uh, personal data, organizational data, you know, social security, addresses, phones, information for doxing, uh, license plate information, it goes on and on. And are law enforcement agencies properly equipped to protect their technology? No, they're not. Um, from what I can tell, they focus more on the looks of the surveillance technology and buying into the technology rather than the safety. And oftentimes it seems like there was no thought at all put into the safety of these, this technology. So then I go and went into lessons and learned and I, it is imperative that staff receive cybersecurity training at every level of the organization, not just IT departments. According to guidelines from the IAACP, users need to be aware of hazards, including email hazards, um, password protocols, and what to do if they feel like their account has been compromised. Furthermore, law enforcement executives must understand that they are a target and their systems will be open to attack. 
Um, the organizations must provide security for digital evidence or provide backup to their servers. Um, they must maintain original copies, hard copies, printed images of videos, over saving and over documentation of files, which is not something that we have seen happen. And they must determine, uh, you know, they must be prepared for an attack. Preparing and rehearsing is the only way to determine readiness and rehearsing a response to this incident is critical. Um, it must be determined how the IT partner will respond to such an attack. Does the city have enough money and what available resources are there? And when I had originally ended this presentation, I said that by following those IACP guidelines would really help to help to learn some lessons from these cyber attacks. But as I've continued my research, I believe that that original stance was too naive. Uh, the rate at which law enforcement agencies are being attacked continues to show a pattern of flashy surveillance rather than an emphasis on safety. Training and attack readiness does not fix the internal privacy issues. And, you know, I wish that there was a clear answer in, in what we could do to fix this. So um, that is my presentation. And I want to say thank you so much for, for allowing me to do this. This was, this was really fun. And thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Madison. Really appreciate having you. Yay. <laughs> yeah, this has been great. Let's see. Um, let's see, where would, is, uh, where's the best place for someone to go if they want to follow up more about these reports you've written and your research? Yeah, of course. Um, I am so right now. I only have an Excel data sheet and a map, but I'm hoping to get everything public on a website uh, by the end of the month. And so, if it's possible, if I can put my email down, if people want to email me for that information, or I can give that to you, whatever would be easiest, so that so sure. that when it's ready, everyone can see it. Yeah, if that's best. And and in all fairness, as a fellow researcher, you know, there's nothing wrong with a spreadsheet of data. <laughs> yes. That's great. You know, sometimes I spend a lot of time putting information into a spreadsheet of data. So that the point is you're you're willing to talk to people and, and share information if other people are working in this area. Oh, of course. I would absolutely love to to have that to, to have that discourse with people. Okay, great. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I, I hope you have a great night and this is great. Thanks. This is the end, everybody. I appreciate so much. Um, everybody, everybody's talk was great. We really had a lot of um, um, great ideas and knowledge and things to follow up on later and stuff like that. Um, I want to make sure that everyone remembers that we're going to have these weekly meetings, two o'clock Pacific, which is five o'clock um, Eastern, which is 1 a.m. GMT. And also because the time is so is so hard to make a meeting that's there for uh, two hours a week or whatever. So if you have project ideas, activism ideas, whatever, if you're working on something and you want to get it out to the right people, you can send it to me or send it, you know, contact me through any of the Aaron Swartz Day channels and I will include it in the meeting. I mean, I look it over to make sure it's a real thing and stuff, but um, we're trying to make sure that more people in our community know about what the other people are doing so that we can get more done. Um, I We started a Discord. There's Aaron Swartz Day Discord that I um, have an invite up on, the, up on Twitter that I put up today. We're going to be watching a movie later tonight around 9.30 um, Pacific time. Um, I think we're going to watch uh, Library Wars, which was uh, recommended by someone at the Internet Archive, uh, not surprisingly enough. And um, we're going to foster this community and let it grow and get some things done. Um, yes, please participate in the Endless Hackathon. Basically, we started a hackathon and we're, we're not going to finish it. We're just going to keep going and adding more projects to it and um, keeping up the momentum. Uh, you know, here in the United States, we're a little more optimistic because uh, we, I'm mincing my words now because I didn't have this prepared. The point is, we're hopeful. It's like, okay, great. We don't have like Hitler as president anymore. That's nice. Well, are things going to go back to the status quo? 
before all this happened in 2016 because for a lot of people the status quo wasn't that great and um we really need to actively go in the direction of helping people somebody in chat was letting me know because i was talking about the camps needing to be closed and they were saying well biden's already said his people have already approved the camps well that better not be right um so let's figure out what's going wrong and and really actively get in there and and make these people put their money where their mouth is in terms of saying that they were different from the people that that are leaving soon hopefully um and really making people put it put put some skin in the game as we were saying earlier um it's not really enough to stand on the si sidelines and and not be involved you're either part of the problem or part of the solution for a lot of these things we have a lot of work to do technology is just the the cusp of it we have a lot of institutionalized racism that we have to fix we have a lot of really big problems and that's my last pitch this the hard problems we're willing to talk about hard problems in these weekly meetings i don't i'm not saying i have solutions but we've got to start talking about them we've got to start talking about climate change we've got to start talking about institutionalized racism we've got to start talking about the concentration camps for instance here in the united states at our border what are we really going to do to to shut those down are we going to just sort of talk about it how it would be nice if we shut them down or are we going to try to help those people so we need to work together and protect each other while we're doing it and we have so many battles to fight and all that stuff but i really do feel like if we were a little more organized we would be able to do more work it would be easier to do more work and and maybe even have some fun doing it because we also have a thriving artistic community and musicians and um, you know poets and writers and all these other t kinds of people besides just like the tech part of all this and everything and so let's utilize all that stuff and try to get stuff done so stay in touch and let's do stuff join the discord we're going to be watching a movie tonight see you next Tuesday stay in touch all right bye everybody